Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy blessing upon this parliament. Direct and prosper our deliberations to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Order. Members would please quickly take their seats and facilitate the chair. Minister for Science. Order. I inform the House that the Right Honourable Jonathan Hunt MP, Speaker of the House of Representatives of the Parliament of New Zealand, is within the precincts. With the concurrence of honourable members, I propose to provide him with a seat on the floor of the House. Please welcome Speaker Hunt. Prime Minister, I wish to greet you. Welcome. <laughs> <coughs> Parliamentarians, allow me on your behalf to extend a very warm welcome to my friend and colleague, Speaker Hunt, and I would ask Speaker Hunt to convey the congratulations of this House to the New Zealand House of Representatives on the occasion of the 150th anniversary of its first sitting in Auckland, the 24th of May, 1854. I understand there were appropriate commemorations uh, to mark that particular event in Wellington last month, last week. Speaker Hunt, you are welcome. <laughs> Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, yes, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister confirm that university fees have nearly doubled under this government and that student hex debts have increased from $4 billion to more than $10 billion since 1996, with a further forecast of hex, Order, debts, rising, Lindsay. hex debts rising to $15 billion over the next four years? Does the Prime Minister acknowledge that these high student debts are preventing many Australians from pursuing a higher education and delaying young graduates from buying a home and starting a family? 
Will the Prime Minister now adopt Labor's policy of reversing the 25 per cent fee hikes, uh, the HECS increase, and uh, also ensure that the government properly funds Australia's universities? Yeah. Member for Blair. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Mr. Uh, Mr. Member Speaker, I, I, thank, I thank the um, opposition leader very warmly uh, for asking me a question about higher education. I understand, Mr. Speaker, that um, the title of the uh, Labor Party's uh, education policy, higher education policy, in, in this country is aim higher. Mr. Speaker, well, I'm going to take um, a copy of that policy with me when I call on the British Prime Minister, Mr Speaker, in the next few days, and I'm going to compare the title, Mr Speaker, because I think purely by accident it's the same. It's aim higher, Mr Speaker. Uh, no, I mean, it is purely accidental. It wouldn't be deliberate because there's no similarity between the policy substance. Mr Speaker, on this occasion, the only thing the Leader of the Opposition plagiarised was the title. He didn't plagiarise the substance because the reality is that the third way Tony Blair approached to higher education is essentially the same as the approach of this government and indeed the same as the approach that Labor adopted when Labor was last in office. Mr. Speaker. The introduction of HECS, supported at the time by the coalition, because we recognised, as Labor did then, that you could no longer hold out to the Australian public the essentially fraudulent proposition that tertiary education could be free, Mr Speaker. That had been tried by the Whitlam government. We all remember the Whitlam government, Mr Speaker, and uh, it had been proved um, a, uh, an expensive uh, failure, Mr Speaker. What I can confirm are a number of facts, Mr Speaker. I can confirm, I can confirm Mr Speaker, that uh, when all Treasurer. of the government's changes when all of the government's changes are fully operational, uh, the Member total contribution Melbourne. of a student through HEX of an average degree will be 28 per cent, Mr Speaker. In other words, 72 per cent of the cost is being borne by the general community. 28 per cent is being borne by the student. I can confirm that from 1 July 2004, the minimum HEX repayment threshold will increase to $35,000, Mr Speaker. In other words, until you earn $35,000, you don't have to start paying back the 28 per cent of the cost of the degree, Mr Speaker. And I can also inform the House that in 2002, less than 1 per cent of all domestic undergraduates were in full-fee courses costing more than $50,000, Mr Speaker. Our changes have provided opportunity and flexibility for the universities. Our changes have got more money into universities. Our changes balance the interests and rights of students against the interests and rights of taxpayers, Mr Speaker. And instead of railing against the sensible changes that we have introduced, I would invite the Leader of the Opposition to rail against the scandalous obscene increases in TAFE charges that have been introduced by Labor governments around Australia. In some cases, three and four hundred per cent, Mr. Speaker. But do you hear a word from the leader of the opposition, the member for Werra? Oh no, you don't criticise Bob Carr or Peter Beattie because they belong to the Labor Party, Mr. Speaker. Just as in relation to Iraq, the leader of the opposition uh, delights in, in criticising George Bush, but he never utters a word of criticism of Tony Blair. The Honourable Member for Petrie. Thank you uh, very much, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Is the Minister aware of any statements that Australia's strong relationship with the United States puts us at a disadvantage internationally? Are there any other views? The Honourable the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Um, well, Mr Speaker, first of all, can I thank the honourable member for her question um, and say that actually I am aware of views being expressed by some of those opposite and other people in the community which suggest that Australia shouldn't have a very close relationship with the United States, but amongst other explanations for that is that it damages our relations with Asia. Um, Mr Speaker, let the House be absolutely clear of the government's view. At a time of great international uncertainty, Australia's close relationship with the United States is vital to our security. 
and the United States' engagement in the security architecture of the Asia-Pacific region is vital to the stability of the Asia-Pacific region. One of the great myths being pushed by the opposition is that we should downgrade our relationship with, op with the United States in order to upgrade our relations with Asia. I mean, our strong relationship with Asia is there for all to see. Free trade agreements with Thailand and Singapore. Interestingly enough, the Labor Party has chosen not to criticise those free trade agreements. Um, su the support of the ASEAN economic ministers for the creation of Australia and New Zealand free trade area and uh, the offer from the ASEAN economic ministers that, to the Australian and New Zealand prime ministers to attend an ASEAN summit meeting later this year, a trade and economic framework agreement with China, including a joint study now being undertaken on the feasibility of a free trade agreement. We're able to do all of these things and have a close relationship with the United States. Um, the other myth, of course, that's pushed by the opposition is that somehow um, the fact that Australia has troops in Iraq damages us in Asia. But if I may say so, Mr Speaker, this just demonstrates a complete failure to understand Asia, a complete lack of knowledge of Asia. The fact is that a number of Asian countries join Australia in having troops in Iraq. Thailand, Japan, South Korea, Singapore, the Philippines. And indeed, uh, in the presence of the Speaker of the New Zealand House of Representatives, let me remind the House that New Zealand has troops in, uh, in Iraq, and they, uh, Mr. Speaker, are very welcome there. The truth is that our alliance with the United States strengthens Australia in Asia. It doesn't weaken Australia in Asia. Now, Mr. Speaker, of course we don't agree with the Americans on everything. We have been um, aggressively arguing our case with the Americans on the issue of farm subsidies. We have taken a different course from the United States on the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Uh, we have signed the statute of the International Criminal Court. But you see, Mr Speaker, the Labor Party, um, under the current leader of the opposition, continually attacks the United States on absolutely everything. They're opposed to the United States policy on missile defence. They're, they're opposed to the Proliferation Security Initiative. They're opposed to the Free Trade Agreement. They're opposed to us being involved in trying to bring stability and democracy to Iraq. They're opposed to anything to do with the United States. I notice, Mr Speaker, that in a speech on the 27th of May to the Sydney Institute, the member for Griffith said that um, Labor's views on negotiating an arrangement with the Americans on the International Criminal Court which is called an Article 98.2 agreement, was, and I quote, unacceptable in the extreme because it would er render, and I quote the member for Griffith, Americans guilty of grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions immune from prosecution in Australia. Mr Speaker, that statement by the member for Griffith, who is always ready to accuse others of being dishonest and lying, that statement is completely untrue. And it is utterly misleading for the, member, for, for the member for Griffith to say that Americans under an Article 98 agreement would have immunity from prosecution in Australia is false. Americans enjoy no immunity from prosecution in Australia now, nor would they under an Article 98.2 agreement. Any agreement that we concluded would be consistent with our International Criminal Court obligations and it would allow us to try US citizens in Australian courts for war crimes or any other types of crimes against Australian law. Mr Speaker, the member for Griffith has gone out and deliberately misled the Australian people in order to promote Labor's anti-American agenda, which of course is the leader of the opposition's agenda. Now he doesn't like to hear it. He, he's asked Minister for a point of, of order affairs. to be raised, Minister of foreign but affairs. he doesn't like to be reminded of his visceral anti-Americanism. Minister for Foreign Affairs will resume his seat. The Honourable Member for Lawler, Manager of Opposition Business. Uh, Mr Speaker, that was clearly an allegation that the Member for Griffiths deliberately misled. As you are well aware, as everybody in this House is aware, that's beyond the standing orders. It's an unparliamentary remark. It should be withdrawn or proceeded with on substantive motion. Let me point out to the member for Lawler that while I found the statement one that I wouldn't use myself, it is in fact not outside the standing orders. The Minister for Foreign Affairs did not say that the 
The Minister for Foreign Affairs did not say that the Minister had deliberately misled the Parliament, which was the point that I believe the Member for Lawler was seeking to make. The Minister for Foreign Affairs. There's no doubt about it, though, Mr Speaker. The Labor Party, including the Leader of the Opposition, will get up here and particularly go out into the Australian community and accuse the government of lying over any manner of things. And that's your standard. But when it comes to them being criticised for making statements which are manifestly untrue, apparently they'd rather have silence. You'd rather shut everybody up when they expose the uh, weakness of your own arguments. Mr Speaker, I'm sorry, this anti-Americanism in the end isn't going to wash with the Australian public. The Honourable Member for Jagger Jagger. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Education. Does the minister stand by the figures he tabled in the parliament on the 26th of May, which show university students in Queensland will pay $100 million more in fees over the next four years because of the Howard government 25 per cent hex hike? Order. And if, Jager, so, Jager has a call. and if so, how does the minister explain why his department is today reported in the Courier-Mail as saying university students in Queensland will actually pay an extra $180 million, $80 million more than the figure he tabled in the parliament last week. Minister, why has the hex debt of university students in Queensland increased by $80 million in six days? The mi minister, member for O'Connor. The Minister for Education, Science and Training. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I, I thank the member for uh, Jager Jager for her uh, question. Uh, uh, last week, Mr Speaker, honourable members will recall that I advised the House that under the government's higher education reforms, that in addition to $1.8 billion of taxpayers' money being invested in universities over the next four years, that my department's initial analysis was that at that time, that, that is last week, that the 17 Order. That the 17 Jager, universities Jager that had question. decided to increase HEX by from 5 to 25 per cent, that those universities would expect to receive $377 million in additional revenue over the next four years. In fact, my department has spent the, uh, the last uh, week, in fact, further analysing this information. And when the department actually takes into account the students who are currently in the system who are not affected by this, in fact, today, with 18 universities having decided to increase HEX, eight of, them not, eight of them deciding not to increase HEX at all, and 13 yet to decide, that in fact a total of $662 million of additional money will go into universities over the next four years as a result of these government's policies. What that means, Mr Speaker, is Member that for every Jager extra Jager dollar that the students invest, not as students but once they have graduated and, as the Prime Minister said, they're working and earning in excess of $35,000 a year, the taxpayer will have invested an extra uh, $3, Mr Speaker, and every last dollar of HEX, of course, goes to university to actually benefit the education of the students. The taxpayer pays it up front and then the graduate pays back just over a quarter of the cost of his or her university once they have actually graduated. And, uh, Mr Speaker, it's interesting that uh, the Labor Party has said through the Deputy Leader of the Opposition that it will fully compensate the universities for this $662 million. In fact, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition said to uh, Brian Tui on Meet the Press on the 18th of April this year that it was in the policy, that in fact it is in the Labor Party's policy. And in fact, today, Mr Speaker, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition is saying to the Courier-Mail, and she's quoted in the Courier-Mail as saying, and I quote, Ms Macklin said universities would be fully compensated for losing the hex rises through indexation and through Labor's $450 million University of the 21st Century Fund. So, Mr Speaker, Minister for Small Business. I go to the Labor Party's policy and I go to page 25, costings. Costings of the Labor Party's policy. Now, the Labor Party says that its policy is costed at $2.34 billion over the first four years. So today, before 13 universities have made a decision about HEX in the next four years, today we are looking for $662 million. 
So the line in the uh, Labor Party policy says oppose hex increases 15 million. Well, in fact, the Labor Party that day, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition issued a media release and said that, in fact, that had nothing to do with compensating for hex increases. So today in the Order, Courier Member Mail, we're Jagger. told that, in fact, this $662 million is going to be found from indexation. So indexation in the Labor Party policy, $312 million. Now, that's a long way short of the $662 million. So the $312 million, that goes out of the policy. I'll give that to the Treasurer. Yeah, yeah. So the Labor Party's $2.34 billion minus $312 million. So they've got $312 million from indexation that apparently is going to fund the compensation to the universities. So then they say $450 million is going to come from this uh, university of the 21st century. So that's 80 per cent of their policy has gone in compensating universities. I'll give that to the Treasurer. <laughs> so what that means, Mr Speaker, that the Labor Party, before it even starts funding universities, will have to find $662 million to fully compensate universities, which brings them back to a $1.6 billion policy, and the Minister for Finance and the Department of Finance has already found a $370 million hole in Labor's policy. So what that means, Mr Speaker, over the next four years, Minister, Australian universities will Minister. receive— Member for Jagger Jagger, waving her hand won't simply prevent me from making the point that I had already reminded her of her obligations under the standing order. The minister has the call. So what that means, Mr Speaker, is that over the next four years, Australian universities will receive $2.4 billion from this government as a result of the policies of this government. They will receive $1.3 billion from the Australian Labor Party, and the Leader of the Opposition, if he is incapable of funding a higher education policy and costing it, how on earth is he going to run Australia? The Honourable Member for Boothby. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Would the Minister inform the House of the international reaction to Australia's leading efforts on tobacco control? Is the Minister aware, <laughs> is the minister aware Member of any— Member for Braindler. Is the minister Order. aware? Order. Is the minister aware? The of member for Boothby. The member for Boothby is entitled to ask his question and to be heard. He has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is addressed to the minister for Foreign Affairs. Would the minister inform the House of the international reaction to Australia's leading efforts on tobacco control? Is the minister aware of any alternative views? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Honourable the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Indeed. Mr Speaker, I thank the um, Honourable Member for Boothby for his question. Now, members may not know the Honourable Member for Boothby is a doctor, a medical doctor, and so it's not surprising he would ask a question about uh, international reaction to Australia's leading efforts on tobacco control. Mr Speaker, yesterday the Leader of the Opposition asked a question about anti-smoking. Um, it seemed to me, Mr Speaker, that that, that question rather indicated the Leader of the Opposition had no idea what Australia had been doing in terms of anti-smoking campaigns and what the international community thought of our campaigns. The World Health Organisation put out a press release a few years ago saying a major factor in Australia's second highest life expectancy rates was that, and I quote, smoking rates have dropped sharply, sharply from their earlier peaks. And the World Health Organisation estimates that the prevalence late rates of smoking in Australia are 19.5 per cent, compared to Germany 34.5 per cent, France 27 per cent, Canada 21.7 per cent, uh, New Zealand 24.9 per cent. Uh, too much smoking still going on in New Zealand. And, um, Mr. Speaker, um, the United States of America. The United States of America is a very important country in all of this. 23.3 per cent. It's higher in the United States of America than Australia. Now, Mr. Speaker, um, Australia also, as the World Health Organisation said a couple of years ago, is a proven leader in tobacco within the Western Pacific region. It said um, also that in 1997, Australia's national tobacco campaign was launched. This sustained, coordinated national activity has been successful. 
Now listen to this. This is what the World Health Organization says, Mr. Speaker. Uh, components of the campaign have been used by Canada, by New Zealand, by Singapore, the United Kingdom and the United States of America. Oh, Mr. Speaker, um, I mentioned the United States of America because I went back to my office and wondered why the Leader of the Opposition yesterday had asked a question about smoking. And I found out why. Because the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Speaker, and I was asked for alternative views, the Leader of the Opposition has a handbook on which all these kind of so-called soft questions are based. And this is it. I brought it in with me. It's called Winning the Presidency in the 90s Behind the Oval Office by Dick Morris, <laughs> President Clinton's Chief Strategist. Now, Mr Speaker, an interesting book to read. I commend it to all members of the House. I look for the price. This version comes from the DFAT Library. It doesn't have a price on it, but <laughs> taxpayers must have paid for this one. But, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, on page 217, Dick says in his advice, in his explanation for how President Clinton's campaign should be run, tobacco would be our first effort. Page 215, on tobacco I was a zealot. I fought hard to extend the values and agenda, of course, of President Clinton, to include a ban on advertising. That's page 215. Um, Mr. Speaker, I'm sorry to say, I'm sorry to say that the story doesn't stop there. Um, on page 230 of this book, Dick uh, Morris says that um, a good strategy was to introduce a curfew for teenagers. Sound familiar to anyone? The question about the curfew for teenagers. Page 200 and page, uh, sorry, page 38. The treasurer will be interested in this. Page 38. Let's cut government programs. Page 81. Propose a tax cut. But the granddaddy of them all, Mr. Speaker, is page 231, where Dick, uh, yes, Dick Morris called for a massive program to ensure that children could read. Interesting. Funny coincidence, Mr Speaker, that from smoking to almost anything else, the leader of the opposition strategy can be found in this book. There's the final chapter of this book, Mr Speaker, is the chapter I suggest the leader of the opposition might choose to read as well. And that chapter is called Downfall. And I think you might find that an excellent Minister. chapter. When the House has come to order, the Honourable Member for Jagger Jagger. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Education. Has the Minister seen a discussion paper prepared by the Vice Chancellor of the University of Ballarat for its council dated the 22nd of April 2004, which states, and I quote, that with a change of government there will be a massive injection of new funding which would obviate the need for any increases to HEX. Oh, oh. Minister, isn't the author of this paper, Professor Cox, a man the minister claims to admire, right that students would not be facing a 25 per cent fee hike if the Howard government properly indexed university grants? Will the minister adopt Labor's policy to properly index university funding and reverse the Howard government's 25 per cent fee hike? Before I call the minister, I'd point out to the member for Jagger Jagger that the authenticity of the question was not influenced by the inclusion of the professor's name. The Minister for Education, Science and Training. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I'd firstly point out to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition that the University of Ballarat will receive a minimum $6.8 million in core funding as a result of this government's uh, higher education reforms before it accesses any of the performance-based funding pools as a part of the uh, $2.6 billion five-year program. I'd also uh, say to the member for Ballarat, in fact, that uh, she and every member on the other side voted against that. I'll also be making sure that the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Ballarat is fully aware of the consequences of Labor Party's policy, member which is a Ballarat. $1 billion deficit in funding, which is underfunded, where the Labor Party has been advising universities that they will be fully compensated for at least $662 million 
for hex changes over the next four years, at the same time as deceiving the Australian taxpayer into believing that the policy is fully funded. I might also take this opportunity to remind the House Mr. Speaker, that HEX is a, a system where the student, not as a student but once the student has graduated, pays back his or her 25 per cent share of the cost of their education through the tax system. The Australian taxpayer, the vast majority of whom have never seen the inside of university, will continue to pay for almost three quarters of the cost of university education. And it also ought to be, the House ought to be reminded that the average HECS debt in Australia at the moment is $8,500. 90% of those people who owe the taxpayer money for HECS owe less than $18,000. A university graduate has a lifetime unemployment rate Member of a quarter of that that hasn't been to university. And in their very first year of graduation, even after all of these changes, even after all of these changes, in their very first year of graduating, in every single case, with the exception of law, the university graduate will earn more in his or her first year of working than their entire hex debt could possibly be under these changes. And as the uh, British Prime Minister said, it is free at the point of entry, it's fair at the point of repayment, and every last dollar goes to the university to benefit the education of those students. The Honourable Member for Eden Monero. Mr Speaker, uh, my question is addressed to the Treasurer. Uh, would the Treasurer inform the House what families should do to prepare for benefits that are set to be delivered? Does the Treasurer have any suggestions to families on how to maximise their benefits? Are there any threats to these benefits being delivered? The Honourable the Treasurer. Well, Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for uh, Eden Monero for his question, and I welcome the uh, interest that he shows in family policy, uh, because uh, as far as uh, the government is concerned, families are the building block of our society, and we want to make sure that they're kept strong, Mr Speaker. Now, he, uh, he asked me what people could do to ensure that they get their uh, benefits, and uh, there will be an additional $600 per child paid before the 30th of June this month Mr Speaker to all of those families which are eligible for the family tax benefit part A if there are families that are worried that uh, they haven't received it yet uh, and we're not expecting it to be paid until about the middle of the month they call the, call the fax phone number on uh, 136150 Mr Speaker they could access the website or uh, if they have any doubt uh, about their entitlement, they could uh, ring their local federal MP uh, to uh, find out about uh, their, uh, their benefits, Mr Speaker. Or in, uh, in Labor electorates, they could uh, ring coalition senators uh, to make sure that they were uh, properly informed as to their entitlements. Now, Mr Speaker, um, because, uh, because, Mr Speaker, I'm not sure that there'd be any point in ringing the local Labor MP, because the Labor Party seems to be so opposed Member to these Bradden. additional benefits. Uh, can you imagine if you rang up uh, in the electorate of, uh, of Braddon, Mr Speaker, uh, to ask about the benefits of a coalition uh, budget? You'd get a harangue on the other end of the phone, but you wouldn't get much information. Now, Mr Speaker, uh, can I say uh, that uh, it is not just $600 per child that uh, families can be receiving, because the increase is an additional $600 per child Treasurer, per annum. Treasurer, resume his seat. A great deal of tolerance was extended to the member for Braddon because the Treasurer had in fact engaged him in the answer. Persistent interjection will be dealt with. The Treasurer has the call. Mr Speaker, but the government of course has also changed uh, eligibility for family tax uh, benefit um, in respect of the income test and the taper test. And I do ask the, the House to follow me in relation to this. Um, a family where the, uh, the father is on uh, 40,000, uh, about uh, average um, earnings, uh, Mr. Speaker, where the mother is working part time with an income of around 10,000 and with two children, one under five, on an annual basis they would receive an additional $1,200 per annum, that's 600 per child. Mr Speaker, because of the changes in the taper rate, they would get an additional 965 
dollars under family tax benefit A, and because of the changes in the taper rate for family tax benefit B, they would get an additional $1,252. That family, uh, starting, Mr. Speaker, from 1 July, uh, well, that family, Mr. Speaker, when all of these uh, entitlements are introduced in full, would be entitled to an additional $3,417 per year. They are the benefits that are delivered to uh, that family, and, Mr. Speaker, as as many of us know, uh, it's becoming much more common for uh, mothers with young children to go back into the workforce on a part-time basis. Uh, our changes to the Family Tax Benefit Part B will encourage that, and uh, that cameo of a family would be better off by $3,417 per year. Now, let me say, in addition to this, this government wants to introduce a superannuation co-contribution, so that if that family were to make payments uh, and both the father and the mother could make payments into superannuation, they would get 150 per cent of the contribution that they make. Now, Mr Speaker, why would any political party oppose such a policy? What, why, why is the Australian Treasurer Labor Party Mr. Mr. Speaker, opposing a proposal which would give a family like that an additional benefit of 150 per cent of any money that they contribute to superannuation. Mr Speaker, it's one thing to say that you want to support families that are earning thirty or forty thousand dollars, but when it comes to votes in this parliament, if that were in fact your position, Mr Speaker, why would you vote down a co-contribution scheme? And yet uh, I don't know that it's dawned on the Labor Party backbench following the member for Werriwera, they are voting down a superannuation co-contribution to those families. They are opposing the superannuation co-contribution, Mr Speaker. The Australian Labor Party is opposing, is opposing a 150 per cent proposal for low-income earners in relation to superannuation contribution. Now, Mr Speaker, uh, as, the, as the Foreign Minister says, it's not in the Dick Morris book, Mr Speaker. But what other reason could there be for taking such a position? Now, Mr. Speaker, I was then asked this question, what can families do to guarantee they keep their entitlements? And I want to make this point, that the Australian Labor Party has not agreed to keep the benefits which the government has introduced under family tax benefits. They have said that they will vote them through, and the Australian Labor Party has said they will apply in 2004-2005. But the Australian Labor Party does not guarantee those benefits thereafter. And that has been made entirely clear by the member for Fraser and indeed made clear by the member for Kingston, who said that this money was not quarantined. They were his words, not quarantined, Mr Speaker, with the intention that they could be taken back. Now, why would the Australian Labor Party want to take these benefits back? Well, it's also obvious. The Australian Labor Party has made a number of unfunded promises which can't be paid for. The Australian Labor Party says that it's going to introduce new tax cuts for everybody, and we await with bated breath to see the dimension of those tax cuts. The Australian Labor Party also says it's going to spend more in various areas of government expenditure, and the Australian Labor Party says after taxing less and spending more, they're going to have more left over at the end of it. So, Mr Speaker, that's why they are enviously eyeing these family tax benefits. And I just want to say to that family, 40000 with mum earning 10000 in part-time work, that additional benefit of $3,417 is under threat from a Labor election victory. Now, Mr Speaker, until such time as the Australian Labor Party can announce a policy and it runs from scrutiny. Here we are, the Leader of the Opposition, running the small target strategy. That's what he essentially is doing, the small target strategy. He won't put out any tax policies or any family policies or any funding policies, Mr Speaker. He's trying to run this small target strategy, the strategy which he himself decried, because he's hoping that the media won't put him under any scrutiny. Treasurer. Well, we say this. Mr Speaker, the Australian Labor Party is entitled to take away those family tax benefits and it is entitled to take away those tax cuts, just like it is trying to take away those superannuation benefits, but only on the basis that it comes clean before the election. 
It is only entitled to do that if it is honest with the Australian people before the election, Mr. Speaker. And that's why the Leader of the Opposition will come under increasing media scrutiny over the weeks which are ahead, because he knows these promises of all things to all men and women cannot be delivered, and the Australian public demand to know the truth. The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Given that Major O'Kane's end of tour report of 9 February was tabled in Senate estimates this morning, detailing the central role of Australian defence lawyers in investigating allegations of Iraqi prisoner abuse, and that this report was submitted to the defence chain of command, does the Prime Minister now concede that Australian government officials knew about the Iraqi prison atrocities much earlier than April? Given that the government has provided misleading advice to both Parliament and the Senate estimates, will the Prime Minister now set out a full account of when the government and its officials knew of these atrocities and what action they took? Prime, Honourable Prime Minister. I've already indicated that um, there were uh, reports uh, sent through uh, to uh, uh, officials in departments in Canberra from Iraq prior to April. But what I have said before and what I repeat, uh, Mr Speaker, is that uh, I, as Prime Minister, and as I understand it, relevant ministers as ministers, uh, were not um, aware or conscious of the serious uh, criminal abuses which have been exemplified and typified by the publication of those photographs until April, Mr Speaker. Can I take the opportunity of uh, saying also to the House that all the comments that I've made on this matter have been based on advice I have received from the Department of Defence, Mr Speaker. I, I do not have direct Member for personal Lowe. knowledge, and nor could anybody reasonably expect me, Mr Speaker, to have had direct personal knowledge. I might also, Member for Ballarat. Mr Speaker, uh, you know, in, in just on the question, just on the question of knowledge, Mr Speaker, could I make this point? I visited for um, Prospect. Ba Baghdad on the 25th of April, Mr Speaker. On the 25th of April, I met when I was in Baghdad not only the commanding officer of the Australian Defence Forces in the Iraqi region, but I also met uh, the. Uh, the head of the Coalition Provisional Authority, Mr Bremer. I met the CENTCOM commander, General Abizade, and I met General Ricardo Sanchez, and I spoke to a large number of Australian defence personnel. I was accompanied by uh, a number of journalists, Mr Speaker. There was no mention to me by anybody of the prisoner abuse issue, and this was on the 25th of April, Mr Speaker. Now, I would have thought, Mr Speaker, that if, that if, that if knowledge Brisbane. of this matter were around, Mr. Speaker, beyond um, a very, very small number of people, and I'm talking here of the Australian side, Mr. Speaker, I would have thought that if the Americans regarded this as something that in any way involved the Australians, Mr. Speaker, then the, the matter would have been raised uh, with me by General Abizade or General Sanchez, Mr. Speaker, but it wasn't. And I think that goes to question. Mr Speaker, it goes to the issue of my the state of knowledge uh, on the 25th of April and is certainly consistent with the assertion Mr. Speaker, uh, that I have made. I did indicate Mr. Speaker, in the House yesterday that the Defence Department had in its possession, and I, I say this for the purposes of completeness of that answer yesterday, Mr. Speaker, had in its possession some documents described as working drafts or working papers. I have now been briefed on these papers, and I am told by the Defence Department that the working papers of October-November last year do indeed cover advice previously given to me by the Department, that is, that they are largely a discussion of prison conditions and possibilities for improvement or amelioration. However, I have now been told that the documents also canvassed allegations of unacceptable treatment of prisoners. Mr. Speaker. I have been informed by the Defence Department that these documents were handed over by Major O'Kane to the Department on the 11th of May, although one had been with the Department since February, and that their content was considered systematically by the Department for the first time over the last few days. They were then drawn to Senator Hill's attention over the weekend, and then, as indicated to my attention, Mr Speaker, as the House will know, these matters are still before the Senate Estimates Committee. However, and this goes very directly 
to the point asked by the Leader of the Opposition. Member I have asked Senator, Senator Hill, when the Senate meets again, he is the responsible minister, the defence minister, to make a full statement to the Senate on this issue, uh, canvassing Order. both the Member chronology and the substance of contact between ADF personnel, the Coalition Provisional Authority in Iraq, the ICRC for and Smith. the extent and timing of communication of the details of such contact to officials of the government in Australia. Mr. The member Speaker, for is it remains the case Mr. Speaker, that all statements that I have made on this issue have been based on advice from the Department of Defence. Mr. Speaker. All statements have been based on that advice. Mr. Speaker, and most importantly of all, Mr. Speaker, member for Watson. It should, it should be emphasised again that at no stage did Australia hold prisoners in Iraq. Mr. Peter, let me say that again. At no stage did Australia hold prisoners in Iraq. There has been no suggestion of any Australian involvement in prisoner abuse, and any implication to that effect, Mr. Speaker, should be totally rejected. It seems that simply warning the member for Ballarat never achieves anything at all. Should she persist, I'll have no occasion but to deal with her under Standing Order 303. 303. The Honourable Member for Fairfax. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my Fairfax. To this address to the Attorney General. The member for Fairfax has the call and cannot be heard. Member for Fairfax. Thank you. Would the Attorney General advise the House whether David Hicks or Mamdu Habib can be returned to Australia to face criminal charges? The Honourable the Attorney General. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I thank the Honourable Member for his question, uh, and let me just make it clear that Mr. Hicks and Mr. Habib are alleged to have undergone training with al-Qaeda, amongst other matters. Um, and any person, any person, any Australian who receives such training now faces criminal penalties under the Commonwealth Counter-Terrorism Laws enacted in 2002. And uh, the same argument applies in relation to the application of international law. The fact remains that prosecuting someone for an act that at the time constituted an offence under international law, but is not Australia's law, regardless of how you present it, if uh, an enactment was to now make it unlawful, would be retrospective. The government has made its position clear that Australia's terrorism offences will not operate retrospectively. Uh, the opposition, Mr Speaker, on the other hand, is not uh, quite as sure about its own position on these matters. In fact, over the weekend, on uh, separate interviews given by the Leader of the Opposition and the member for Jellybrand, uh, it was quite clear that there were conflicting views. The Leader of the Opposition was quoted as saying, uh, we have, and I quote, we have argued consistently Order. that justice should be dispensed— Order. The Attorney General. The Member for Wills on a point of order, I presume. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Understanding Order 145, the member for Fairfax asked whether Mr. Hicks or Mr. Habib can be returned to Australia to face criminal charges. I'd suggest to you that he's now straying from the question he was asked. The Attorney General, I did note the question. The Attorney General will refer to the return of Mrs. Hicks and Habib to Australia and the legality of it. Yes, well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'm dealing with. Uh, the context in relation to this matter, because there are arguments, there are arguments by some uh, that uh, justice should be dispensed in Australia because they're Australian citizens, and by others who have said that there are some limits to our law. And this is the member for Jellybrand. I think she dealt with this issue uh, quite admirably because she said, "I don't think it is impossible." to apply international laws here, but it would require a bit of unusual legislation being introduced to do it. And she goes on to say, I am not sure that there is an argument for us to do that yet. 
Now, the opposition needs to state its position clearly in relation to this matter, Mr. 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 Speaker. Member for um, the opposition needs to state its position clearly in relation to these Minister matters. Minister, resume your seat. Do something about it. You're running the place, John, eh? Order. The member for Jellybrand not only persistently interjects, but interjects after I have drawn her attention to her obligations. The Attorney General has the call. Speaker, I, I just make this point again that the opposition needs to state clearly whether it supports retrospective criminal laws or whether it is, as the Shadow Minister suggested, a little too difficult. Um, but the government is very clear in relation to this matter. Our view is that Mr Hicks and Mr Habib should be made to stand accountable for their actions before a proper authority. And in this case, the US military commissions established for this purpose. And our view is that that should be occurring as expeditiously as possible, and it's why the Prime Minister has made very frequent representations to ensure that that has occurred. The Honourable Member for Cowan. Mr Speaker, thank you. My question is to the Prime Minister. Is the Prime Minister aware that yesterday in Senate estimates, when asked about the activities and knowledge of Major O'Kane, Senior defence officials could not answer on at least 32 occasions before dinner time when questioned about the allegations of serious abuse of Iraqi prisoners. Prime Minister, doesn't the inability of senior officials to answer these questions demonstrate the need for Major O'Kane, the military officer who visited the Abu Ghraib prison on at least five occasions? and who played a central role in coordinating the Red Cross investigations of these allegations of serious abuse to appear and give evidence before the Senate. Will the Prime Minister now direct the Minister for Defence to allow Major O'Kane to appear at Senate estimates? Yeah. Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the answer to the question is no, but it does indicate the desirability of the detailed statement that I've asked Senator Hill to make to the Senate when it meets. Member for Hotham. Member for Prospect. The Honourable Member for Riverina. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is addressed to the Treasurer. Would the Treasurer inform the House of the economic data released today? And what do these results indicate about the importance of consistent economic management? The Honourable the Treasurer. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for uh, Riverina uh, for her question and uh, acknowledge the work that she does on behalf of uh, the electorate of Riverina. Uh, can I inform her that today's uh, balance of payments uh, figures for the uh, March quarter were uh, released, showing that the current account widened to $12 billion, or 6.1 per cent of GDP. Uh, this was driven by an increase in the trade deficit, which in turn was driven by strong growth in imports. Uh, imports increased 7 per cent in the March quarter and 16.6 per cent over the year. Mr Speaker, that's consistent with a strongly growing domestic economy. Uh, export volumes for the quarter rose 2.2 per cent. That is, they increased, but they did not increase by as much as the import figures with rural goods uh, rising a strong 13 per cent in the March quarter. And, Mr Speaker, uh, that was primarily due to a strong rise in the export of cereal grains. Uh, grain exports have more than doubled over the year, uh, reflecting uh, uh, last year's wheat crop uh, and some recovery from the drought, although, Mr Speaker, we would be uh, foolish if we were to think that uh, the effects of the drought have uh, fully worked through or that the drought has broken. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, what these figures suggest is that net exports will subtract 1.3 per cent uh, from March quarter GDP growth. Uh, and, Mr Speaker, we have forecast, uh, however, that uh, as the domestic economy cools somewhat and the world economy picks up somewhat, that the position in relation to the balance of payments will improve, i.e. Australia will uh, not be bringing in uh, the ex import rise uh, that it has in the last year and that markets for our exports will increase over the course of the year. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, net foreign debt in the March quarter was at 47.9 per cent of GDP, 
the statistician has released a news release uh, just uh, in the last uh, minutes indicating that the percentage figures in Table 33 and the, uh, the actual publication are wrong, uh, and he has uh, revised uh, those figures, Mr Speaker, uh, down to 47.9, which is lower than it was uh, as a proportion of GDP in uh, December of 2002 and March 2003. So, in proportionate terms, net foreign debt uh, has declined. Uh, retail trade, which was released today, Mr Speaker, shows that uh, uh, the value of retail trade was unchanged in the month, but 7.4 per cent higher over the course of the year. Uh, and combined with the easing of activity in the housing sector, uh, this is uh, consistent with slowing of domestic demand. Mr Speaker, uh, these figures, 6.1 uh, per cent of GDP uh, on the current account, Mr Speaker, are uh, not, certainly not the worst current account that Australia's had, but we don't want to be complacent about it. Uh, the current account uh, deficit is high. As I said in earlier, uh, we are forecasting over the course of the year with demand slowing domestically and the world economy picking up, uh, that those figures should improve. Uh, but uh, anyone who imagines that uh, all of Australia's economic challenges are behind it uh, would be wrong. Uh, we have significant economic challenges. Uh, add to that the world oil price, uh, rising interest rates uh, around the world, Mr Speaker, and it's going to take quite considerable economic management uh, in Australia over the next year or two. And in particular, it's going to take considerable consistent economic management. Running the Australian economy is not like running a municipal council, Mr Speaker. It takes, uh, it takes uh, a considerable skill. And, uh, one has to have uh, sophistication in relation to economic management. And uh, the thought that a failure uh, in running a local council could somehow qualify one for running a national economy uh, is, uh, is uh, spectacularly false, Mr Speaker. Uh, it is a difficult business. It does require consistency, Mr Speaker. Uh, it's not the kind of thing, uh, Mr Speaker, that uh, one can pick up from uh, political advisers' books or uh, the latest download in relation to uh, Google, Mr Speaker. It's something that takes uh, disciplined economic management, and the people of Australia require that disciplined economic manager because the future of their jobs and their businesses rely upon it. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, why has it taken opposition senators just one day of Senate hearings to uncover multiple tasks relating to prisoner abuse allegations performed by at least six Australian defence lawyers in Iraq between August last year and February this year, including liaising between the Americans and the International Committee of the Red Cross to stop the prison abuse at Abu Ghraib, given he says none of this was known by the government. Prime Minister, hasn't the government gone so far as to remove a photo of Major O'Kane at work at Abu Ghraib prison from the Defence Department website? Member for Hotham. Members on my right. Members on my left, the Prime Minister. In questions about removing things from the website, do I, Mr. Speaker? Do I, do I hear it correctly, Mr. Speaker? I understand that matter was dealt with in the Senate estimates yesterday, and it's a matter entirely within the control of the Defence Department. The member for Hotham. Member for Melbourne. Honourable Member for La Trobe. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question without notice is to the Minister for Health and Ageing. Uh, would the Minister update the House on how Australian families have benefited from government support for private health insurance? Uh, is the Minister aware of any alternative policies? The Minister for Health and Ageing, Leader of the House. Well, Mr Speaker, I thank uh, the member for La Trobe for yet another one of his many excellent questions uh, in this House. Uh, and Mr Speaker, I, uh, I certainly can inform, uh, I can, I can inform the member for La Trobe and other members uh, 
uh, that this government strongly believes that you can't have good public hospitals unless you have good private hospitals as well, and you won't have a strong Medicare system unless you also have a strong private health insurance system uh, to back it up. And Mr. Speaker, thanks to the policies of the Howard government, private health insurance rates have gone from 30 per cent and falling to 43 per cent and stable. Thanks to the Howard government's policies, there are now nine million people. There are now nine million people who enjoy the security and choice that private health insurance brings. And Mr. Speaker, these nine million people, they know where the Howard government stands. They know where the government stands, and they're now entitled to know where the Australian Labor Party stands and whether the Australian Labor Party is going to rip the guts out of the private health insurance rebate and take away from them the $800 a year on average that they gain Member thanks for to Bass. the private health insurance rebate. Mr. Speaker, lest anyone think uh, that these are all uh, rich people, Mr. Speaker, let the, let the member for Lawler understand that there are one million Australians, one mil million Australians earning less than $20,000 a year. Uh, who have private health insurance, and they, and they need to know where the Australian Labor Party stands. Mr. Speaker, I'm quoting, uh, I'm quoting uh, uh, Mr. Ahmed Murad uh, uh, of Enmore, who says, uh, "Please keep the 30% rebate. As if it is removed, private health insurance will be out of reach." Uh, and Mr. Speaker, I'm sure he was just speaking on behalf of the 37% of people in Graindler who have private health insurance. Uh, I'm quoting Mr. Alan Casians. Uh, of Wyndham Vale, who says, and I quote, the 30 the per 30, cent the 30 rebate makes it possible for retirees to afford the best possible medical care when ageing bodies really need it. And Mr Speaker, uh, he was one of the 30 per cent of people in the electorate of Lawler uh, with private health insurance. Uh, I, I'm quoting now Mr Speaker John Davey of Canberra, who said, should the rebate be discontinued, we would not be able to afford to pay the extra 30 per cent as we are low-income earners, and he's one of the 53 per cent of people in Canberra with private health insurance. Well, Mr. Speaker, these people need to know where the Labor Party stands. And you'd think that if the Labor Party really did support private health insurance, they'd just say so. They'd just say so. They'd, they'd put these people out of their suspense and just say so. But, Mr. Speaker, I am sure that the true view, that the true view of the opposition was expressed by the member for Werriwa back in the days when he believed that expounding policy was as important as reading stories to schoolchildren. Mr. Speaker, let me read, if I may, yeah, Mr. Speaker, too, if I could read for a moment uh, to the member for Werriwa something uh, from a book, from a book from the Hansard of 1997, talking about the private health insurance rebate. He said, and I quote: "This is the maddest piece of public policy." that one will ever see out of the Commonwealth Parliament. This is a first-rate absurdity. So that's what the Leader of the Opposition thinks uh, about the private health insurance rebate. And Mr Speaker, let me say something, if I could, uh, through you to the Leader of the Opposition. There is more to being the alternative Prime Minister of this country than reading stories to school kids, Mr Speaker. It's also about producing policies that the adults of this country can read and understand for themselves. And Mr. Speaker, let me just, uh, let me, if I may, remind you uh, that what was the sole contribution to public policy debate of the alternative prime minister of this country yesterday? His sole contribution was standing up and reading aloud something called "Where is the green sheep?" That was what the alternative prime minister of this country was doing yesterday. Where is the green sheep? I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't work out, Mr. Speaker, whether this was a coded, a coded message to Senator Bob Brown, Mr. Speaker, or a subtle appeal to the environmentalists of New Zealand. But, Mr. Speaker, it's high time, it's high time that he grew up, Mr. Speaker. It's high time that he got serious. It's high time that he told people where he stands on private health insurance because, Mr Speaker, if he doesn't make it clear, people will get the message, a very clear message. If there's ever a Labor government, you will pay more for your health. Yeah. The member for Griffith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer to the February 2004 report, the Red Cross report, 
which states in its first paragraph that the report deals with, and I quote, a number of serious violations of international humanitarian law, and these violations have been documented and sometimes observed while visiting prisoners of war in Iraq between March and November 2003. Will the Prime Minister confirm to the Parliament when it was in May this year that the Prime Minister's office or his department first received this February 2004 report? And if the Prime Minister, Senator, if the Prime Senator, Minister doesn't Minister have, Affairs. if the Prime Minister doesn't have that date readily at hand, would he please consult with his advisers and inform the House before he departs the United States? The Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr. Um, having heard the Honourable gentleman's question, I will seek advice. The Honourable Member for Macpherson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. Would the minister inform the House Order. how small businesses have benefited the member for from— Our Minister for Foreign Affairs, the member for McPherson will commence her question again. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. Would the minister inform the House how small businesses have benefited from workplace relations reform? Are there any threats to these reforms? The, minister for, the Honourable Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I thank the Honourable Member for uh, McPherson for her question and her interest in the conditions under which small business can thrive both in her electorate and throughout Australia. Uh, Mr Speaker, since this government uh, came to office, we've seen record growth in labour productivity. We've seen a record number Member of jobs Hasler. created, something like 1.3 million extra jobs in this country. We've seen sustainable increases in real wages for employees. We've seen record low interest rates and record low industrial disputes. Now, Mr Speaker, this didn't just happen by accident. It happened because of the careful management of the Australian economy by this government, and it also happened because of the development of flexible labour market conditions throughout Australia. Uh, other matters, Mr Speaker, uh, such as reforming the capital gains tax uh, system in this country, cutting personal tax thresholds, all of these measures taken by this government have led to more jobs and better conditions under which small business can thrive in this country. But the honourable member for McPherson asked me, are there threats or risks to these conditions? And indeed, Mr Speaker, there are. Uh, just yesterday, Mr. Speaker, it was reported in the Australian newspaper uh, that the member for Fremantle, the president of the Australian Labor Party, uh, is reported to have told a business group behind closed doors that there would only be modest changes to the workplace relations structure under a Labor government. Well, Mr. Speaker, some of these, some of these so-called modest changes, including regulating independent contractors, uh, increasing union power by giving the union bosses a foot in the door of every workplace in Australia, forcing businesses to negotiate with the union bosses whether employers or employees want to or not, removing the secondary boycott provisions from the Trade Practices Act, increasing the powers of the Australian Industrial Relations Commission to intervene in the workplace, abolishing junior wage rates and increasing the regulation of workplace bargaining, so-called modest increases, according to the member for Fremantle. Mr Speaker, in addition to this, it's the Labor Party's policy to abolish the individual employment arrangements under Australian workplace agreements. Currently, Mr Speaker, some 16 per cent of federal agreements in Australia are the individual Australian workplace agreements, and on average people on Australian workplace agreements are earning some 23 per cent more than if they were covered by a certified agreement. Now, Mr Speaker, on, on top of these so-called modest uh, changes, uh, indeed a massive re-regulation of the workforce in Australia, we learn some more about what the Labor Party uh, policy is for business and small business in particular in an article in the Australian Financial Review today. And I quote, the spokesman uh, for the Labor Party, that is, the spokesman said, employees should not be dependent on the size of their employer's business or on whether they are casual or permanent, 
to be entitled to redundancy payments. Mr Speaker, what this is saying, what the Australian Labor Party is proposing, what a spokesman has reported in the Australian Financial Review today is saying that redundancy payments and redundancy conditions would be extended to casual employees in Australia. So, Mr Speaker, not only have we got a situation that small business is facing now where the Australian Labor Party is standing in the way of our proposals to change the redundancy system for small business, what the Labor Party want to do is to go further than that, and they want to extend the casual, the redundancy provisions and the casual and the provisions in relation to redundancy for payments Burke. to casual employees as well as permanent employees. No, no wonder, Mr. Speaker, no wonder, Mr. Speaker, that the member for Brand, the former, the former leader of the opposition, uh, said famously once on radio in Perth that the Australian Labor Party is not the party of small business. Too right. They are not the party of small business. These are more proposals which are, which are slipping out uh, from Labor Party spokespeople and what's said behind closed doors about the massive re-regulation that the Australian Labor Party would engage in if they were ever elected to government. What it shows once again, Mr Speaker, that there is a, a yawning gulf between what, what the Labor Party is saying behind closed doors in some instances, talking about a so-called modest changes to workplace relations and the reality which would be a massive re-regulation to the detriment of small businesses in this country and to the detriment of the creation of the jobs. The Honourable Member for Lilly. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question without notice is directed to the Prime Minister. Is the Prime Minister now aware of evidence provided to Senate estimates yesterday confirming families who lodge tax returns early will not be advised of family benefit debt clawbacks until after September? Prime Minister, is this a rerun of what the government did in 2001? when it delayed telling families of debts until after the election. Prime Minister, given that these 150,000 families— Order. Member for Lily He thinks it's funny, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Order. He it's clever, How he the member, member for Blair— the, order. the member for Lily has the call. He's being interrupted by members on both sides. The member for Lily. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister. Given that these 150,000 families will be kept in the dark about their debts, will the Prime Minister ensure that the proposed $20 million advertising campaign for families, scheduled for June and July, will advise those families that the second $600 payment may be clawed back against any debt the family has? The Treasurer. Uh, Member for Lilly has asked his question. The Treasurer has the call. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I welcome the uh, question from the member for Lilly, and member the answer for is luck. no. Uh, can I go on, Mr. Uh, Speaker, and uh, say that up until uh, yesterday, I thought the complaint of the member for Lilly yes. was that uh, the additional second $600 would be used to offset debts. Uh, yesterday he changed his tact and he complained that it would not be used to <laughs> offset debt, Mr Speaker. Um, he can make one complaint or the other, but he can't make both. Uh, so, Mr Speaker, we, we force him to his election. Can I say, uh, Mr Speaker, that uh, as the government has announced, every family, every family, Mr Speaker, that is eligible for family tax benefit will be receiving an additional $600 per annum. And, Mr Speaker, that is not just in respect of this financial year ending 2004, but a payment before the end of this financial year in the month of June. And the undeniable fact as a consequence of that, no matter how much he twists and turns, no matter how much, Mr Speaker, he changes his ground, no matter how much, Mr Speaker, he tries to try and get these questions going, the undeniable fact of that, Mr Speaker, is under the coalition government, families eligible for family tax benefit A will receive an additional $600 per child per annum. And, Mr Speaker, they will get that for a payment before the 30th of June and they will have an entitlement after Member the 30th of Kingston. June. Now, Mr Speaker, I also uh, make the point, as we have on numbers of occasions, 
that uh, under the Australian Labor Party, although you got far less, far less in family allowance, those people that had received overpayments had to make that good. The only difference in the current scheme from the way in which the Australian Labor Party administered is that if you have an overpayment, you have to make it good, but if you have an underpayment, you are entitled to a top-up. Something. No, it's a top-up. It actually, it, Lilly, actually it actually turns out, Mr. Speaker, to be more money. To be more money, and it turns out to be more money, which the Australian Labor Party never allowed them, not in 13 years. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, we think that uh, actually that's fair to the person concerned and fair to the taxpayer, because the one thing I've not heard the uh, member for Lilly say in all of this debate. And I would be interested if he did so, is that if you received an overpayment, you shouldn't have to make that good. Because, Mr. Speaker, if the Australian Labor Party's view is that by understating your income and receiving an overpayment, that you wouldn't have to make that good, then the taxpayers of Australia would have to make that good. And I don't think that would be fair on the taxpayers no. of Australia, Mr. Speaker. I don't think that would be fair on the taxpayers of Australia. These are very generous benefits, Mr Speaker, and the benefits to which people are entitled should be paid. And If during the year they have been underpaid, they should be entitled to a top-up. If during the year there has been an overpayment, Mr Speaker, then of course that can be set off against additional entitlements, including the $600. That is fair to the person concerned, and it is fair to the taxpayers of Australia. And, Mr. Speaker, Mr Speaker, the one undeniable fact in that fair system is, under the coalition, they will be receiving more money than they ever did under the Australian Labor Party, point one. And point two, that increase is at risk because the one assurance we have not had from the Australian Labor Party is that if they are elected, those payments will stay. And the member for Fraser has made it entirely clear Mr. Speaker, that the Australian Labor Party will not guarantee beyond 2004-2005 those payments. And so the families of Australia ought to know this and they ought to understand it. Those increased family benefits are only guaranteed under the Liberal and National Parties and are at threat and at risk from the Australian Labor Party. General Member for MacArthur. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is addressed to the Minister for environment and heritage. Is the minister aware of any proposals that would increase the price of electricity for Australian families and businesses? And what, and what is the government's response to these possible proposals? The, minister for environment, the Honourable the Minister for Environment and Heritage. Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for MacArthur for his question, and I know his very strong commitment to the families in the electorate of MacArthur. I am aware Mr. Speaker, of proposals that would increase the price of electricity for every Australian household and business, and those proposals are coming from the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, large increases in electricity prices are the inevitable consequence of the Leader of the Opposition's policy to ratify the Kyoto Protocol and establish a national emissions trading system. The Leader of the Opposition Mr. Speaker, used to claim to understand the impact of uh, increased electricity wheels. prices on business and jobs. And I recall that when he was campaigning in the by-election for the seat of Cunningham, he condemned this policy yes. as extremist. And it's just as uh, well to remind ourselves of what the Leader of the Opposition said at that time. He said, well, it's green policy to reduce greenhouse gases by 60 per cent. And Tony, that has massive consequences for jobs. If you implement their policy, you lose many, many thousands of jobs. And you couldn't reduce greenhouse gases by that amount without literally closing down BHP in Wollongong, and that would be an absolute disaster for regional policy. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, Bob Brown's policy is now the policy of the Australian Labor Party, and the, la the leader of the opposition has reneged on his commitment to preserve jobs. In fact, what is now clear is that the Leader of the Opposition is prepared to trade jobs for preferences. 
Uh, this is shaping up as one of the grubbiest political deals that we've seen for many, many years. The Allen Consulting Report, which was commissioned by the Leader of the Opposition's mates in Victoria, showed that emissions trading could cost up to 15,000 jobs and put up the price of electricity by about 27 per cent. The member now, 15,000 jobs, a 27 per cent increase in electricity prices. Uh, this, Mr Speaker, is going to have a devastating impact on Australian communities and families. Let me make the point very clearly, Mr Speaker. Australia does not need to go down this job-destroying path. It's a costly path. It's going to destroy jobs around the country. We are going to reach our internationally agreed target for greenhouse gas abatement without imposing unnecessary costs on households and businesses. But you have to wonder whether the Leader of the Opposition really understands what he's saying or whether he means what he's saying. Members may remember that he actually went to Gladstone in March to announce this job-destroying policy, this emissions trading policy, and he told the people in Gladstone that it would be good for jobs. It was a policy that would actually destroy jobs in Gladstone. It would devastate that town, as the member for Hinkler knows only too well. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition seems to believe that high costs are good for jobs. He seems to believe that higher costs make us more competitive. He seems to believe it's good for Australian families to have their electricity bills put up by $200 to $300 a year. Well, Mr Speaker, anyone who believes these things would believe anything. As Mr, Mr. Speaker, as Alan Wood wrote in The Australian this morning, if Mark Latham cares about jobs, he should reconsider his simple-minded support of ratification of Kyoto. Mr Speaker, Mark Latham hasn't become more environmental. He hasn't become greener. He's just been browned by the leader of the Greens. And Australian families and workers, Australian families and workers are going to pay the price in lost jobs and higher electricity prices for the preferences he thinks he's buying. Minister for the Minister for the Apples. Order, member for Parau resume his seat. The Minister for the Environment and Heritage will refer to the Leader of the Opposition by his title. What did he call him? Member for Parau. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries. Order. <laughs> member for Parau. Member for Parau resume his seat. Treasurer, members on my right, the member for Carayo has the call. Member for Carayo. Minister for. Uh, member for Carayo. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries. Is the Minister aware that today is National Apple and Pear Day? Is the minister also aware that the growers have organised protests against the government's draft import risk assessment, which would allow apples to be imported into Australia from New Zealand and expose the Australian industry to the threat of fire blight? Will the minister now admit that under his stewardship there has been a loss of confidence among growers in the government's import risk member assessment Karaya, process, I'll come to his question. and will the minister now follow Labor's lead and restore the integrity of the import risk assessment process by committing to a process that is based on science and science alone? <laughs> member for Fisher. I deliberately didn't raise this matter in the presence of the New Zealand Speaker for reasons that parliamentarians will understand. But if any parliamentarian refers to House of Reps practice, the guide for the parliament, of course, on page 159, they will find reference to food and refreshments being brought into the chamber and the Speaker's reaction. I am not standing here being pedantic about this so-called protest. I am standing here because 
when first this was mooted, the staff of, the staff of this chamber specifically asked the member for Franklin not to proceed with the matter, and in defiance of the chair, he did so. <coughs> the member for Franklin will apologise to the chair. The member for Prospect is warned. The member for Franklin. Mr. Mr. Speaker. Member for Franklin. Mr. Speaker, as today is National Apple and Pear Day, Franklin. and as I proudly represent one of the five seats in the Apple Isle, yeah. I symbolically placed a pink lady on the desk of each of my colleagues prior to question time. You, Mr. Speaker. Had these apples returned to my office, and I was told that you had asked them to be removed. I brought in one apple and placed it on my desk, and I thought this was appropriate on this National Apple and Pear Day. And I honestly believe that I have nothing to apologise for. The member for Franklin had specific instructions from my office. He will apologise or I will deal with him. The member for Franklin had specific no, instructions no. for which he also had individual responsibility. Member for Franklin. No, no. Mr Speaker, the apples were returned to my office. I had no instruction. That the attendant presented me with a half case of apples and I was told that you had asked them to be removed. I had no other further instruction. And as I said, I brought this apple in individually and placed it on my desk, and I don't think I have anything to apologise for. The Honourable, I will recognise the Leader of the Opposition when his own when his own members exercise the courtesy of allowing to be heard. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Speaker, I'd just appeal to you to show some leniency in this matter, given that the apples are not being used as food. They're not being eaten in the chamber. Um, the member comes from the Apple Isle, as we know it so proudly. Uh, I don't feel that the House is being brought into disrepute, that its reputation will be damaged in any way, and I just ask you to take those thoughts into account as you deal with the matter. The member for McKellar will resume her seat. Let me indicate to the Leader of the Opposition I understand the spirit of his intervention, but let me also point out to him that I have already exercised a great deal of leniency in my dealings with the member for Franklin. I take his word that there was no specific instruction that meant that the other apples came into the chamber, but equally, in defiance of what I specifically instructed, he chose to bring apples an apple into the chamber, and I have asked him, in a lenient act on the part of the chair, to apologise. His failure to do so will leave me with no choice. The member for Franklin. The member for Franklin. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I have nothing further to add. Then I name the member for Franklin. <laughs> Leader of the House. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I move that the member be suspended from the service of the House. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Is a division required? Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is that the member for Flinders be that the member for Franklin be suspended from the service of the House. The eyes will pass to the right of the chair and the nose to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Karangamite and Mallee tellers for the eyes, honourable members for Melbourne Ports and Franklin tellers for the nose. Remind the member for Ballarat that suspending orders are not suspended during a division. Order. The result of the division is eyes 80, no 64. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The member is suspended for understanding order 303 for 24 hours. The Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker. And whilst members may have now forgotten the question asked by the honourable member for Corio, the answer. Uh, the minister the, has the call. The answer to the first question is yes. I am. I am aware that today is the National Apple and Pear Day. In fact, yesterday, yesterday, I issued a press release encouraging all Australians to eat an apple or a pear today because it was not only good for their health. But it's also good for our country. Now, the answer Member to the second Brisbane. part of the honourable member's question, where he attempted to allude that Labor was supportive of a science-based quarantine system, leaves me somewhat puzzled because that's opposite to what the member for Carayo said when he was speaking on Radio 2AY uh, just a couple of days ago. Because on 2AY he actually said that uh, that uh, urged me to ignore the scientists in dealing with IRA and suggested that I should take the advice of a, of a committee of politicians on that matter. A committee Order. of politicians. So is Labor in favour of a science-based system or isn't, it, or isn't it? Does the member for Carayo in backing science Minister. today, two days ago in radio, he wanted politicians to make the decision? Now, Mr Speaker, at the meeting of agriculture ministers in Adelaide uh, just uh, last, uh, last week, uh, ministers agreed unanimously Ministers agreed unanimously, and this included the Labor state ministers, that decisions in relation to import risk assessments need to be based on science. They also, they also in a joint communique, emphasised the importance 
of, of, of respecting the professionalism of the scientists involved in the IRA process. They re reaffirmed the importance of scientific independence in the biosecurity process. Now, Mr. Speaker, in relation to apples, the uh, Biosecurity Australia appointed a panel of leading experts to oversee an assessment of the scientific issues associated with the import of apples from New Zealand. They've issued an interim report, which is now open for public consultation. Uh, the public now has an, any opportunity they choose to raise scientific issues of concern until about the 23rd of June, uh, when the, uh, th that consultation period closes. After that, the scientific issues will again be assessed. This government is committed to import risk assessments based on science. We have an obligation under the, under the World Trade Organisation to deal with issues in that regard. We export two-thirds of all the agricultural products that we produce. We want other countries to have a science-based quarantine system, and that's what we intend to deliver also for Australia. The, the other element of the hypocrisy of Labor in relation to this matter is when we look back to their days in office. Yeah. Not only did they not have an open and transparent import risk assessment process, but once the arrangements were in place, they had so few quarantine officers that there was nobody at the border to inspect the product anyhow. Uh, under this government, there has been a major upgrading, $600 million commitment to ensure that we keep I our borders safe and McMillan. secure. It. Our process will be based on sound science. And, uh, and, and if, per chance, at some stage in the future, uh, apples are allowed in from another part of the world, it will be under conditions that are safe and secure. And I've got every confidence that high-quality Australian pink lady pass. apples will be able to compete with any product that comes into this country. I've got more confidence in this industry than it's obvious that Labor has. Prime Minister. Prime Minister. Leader of the House, Minister for Health and Ageing. Uh, Mr Speaker, I wish to add to an answer. Minister may proceed. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, yesterday I answered a question about pneumococcal. Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition has been claiming that uh, 50 babies die of pneumococcal every year, uh, a claim repeated in a letter which arrives today uh, in uh, thousands of households around Australia. Uh, this claim is a lie, Mr Speaker. It's a lie. Uh, figures from the uh, National Notifiable Diseases Surveillance System uh, show that uh, there are five children under five uh, who died of pneumococcal in 2001, nine in 2002 uh, and ten in 2003. Nothing like the 50, uh, and uh, I table these letters. Right, uh, makes it okay to lie, it makes it... Order. Members on my right, members on my left. I present the Auditor General's Audit Report No. 49 of 2003-2004, entitled Business Support Process Audit, the Use and Management of HRIS in the Australian Public Service. The Minister for Health and Ageing, Leader of the House. I move that the report be printed. The question is the motion be agreed to. All those that opinion say aye. Contrary no. I think the ayes have it. Minister for Health and Ageing, Leader uh, of the Mr. House. Mr. Speaker, a paper is tabled in accordance with a list circulated to honourable members earlier today. I no take notes. The member for Adelaide. I'm wondering if you would ask the Leader of the Opposition to apologise to the Australian member. people because that letter has gone member out through my electorate. Member for and Adelaide, think, resume her seat. I think that the member for Adelaide will resume her seat. The member for Adelaide will resume her seat. Order. <laughs> Member for Lawler, Manager of Opposition Business. Uh, Mr. Speaker, on your indulgence, I'd seek to explain to the government no, the member, claims made. If they're genuinely Lawler, interested in the truth, no, then the they'll be interested Lawler in the truth of the seat. figures about death rates member for Newmarket. Member for Lawler will resume her seat. I am not going. Member for Lawler. I am not going to. The member for Lawler, member for Adelaide. I understood the Prime Minister wished to make a ministerial statement. Mr. Uh, Speaker, um, um, I seek leave to make a ministerial statement. There's leave granted. 
Mr. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased today to table the report of the Consultative Group on Constitutional Change entitled Resolving Deadlocks for Public Response. Following the release of the government's discussion paper on the deadlocks mechanism in October last year, I announced the formation of a consultative group chaired by the Hon. Neil Brown QC, a former minister in the Fraser government, and also including the Hon. Professor Michael Lavarch, a former Attorney General in the Keating government, and Professor Jack Richardson, a former Commonwealth Ombudsman. The consultative group conducted a national public consultation process focused on the two proposals canvassed in the discussion paper, the first of which would allow the Governor-General to convene a joint sitting of both houses when a bill had been twice rejected by the Senate, the second of which would allow a joint sitting after an ordinary general election to consider a bill rejected twice before the election and then once again after the election. These proposals did not represent an attack on the Senate. They were not an attempt to extend the power of the executive, nor an attack on minor parties. Since Federation, the way to resolve deadlocks has been through the existing Section 57. Only six double dissolutions have occurred since Federation, and of these on only one occasion, namely in 1974, was a joint sitting called to consider deadlocked legislation. It is my view, and that of many, that the requirements of Section 57 today impede good government. The Senate does play a very important role as a House of Review. However, as the government is formed in the House of Representatives, an elected government, regardless of its political persuasion, should be able to implement the policies on which it was elected in the interests of all Australians. The introduction of proportional representation in the Senate, combined with the move in 1983 to six senators being elected from each state at a half Senate election rather than five, has made it almost impossible for any government to obtain a majority in the Senate in its own right. A party now needs 57.16 per cent of the vote in a state at a half-Senate election to win a majority of seats in that state. Mr Speaker, by way of interpolation, I would point out that the highest recorded two-party preferred vote in any state in the House of Representatives since Federation was in Queensland in 1996. Mr Speaker, Yet on that occasion, despite that overwhelming expression of support for the coalition, it failed to win 57.16 per cent of the two-party preferred vote in the Senate. Mr Speaker, this means that opposition and minor parties have the power to persistently veto important government policies. One example of this obstruction is on the government's proposals to change the unfair dismissal laws. This is important government legislation. It's been opposed by the Labor Party on 40 occasions, that is, in both houses of parliament. Despite being a key element of government policy, endorsed by the electorate at the last two federal elections. Mr Speaker, the government does not consider that it is in the national interest that the Senate should be capable of persistent obstruction of such important measures. In recent experience, it can be difficult to engage public interest in matters of constitutional reform, but the consultative group heard from people at public meetings in every capital city and looked at the 293 submissions received by my department from interested members of the public late last year. I understand that the discussion at the public meetings attended by only around 240 people in total was robust and the issues were right ranging. And while the views expressed at the meetings were not necessarily reflective of the views of the broader electorate, the process was still worthwhile. 
I am disappointed, Mr Speaker, that while the then Leader of the Opposition welcomed the release of a discussion paper and said that Labor welcomed constitutional reform, there was no submission in response to the discussion paper from the Australian Labor Party. None whatsoever. Mr Speaker, nevertheless, and this is important, some state and territory governments did lodge formal submissions in which they supported constitutional reform of various types. I also welcome in particular the public comments of the New South Wales Premier, Mr Carr, and the Queensland Premier, Mr Beatty, who have supported the right of the lower house to prevail over an upper house, although it should be interpolated that in the case of Queensland they have devised a unique way of ensuring that that prevalence occurs, <laughs> Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the uh, consultative group uh, also had the benefit of reviewing submissions from the Democrats, the Greens, One Nation and Senator Brian Harrodin. Each of these submissions provided valuable insight to the consultative group and to the government. In its report, Mr Speaker, the consultative group has made a number of observations about public attitudes in relation to legislative deadlocks. I have previously stated that the government would consider holding a referendum in conjunction with the next federal election if the period of public consultation had revealed a reasonable prospect of community support for a change. History shows, and our own experience testifies, that constitutional change is difficult in Australia, with only eight out of 44 referenda being passed since Federation. So I've always emphasised the importance of bipartisan support. The consultative group concluded that there is not quote, any substantial measure of support for either of the two options presented in the discussion paper, end of quote. As a result, the government is not proposing a referendum on this issue at the next election. However, the consultative group also concluded that the discussion paper and the consultation processes have provided a starting point for engaging the wider community on constitutional questions and recommended, and I quote again, a wider program of consultation with the community and more attention given to educating the public about the Australian Constitution and how it operates in practice, end of quote. So, this is what I propose, so that is what I propose. In the past, the government has supported programs of education on constitutional issues. In the lead up to the centenary of Federation in 2001, the Constitutional Centenary Foundation was funded to encourage and promote public discussion, understanding and review of the Australian constitutional system. Further, through the Discovering Democracy program, the government has made a significant investment in resources for schools to teach children about the constitution and our system of government. This public consultation process on section 57 has itself made an important contribution to public debate regarding constitutional issues. In light of the consultative group's comments about a continuing program of education and consultation, I have had an initial discussion with the Leader of the Opposition about how this matter might be moved forward. He indicated that the Opposition would not favour constitutional reform in this area unless the Senate's power to block supply was reduced or substantially circumscribed or removed altogether. This is not the government's position. The government will approach future discussion on this issue from the starting point of a disposition to support option two, which would allow a joint sitting after an ordinary general election to consider a bill rejected twice before the election and then once again after the election. This is a sensible response to the problems addressed by the consultative group. In closing, I want to thank the members of the group for their work on this important issue of constitutional reform. 
Each of them brought to the role a great deal of experience in constitutional law and knowledge of the workings of government. They have each contributed a great deal of time, energy and commitment to the task of consulting on these issues. I am personally grateful for the work that they have done and for the advice they have provided to me and the government on these important matters. Mr Speaker, I commend the consultative group's report to the House and to all Australians, Mr Speaker, and um, I not only table the report but I table a copy of my statement and could I say um, in advance apology to the House, Mr Speaker, that I will not be able, by reasons of time and my other commitments, to extend the normal courtesy which I seek to do to the Leader of the Opposition to be present to hear his reply, Mr Speaker, but I will read it with interest. Thank you. I the Prime Minister has, I understand, presented the report of the Constitutional Group on Constitutional Change, Consultative Group on Constitutional Change, the Minister for Health and Ageing, Leader of the House. I move that the House take note of the paper. The question is that the House take note of the paper. The Minister for Health and Ageing, Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, leave, I ask Leave of the House to move a motion to enable the Honourable Leader of the Opposition to speak for ten minutes. Is leave granted? To the standing and sessional orders be suspended as would prevent the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition speaking for a period not exceeding ten minutes. The question is the motion be agreed to. All those out of opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Prime Minister's statement to the House today is a disappointing end to a disappointing process. His efforts to promote Senate reform didn't meet so much with opposition around the country, but rather with silence, or as the report puts it, widespread indifference. Eight forums were held around the country. All up, less than 250 people attended Australia-wide. I thank them for their participation, but wish that many more Australians had attended and participated. The reason, Mr Speaker, for this indifference was quite simple. The Prime Minister didn't ask the people what constitutional improvements they wanted. He told them, virtually demanded, the changes that he was seeking. He failed to heed the lesson of the Republic referendum that the people themselves, the Australian people themselves, must control the process. This wasn't a genuine bottom-up reform process. It was an attempt by the Prime Minister to claim that he's been the victim of Senate obstruction. It was an excuse for having no third-term agenda. It was a political exercise rather than an exercise in public policy and change. If this process has served a purpose, it's to prove that real constitutional reform in Australia has to come from the people themselves, not from politicians and their advisers. This is the true Republican ideal, a broad and rich democracy in which the people themselves participate in the reform process. Mr Speaker, I believe strongly that real constitutional change lies in giving power away in empowering the Australian people. If the Prime Minister wants to know what the Australian people really think about the changes that need to be made here in Canberra, the changes that need to be made to our constitution, he doesn't need a process like the one he's just spoken about. He should be holding community forums, engaging with the people face to face at old town hall style meetings around the nation. Mr Speaker, Labor believes strongly in constitutional reform. We are the only party, and this is proven in Australian political history, that consistently argues for the modernisation and further democratisation of our constitution. The Prime Minister has claimed that Labor made no formal submission to the consultative group, but he omitted to mention that we tabled a comprehensive discussion paper in this parliament on resolving deadlocks. As parliamentarians, we make our contribution in this place first and foremost. Our views are well known, and I thank the members for Hotham and Barton for their uh, preparation and presentation of Labor's comprehensive discussion paper on constitutional change. Mr Speaker, I believe that no reform of the Senate will succeed unless it balances the Senate's powers with greater democratic accountability for the parliament and the executive as a whole. For this reason, Labor offered to consider the second model that was included in the original discussion paper, the one the Prime Minister refers to as the Lavash model. This model allows bills that have been blocked by the Senate twice to be put to a joint sitting after a normal election for the House and half the Senate and after the bills have been blocked yet again. Labor supports this general principle 
but we cannot support any move that takes away the democratic control of the Australian people themselves. The Australian people should have the ultimate say over contentious legislation through their vote for all members of both houses. Labor would be prepared to consult on and consider the Prime Minister's second model, but only if it's accompanied by three other important reforms. The first is removing the power of the Senate to block supply. How can anyone say they're concerned about Senate power if they're not prepared to address the ultimate power of the Senate, its greatest power of obstruction, the Senate's power to block a budget and to bring down a democratically elected government, a government with a mandate in the House of Representatives? The second reform is introducing fixed four-year terms or some variation. For example, that which used to apply in the Victorian State Parliament, where terms are four years but an election cannot be held within three years unless the government loses its majority in the lower house. And the third reform is maximum four-year terms for the Senate. The Australian people will never agree to eight-year terms for the Senate. It is simply too long a period for accountability or mandates political mandates to have any meaning. In this system, every election in effect becomes a double dissolution election, giving ultimate say over blocked legislation to the Australian people. This is the most democratic way of deciding what happens when the two houses are deadlocked. Mr Speaker, these are issues for the future, for a time when this parliament has regained the trust and re-earned the respect of the Australian people. It will be a long and difficult process. And I'm disappointed that while the Prime Minister mentioned in his speech the need for more civics education, he has brought forward no new initiative, no new proposal in this particular area. But it's not just about election campaigns, Mr. S uh, education campaigns, Mr. Speaker. I want the Australian people to be more thoroughly involved in driving future constitutional reform, including the biggest change of all how we become an Australian Republic with our own head of state, an Australian president who is one of us. Labor's attempt and our approach to constitutional reform will be different to this failed attempt from the Howard government. Our guiding principle will be that the Australian people themselves, not committees of politicians and so-called eminent persons or even conventions sitting down in the old parliament house for a week or so, not involving them but involving the Australian people first and foremost. They must be the ones who determine how we are governed. Mr Speaker, constitutional reform is still possible in Australia, but it must be determined by the people. It must come from giving power away, from handing the process over to all Australians. If in doubt, I say let's have more direct votes, more plebiscites, more democracy. And that's what a Labor government will do to help. That's what a Labor government will do to help after the next federal election to establish an Australian Republic. The Hon. the Attorney General. Um, I move the debate be adjourned. The question is that the debate be adjourned. The resumption of the debate made in order of the day for the next sitting. Will those that opinion say aye? Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, the Hon. Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Speaker, I seek to make a personal explanation on Does two matters. The Leader of the Opposition claim to have been misrepresented. Uh, yes, I do on both matters, Leader, Mr Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition may proceed. Uh, the first concerns uh, the claim uh, in adding to an answer today by the Minister for Health that I lied in claiming that uh, uh, 50 children die every year from pneumococcal disease, uh, the Minister's allegation is false. The Minister has used figures from the National Notifiable Diseases Surveillance System, which has only completed data since, not, since 2001, and the data for 2003 is described as incomplete. There is a general consensus among experts that these figures are likely to underreport the true situation. Failure to test or failure to test prior to commencing of antibiotics are factors that have been identified as contributing to underreporting. Given that there is agreement among medical experts that the disease and the death rates vary considerably from year to year and such limited national data is available, Labor has turned to the only data time series available over a number of Order. years. And that is the Queensland the the data, and we've extrapolated likely national the deaths based on the, the data. The leader the of the opposition will resume his seat. The leader of the opposition will resume his seat. The minister for foreign affairs. Minister, the, the minister.
I am in fact managing this debate and I don't need any assistance from either of the ministers. The Leader of the Opposition is aware of the fact that the Chair has already exercised a good deal of tolerance in the, in the degree of argument he's been allowed to advance. He has indicated where he's misrepresented and, and indicated why the figures he used he believed were perfectly valid. And it was for that reason that I, that I thought that he should get to the next matter of personal misrepresentation. Okay, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, during question time, the Treasurer has repeatedly criticised the financial management of Liverpool City Council during my time as Mayor between September 1991 and mid-1994. This follows similar criticism by government MPs in the parliament and in the press. I want to correct this misrepresentation by making the following points. During my time as mayor, the council's debt servicing ratio fell from 17.2 per cent to 10 per cent, half the Western Sydney average of 20 per cent. At my last council meeting in mid-1994, the council adopted a debt retirement strategy that, if followed, would have made it debt-free in 2005. Between 1991 and 1994, Council's working funds balance increased from $770,000 to $1.1 million. That is, that is, its liquidity increased by 50 per cent. At the end of 1994, the budget surplus was $1.6 million. I have been further misrepresented, Mr Speaker, because in each of the three budgets during my time as Mayor, the Council achieved significant productivity gains an efficiency dividend of 3 per cent in 1992, 4 per cent in 1993 and 4 per cent in 1994. Between 1991 and 1994, Council staff numbers fell yeah. from yes. 500 to less Leader than 400, a Leader sign of the, of the financial disciplines the that were of applied. Will resume his seat. <laughs> Minister for Foreign Affairs on uh, I think uh, the Leader of the Opposition um, in I will You're very order, shortly deal screaming with the like Minister for Foreign Affairs Mr. and the member for Cowper and the member for Charlton if they don't allow the Speaker to hear whatever is to hear whatever has been recognised by the Chair. Mr. Speaker, the leader, the Minister the for Foreign the Affairs. The Leader of the Opposition is now debating the issue. He is not um, uh, drawing attention to where he was misrepresented, but expanding. Uh, this Minister into a for debate. Foreign Affairs and if he wants a debate, well, um, we'll get the Treasurer Minister back and we'll have the debate. But this is meant to be a personal. We deal with the point of order. The Minister for Foreign Affairs is warned. The Leader of the Opposition must also know the standing orders well enough to be well aware that the Speaker must now respond to the point of order. I have not denied the Leader of the Opposition the call, and I don't expect to be treated as if I have. The Minister for Foreign Affairs has raised a point of order about personal explanations, a matter with which I have become very familiar over the last two weeks because of the abuse of personal explanations on both sides. Yesterday there were two occasions when the members for Fremantle and La Trobe gave personal explanations that were textbook in their delivery. On both of those occasions they indicated where they had been misrepresented and indicated why the misrepresentation was valid. Precisely the same courtesy has been extended to the Leader of the Opposition, as he would expect, and I interrupted only when he got beyond that reasonable point on the first personal explanation. Simply, be, uh, and a greater tolerance is generally offered to the Leader of the Opposition and the Prime Minister for personal explanations anyway. The Leader of the Opposition had on the second personal explanation indicated where he was misrepresented and what steps had been taken by the Liverpool Council during his period as Mayor. He was now, I concede, moving into an area which seemed to me to advance debate. I will listen to him closely and invite him to conclude the personal explanation. Yes, Mr Speaker. Between 1991 and 1994, the period for which I have been repeatedly misrepresented by government members in this House and in the press, council staff num numbers fell from 500 to less than 400, the sign of the financial disciplines that were applied. That is the true financial position during my three years as mayor, a lower debt servicing ratio, higher working funds, budget surpluses, significant productivity gains and tighter staffings. This was a well-managed and efficient council. Yeah. The member for Lindsay. Um, I presume there is. 
I presume there is no other business before the chair. I have received letters from the Honourable the Deputy Leader of the Opposition and the Honourable Member for New England proposing that definite matters of public importance be submitted to the House for discussion today. As required by Standing Order 107, I have selected the matter which, in my opinion, is the most urgent and important. That is that proposed by the Honourable the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, namely the need namely the need to properly fund universities, particularly through increased indexation of grants and reverse the Howard government's 25 per cent hex hike so that students and their families are not faced with even greater hex debt. I therefore call upon those members who approve the proposed discussion to rise in their places. The Honourable the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Well, today in Parliament uh, we had an extraordinary admission from the uh, Minister for Education that he just can't get his sums right from one, uh, from one week to the next. He, he said he made an extraordinary claim, which was that uh, because fewer students were affected than he previously thought, the, number, uh, the amount of uh, hex debt that students were going to have to pay had gone up. Can you figure that out? I can't figure it out. Uh, there's no way I can understand a word that he had to say. Funnily enough, he did get the figures wrong. He got them very badly wrong, oh, just from last really? week to this week. We know that this education minister does have a shocking habit of fiddling the facts, but I have to say this latest effort was really quite an extraordinary achievement. Just, just last week, uh, the minister tabled this, uh, this document, this document with a lot of figures on it, new figures that supposedly last week showed just how much this government intended to gouge out of students and their families. According to the minister last week, this was last week's figure, students and their families would be paying what I thought was a pretty big uh, number, $377 million extra because of this government's fee hikes. The minister nods his head that that was the figure last week. Already we've had, of course, 18 universities right around Australia say that they intend to increase their hex. So we know that uh, students from next year are going to be uh, taking on massive amounts of additional debt if the Howard government is elected. Uh, let's just put it in uh, round figures for, for uh, people who might be listening. For, that, for students uh, next year, if this minister is still here as the Minister for Education, a student will have to pay $20,000 $20, for a basic three-year science degree. The minister's figures uh, last week, as a result of all these fee hikes, that are, of course, the direct result of this minister's decision to allow universities to put their fees up. It says it goes through each of the uh, states and uh, each of the universities in different states. In New South Wales, he said students would be paying an extra $90 million. In Queensland, uh, over $100 million more. But these were just the figures we had last week. They were, they were actually tabled in the parliament. The minister tabled these figures in the parliament just six days ago. You'd, uh, you'd think that these figures were, from last week were bad enough. $377 million extra to be taken out of the pockets of students and their families. That's how much the minister said last week he was going to take out of their pockets. But today, uh, today we have a different uh, figure, a completely different figure. It was $377 million last week out of the pockets of students, but this week it's become $662 million. $662 million in six days. Six days. Imagine if this minister stayed on as education minister for too much longer. Goodness knows how much extra this government uh, would be forcing students to pay forcing students to pay, forcing students to pay for degrees that, of course, uh, they want to get to continue their education. The government, of course, knows that uh, families aren't very impressed with these uh, massive increases in hex debts, massive increases that are going to leave students with these very high levels of debt. But, of course, uh, 
in, a way, in, a, in an attempt to cover all of this up, the government just tries to launch yet another meaningless attack on Labor policy. But of course, uh, this minister, as we know, never lets the facts get in the way of a good story. Never lets the facts get in the way of a good story. Uh, he knows, and I'm very pleased that he kept telling the parliament uh, today, that Labor has uh, a terrific uh, higher education policy called Aim Higher. It's worth $2.34 billion. The Howard government's package in additional public spending is $1.7 billion. So that means Labor is actually investing over $600 million more into our universities than the Howard government. But of course, to hide uh, this very, very basic truth, the minister uh, tries uh, yet another crude attempt. I'd have to say it's a pretty crude attempt. Once again, to, if, I, if you don't mind me saying today, to compare apples with oranges. Somebody uh, needs to explain to uh, this minister that it doesn't work to compare four years of hex hikes under this government with three years of increased public investment under Labor. Nor does it, uh, nor do, nor does it wash uh, when the minister just tries to muddy up uh, a few other individual line items. This was a great attempt last week, uh, which uh, nobody in the media took seriously because it was patently untrue. It's the case that Labor, as everyone on this side of the parliament would be very well aware, Labor is actually opposed to real interest rates on student loans. There's only one political party in this country that actually wants to charge real interest rates on student loans, and that, of course, is the political party that the minister's in, the Liberal Party. Labor is opposed to charging real interest rates on student loans, and we know that to oppose that, that will cost uh, $15 million. So we've got a line in our policy which says that uh, that will cost $15 million. The minister, of course, tried to uh, pretend that this single line item in Labor's costing somehow represented our HEX compensation fund. Well, this is another thing, frankly, he just dreamt it up. Just dreamt it up. He must have dreamt it up sometime when he was uh, dreaming up. Some time when he was dreaming up uh, the fact that student fees were only going up by 377 million, uh, when in this week. Surprisingly, it's over 600 million. How Double. much do you think it'll be Member next week? How much will it be next week? Who knows how much it'll be next week? But one thing's for sure: nobody will believe anything this minister says. One thing, one figure, one week; another figure, another week. If you want to find uh, out what Labor is going to spend on universities, of course the minister knows exactly where to go. That uh, all he has to do is read Labor's policy, and he knows that the real story is all there and demonstrates that Labor will put an additional $2.34 billion extra into our universities, considerably more public funding than this government is prepared to contribute. Yeah, yeah. It's no surprise to us that this uh, minister has got his figures so wrong, but I must say this is, this is quite a Herculean effort—377 million to 600-odd uh, million in six days. Quite an extraordinary uh, price hike, that one. Uh, these figures uh, have only come to light because uh, uh, we saw in the Courier-Mail today the figures for Queensland. The Queensland figures have gone up from $100 million last week to $180 million uh, this week. 80 per cent increase in six days. Not a bad effort, even for this government. We know this government's uh, virtually doubled uh, average HEX uh, repayments for, the, for students uh, since they've been in, in office. But boy, an 80 per cent increase in six days really takes some beating. It really, really takes some beating. Uh, Queenslanders uh, know that they'll be paying another 80 per cent more because of the minister's revelations, but I was glad to see that he, he did come clean in question time today and admit that his number had gone from $377 million last week to $662 million this week. Oops is right. Oops is just about right. This minister and uh, his uh, capacity to, to be known as the numbers man. We've all, uh, we all uh, have called him various uh, complimentary Rain names—Rain Man, the Human Abacus, the 
The, um, the man who makes it up as he goes along. That's right. This man, I have to say, this minister, we, we've seen it so many times, he just loves to let fly with uh, beautiful sets of numbers. And what we've seen is this beautiful set of numbers from last week. $377 million has magically turned into $660 million. Who knows? Who knows whether today's numbers are right? I wouldn't have a clue, but uh, I doubt the minister would know. I doubt the minister would know because, uh, of course, we have seen this so many times from this minister. So many times from this minister. Uh, I've just got a, quite a collection here. I thought I might uh, share with uh, the House of uh, other times in which uh, I, I doubt I'll get through it all in the time, but I just thought I'd share a few of them. Tabling them probably would be a good idea. Most of them are on the minister's letterhead. The member for Hotham does not have the call. One, uh, another one. We've seen uh, his extraordinary efforts when it comes to showing the increase in hex debts that students uh, will pay. But another one that he loves to tell is how many additional hex places this government intends to introduce. This is uh, in a press release of his own on the 18th of February this uh, year when he said that there'd be an additional 34,000 hex places. Mm -hmm. He says that in his press release. 34,000 additional hex places. But what he did didn't say there and uh, hasn't said on many other occasions is, of course, that includes 25,000 places that are currently underfunded by this government. The member for Brisbane. I, 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 the enough, member for Brisbane. It seems to have been the case that th this includes 25,000 places that are already in universities. Oh, they're, they're already in universities. So that's uh, that's one example. Another another beauty is that uh, this is in uh, this is in question time. Uh, question time, the 19th of February 2004. In answer to a question that I asked him, he said. The Australian taxpayer is about to invest. Get this one. You finance types are like this. The Australian taxpayer is about to invest an extra $11 billion in the next 10 years in Australian higher education. But what? Oh, he just said correct. He's just repeated it. He's just repeated it because, of course, it's not the Australian taxpayer. It's the Australian taxpayer plus the additional that students are going to pay, plus the additional that students are going to pay. Uh, the, real, uh, the one that was really priceless was uh, the member for Brisbane. The, uh, not in the forward estimates, that's right. Certainly not in the forward estimates because uh, it's students that are going to be paying a big uh, increase. Students that we see are now paying, according to today's figures, an additional $662 million. I love this one. This was a uh, transcript. The member for Kingston. This is a transcript uh, from uh, the uh, minister from the 24th of July last year. Uh, members might remem remember this beauty, where we were introduced to a new term, a new term uh, that the minister introduced. When he gets his numbers wrong, it becomes a misspeak. A misspeak. A misspeak. It, it, it becomes a misspeak. So when you get your numbers wrong uh, now, maybe today, maybe the figures today uh, are uh, just a misspeak. Maybe today's uh, 662. Goodness knows, 662 million dollars. Good knows, goodness knows what that's going to uh, that's going to be a misspeak of. We uh, we can only imagine. The uh, the. Um, the next one uh, is, uh, of course, uh, another one. We, we know that universities, we've now had 18 universities, 18 universities decide to put their fees up. Last year, in the middle of the uh, debate over uh, the higher education changes, this was uh, once again in the parliament, 16th of September 2003, uh, what the minister said is that what that means in real terms is that the hex charge for most courses in most universities will not change at all. Ah. <laughs> most courses in most universities, the hex charge will not change at all. That's what he said last year when he was trying to get the legislation through the parliament. Of course, that's, uh, that's also uh, cho uh, been shown to uh, be totally untrue. Now, when it was, uh, when it was uh, uh, the case that we had universities starting to uh, put their fees up, the uh, university that 
uh, had, uh, had the misfortune to be the first university to, put to, to decide its fees up, QUT. What was the, uh, what was the, uh, what was the decision? How did the minister respond to this? Uh, he, didn't, he didn't get up and say, well, it was because of uh, legislation that I introduced and I championed that we now have universities increasing their fees by 25 per cent. Of course, this minister, he didn't force them in. Well, he sort of did force them into it because they've cut their cut their grants by $5 billion. So he sort of did force them into it. Uh, what this minister said is, I think this is the most facile, ridiculous and nonsensical argument I've ever I've heard come from anywhere. The member That's for Brisbane right. is warm. That's exactly right. It is, uh, it's, it's just uh, extraordinary. He went on to say it's bordering on the outrageous that any university would simply increase hex charges just because it wants to be seen as a prestige institution. Well, all of our universities want to be seen as prestige institutions, and of course, uh, each and every one of them, each and every one of them, has been forced into the fee hikes that they uh, are presenting to students and their families. Order. There is only the one way they won't have to pay, and that's to vote expired. Labor at the next election. Yeah. Call the Minister for Education, Science and Training. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, in uh, over the next 15 minutes, I'll confine myself to the facts and the substantive issues in relation to higher education. Uh, Mr Speaker, we face a future in Australia with uh, collapsing age dependency ratios. We're not alone in that regard. And uh, In terms of funding essential social infrastructure for our country, whether it's in education or in health or transport or anything else, we, we really have four choices. We, we can live in a country that sustains very high rates of, rates of economic growth for a long period of time. And at the moment, we're growing at around 4 per cent per annum. We're about twice the OECD average, and we're higher than the G7, obviously. Secondly, our country could choose, and this government has no intention of doing this, but it could choose, if it wished to, to increase taxes, which would have an adverse impact on wealth creation and obviously make us less internationally competitive. Thirdly, of course, governments can choose, uh, and the Deputy Leader of the Opposition has made this observation herself on September 11, 2002, that governments can cut money out of other things, and in this case, for argument's sake, put them into universities. The fourth choice that we have before us, of course, is to ask those people who do derive a benefit from the things they receive to make an appropriate contribution to that which they will receive. The only thing that's going to count increasingly in universities, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, are the uh, international benchmarks against which higher education is being compared. University of New South Wales and Australian National University, Sydney University, they're competing with one another. But increasingly they are competing with the rest of the world. And the employability of the next generation of children who will graduate from Australian universities in other countries will be determined entirely by the reputation enjoyed by the university that conferred that degree. For that reason, Mr Speaker, uh, the government has embarked on a now implemented significant reform of Australian higher education. It's intended to firstly to get more money and a lot more money into universities over the longer term, and secondly to change the way in which we regulate and administer Australian higher education. Now, Mr Speaker, over the next uh, four years there will be $1.8 billion of public funding, fully budgeted, additional funding invested in Australian universities by this government. In addition to that, the universities for the very first time in Australia, instead of having the government politburo centrally set the hex charge for the students, the universities themselves will be setting the hex charge as they are do doing now, from nothing, from zero, to a level no more than 25 per cent above what it currently is. And the Labor Party, and it's a part of those policies, uh, there will be 35,000 additional places funded in universities over the next four years, and those 25,000 marginally funded over-enrolled places are in fact in the process of dis disappearing. And uh, in fact, uh, now at a cost of some $547 million to the public purse, those 25,000 places will be fully funded. In other words, they're not disappearing at all. And in addition to that, there will be uh, another uh, 10,000 places funded over the next four to five years. Now, in terms of those changes in, set, in terms of heading, setting hex, Mr. Speaker, this means that the universities face, under this government, 1.8 billion over the first four years, 2.5 billion over the first five years of additional public investment under these, this government's policies. 
In addition to that, if they choose to increase hex, all of that additional hex that is charged will go directly to the university to support the education of those students. The students do not pay back hex until they have graduated, until they are earning this year more than $35,000 a year. And if they never work, or if they go out of the workforce, they're not paying it back. It is an interest-free loan, and the average Australian taxpayer will continue to pay for almost three quarters of the cost of university education. And the students, not as students, unless they choose to, will pay it back as extra tax taken out of their pay when they're working. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition said that the average uh, hex debt that will be faced by students graduating for a science degree will be $20,000 for a four-year degree. Can I just point out to the House, $20,000 for a four-year science degree, if hex has been increased by a maximum 25 per cent, that represents an additional $4,000 to be paid back through the tax system over a lifetime. I can say this as a medical graduate that the maximum possible hex that a student would pay back through the tax system if they did a six-year medical degree under these changes would be 48000 The taxpayer will have paid $150,000 up front, and that medical graduate will face lifetime earnings of somewhere between five and seven and a half million dollars. Do you know that there are many Australians, many that are represented on this side, many represented on that side, who would say, I wish I had those problems. The key part of this debate, and it doesn't matter how much personal attack or derision or vilification there is of me as the minister, and I made an undertaking in my public life not to return that kind of thing, to always focus on policy, but what's, what the Deputy Leader of the Opposition is seeking to conceal is a major funding error in the, in the Labor Party's policy. The Labor Party has said and the Deputy Leader of the Opposition has repeated it today, that its policy is costed at $2.34 billion over the first four years. Now, it's interesting, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition has also said, on at least two occasions, that those universities that have chosen to increase HECS, in other words, will get extra money because of increases in HECS, will be fully compensated. So the Labor Party, if there's a change of government, would repeal the increases in HEX of up to 25 per cent, and the money the universities would, be, would lose would in fact be fully compensated to them. So in other words, the universities, and they're in the education of students, would not in any way be disadvantaged. Well, it's interesting, when she went on Meet the Press, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition went on Meet the Press on the 18th of April this year, she said, uh, well, in, well, we've in fact put our entire higher education policy out last July. It's $2.34 billion over the next four years. And of course, we'll wind back the 25 per cent hex increase. Then Brian Toohey, who's been around the block a few times, Brian asked, but is this additional money on top of compensating universities for the 25 per cent price hike? And the Deputy Leader of the Opposition said, it includes, that's the policy, it includes the 25 per cent price hike compensation. That is part of it. And then, in fact, today, in the Courier Mail, the Queensland Courier Mail, it says, and I quote, Ms Macklin said universities would be fully compensated for losing hex rises through indexation and through Labor's $450 million universities of the 21st century fund. So let's get this absolutely right. There is today $662 million represented in the 18 universities that have chosen to increase HEX from 5 to 25 per cent above what it currently would be. The reason, by the way, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the figures I presented last week were $377 million because I had asked my department to do a preliminary analysis of how much extra revenue would those universities, that's 18 who have chosen to increase it, eight have chosen not to increase it at all and 13 are yet to decide, their preliminary analysis based on students going in next year is $377 million over the four years. What my department has subsequently done is to take into account the additional 35,000 students that will be in the system. It has also taken into account the students grandfathered under the current arrangements who will obviously be washed out of the university sector over the next four years. 
So that means that rather than $377 million that the Labor Party will now have to compensate those universities for, those 18 universities, and perhaps more of the 13 yet to decide, it will need to find $662 million to fully compensate those universities to make sure that they are in no way disadvantaged by a change of government and by a change of policy. When you actually go to the Labor Party's uh, policy document, it says, uh, to page 25 on costings, oppose hex increases, real interest rate on loans, and they've budgeted $15 million, and we're looking for 662. In fact, real interest rate on loans is uh, budgeted at $4.5 million if you had a real interest rate, and in fact there's a less than 2 per cent real interest rate on fee, full fee-paying loans for students who choose to play their own way in private or public universities, but the Labor Party has also said it intends to abolish that loan scheme altogether. So why does it need $4.5 million, or even 15 if you accept their uh, uh, costings? For that, but that's another point. If you go further down the Labor Party's costings, we're looking for $662 million. It says the Deputy Leader of the Opposition says today in the Courier Mail that in fact the universities would be fully compensated for losing hex rises through two measures in its policy. The first is indexation, and the second is the $450 million universities of the 21st century fund. Well, the universities of the 21st century fund is $450 million. And the Quality Enhancement Fund, which is indexation, is $312 million. So, in other words, if the Labor Party is to honour what it has said it will do, then it needs to find $662 million today, and next week that could well be a higher figure if one or two universities choose over the next week to increase HEX. Then it has to find $662 if you take out the $450 million. If you take out the $312 million, that means that the Labor Party now has a policy of net value to the university sector of $1.67 million. But Australian National University, which has chosen not to increase X, or the University of Tasmania, or Charles Sturt University, or Southern Cross University, those universities, for example, will be asking why it is that they, in fact, are subsidising because under the Labor plan they wouldn't get any compensation because they have an increased tax. So if I was Professor Ian Goulter running Charles Sturt University, I'd be saying to myself, why is Professor Gavin Brown at Sydney University going to get $69 million additional money from Labor in government when I at Charles Sturt University are not going to get anything because I've decided not to increase tax at all? The fact is, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the Leader of the Opposition who's not really across the detail of this in any case, but the deputy leader of the opposition in particular has been exposed in seeking to mislead one of two groups in this country. The first is to mislead the universities into believing that they will firstly be compensated for the hex increases they will lose under a Labor government and that those, that money is in fact costed and in the policy. It is not in the policy at all. Or alternatively, the Australian taxpayer is being misled into believing that he or she will not have to find another $662 million and write, out, write another cheque for the university sector because the Labor Party has not adequately funded its policy. If you leave it at that, Mr Speaker, it means that over the next four years under this government, universities would receive $1.8 billion in public funding from this government in addition to the $662 million in additional hex. That is, in fact, $2.46 billion. Under a Labor government, the Labor Party would be delivering $1.67 billion in core funding, assuming it is honest in saying it will compensate these universities, so $1.67 billion. But in addition to that, the Department of Finance and the Federal Minister for Finance and my department have already found, firstly, a $160 million hole in Labor's costings on the basis of a double tax agreement for foreign workers, which is, no longer exists, and secondly, a $218 million deficit in funding any reductions for 14 per cent of students in the sector for uh, hex contributions for science and maths, which brings it down to $1.3 billion. So what that means is, is that under this government, 
in the next four years alone, universities will receive, unless the, unless the Leader of the Opposition in government then announces that he's going to pull another billion dollars out of the taxpayers' checkbook, the universities will receive at least a billion dollars more under this government's policies than they would under those of the Australian Labor Party. The other thing that ought to be remembered and not ever forgotten is that every last dollar of hex, where the students, not as students but as graduates, pay back their 25 per cent, every last dollar of it goes to the university to benefit the education of those students. And the taxpayer pays for about three quarters of it. That university graduates earn on average $622,000 more than those who have not been to university. They have 92 per cent employment within four months of graduation. Their lifetime rate of unemployment is a quarter that of a person who has not been to university. The average hex debt currently carried is $8,500, and 90 per cent owe less than $18,000. And what we're talking about here, on average, if there is an increase of a maximum 25 per cent, is $4,000 paid back through a lifetime through the tax system. And when I hear the Labor Party expressing concern about 300 per cent increases in compulsory upfront TAFE fees in New South Wales, compliments to the Labor cousins at the state government in New South Wales, or 25 per cent increases in TAFE in Victoria, then I might Has take them expired. seriously. I call the honourable member for Brisbane. Well, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, that was a, a particularly subdued performance from the minister, I might say in stark contrast to some of the other performances we've seen from him in this chamber. And I was thinking back to that uh, memorable occasion when he uh, embarked on a tirade referring to uh, the bus and all the people should hop on the bus. I think the only bus the minister was worried about is the bus he thought would take him to the lodge or at least to the deputy leader spot. And the wheels have certainly fell off that bus long ago. But it also made me think, Mr Deputy Speaker, that next time I come here I'm going to have to change the watch I wear, because in Brisbane I have a watch which I take with me when I go to the beach. And it tells me the tide times on the Sunshine Coast, but it also tells me the phases of the moon. And I, I thought if I had that watch with me and I knew when the full moon was out, I'd be able to predict the uh, swings and gyrations of the minister uh, when next we uh, have him here in the chamber taking a Dorothy Dix question um, or an MPI like this. This is a very serious issue. It's a serious issue not just for the hundreds of thousands of students who are affected by it now. It is a serious issue for the future direction of our education system and the wealth of our nation into the future. The people we invest in through our education and training system are the investment we have in our future as a nation. And we should never forget that when we have these debates. And we shouldn't be, as this government is, trying to force the burden increasingly onto the smaller group, invariably resulting in a system where those who are the wealthiest are best placed to take advantage uh, of the opportunities. There are a few simple facts that this government cannot escape. And they're not like the rubbery figures the minister has been indulging in over the course of the last couple of days. Student debt has more than doubled under the Howard government. It's now blown out to more than $10 billion. That is $10 billion ordinary Australians, most of them young people, trying to get on and establish themselves with a family and a career. $10 billion they now owe this government. And that is a massive increase in such a short space of time. Families are being forced to pay an increasing amount of the cost of uh, uh, universities. Student fee charges now make up nearly 40 per cent of university income. Mr Deputy Speaker, when Labor left office in 1996, it was 25 per cent, a figure that has dramatically shifted as this government has placed the burden on ordinary people. And if we take a look at how we're performing against the rest of the world, as we should and as we're urged to, then we find a fairly depressing picture. The OECD report, Education at a Glance 2003, shows just how badly Australia is performing when it comes to investing in our tertiary education system. Australia's public investment in our universities is not just low, Mr Deputy Speaker, by international standards, it's actually going backwards. It's falling while other countries are in fact investing more. We stand out on the international table as one of the few countries investing less now than we did in 1995. Uh, and that uh, is not just a problem for those wishing to go to university now. We will pay a cost for that in the decades to come. 
Between 1995 and 2000, Australia's public investment in our universities declined by about 11 per cent, more than any other country in the OECD. I might say the OECD had an average growth of 21 per cent. That same report shows if you look at the investment in tertiary education, public and private combined in Australia is just 1.6 per cent of our gross domestic product. That is, we are investing less in our tertiary education in Australia than is Canada, than is the United States, dramatically less than even Korea. It's even less than some of the countries that are included in that report that aren't even in the OECD. We invest less in our universities than does Chile or Jamaica. Shine. Jamaica puts more of its GDP into tertiary education than this government does. The other alarming revelation in that report is a comparison of public investment in the tertiary education system compared with the private investment that goes into tertiary education. But of course, private investment takes into account the hex fees. It takes into account the charges ordinary Australians have to face to get a place at university. If you look at public investment, the money from the government, the picture is diabolical. We invest a meagre 0.8 per cent. That is below the OECD average, 0.8 per cent of GDP. That places our government's investment in tertiary education behind Austria, Belgium, Canada, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, Greece, Hungary, Ireland, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, Turkey and the United States. Every one of them puts more public money into universities and tertiary education than this government does, than Australia does. No wonder we have a crisis. No wonder we have a $10 billion debt sitting in the names of ordinary Australians trying to establish themselves as they start a new career. But on the other hand, when you look at private money, that is the bill that we put on the individuals, the private money that goes into tertiary education in Australia um, is now 0.7 per cent. That is more than double the OECD average. What that system does, Mr Deputy Speaker, is ensure that those who are wealthy have the advantage. When the burden is placed on those to pay, as this government is increasingly forcing those wishing to go to university to do, those who are the wealthiest benefit, those who come from a, a, uh, a less wealthy background will find that opportunity less. And nowhere is that more apparent than in Queensland, in my home state, and sadly um, in the universities in Brisbane and in my electorate. As the Courier Mail today reported, and I'm sure all members would have studied the Courier Mail already, but I might, I, might just, I might just refer to the paragraphs in question. Figures released yesterday by the Federal Education Department show that in Queensland next year, the University of Queensland will net 9.2 million in hex increases, increases QUT 7.9 million, Griffith Uni 6.1 million and the University of South Queensland 1.9. Over the four years to 2008, the total extra fees netted by those four universities uh, which have announced their intention to lift fees will be almost 180 million. 180 million extra that students in my electorate and throughout Queensland are going to have to find because of this government's attitude, because of this minister's attitude. A minister who thought that a free or low-cost tertiary system was fine when he was a student, but now that he's a minister, thinks that that's an unworkable, abhorrent system, that somehow our country can't afford to give our children what he received from his parents. Well, I happen to have a different view about the future of our country and where these things should head. I happen to think that we've got an obligation to provide our kids with a better opportunity than that which my parents provided me, and, Minister, the better opportunity than your parents provided you. It's a pity you don't seem to share the same goals and aspirations and happily sit on top of an administration doing the opposite and making it harder for people who came from your sort of background to have the opportunities you were afforded by a Labor government. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we have a minister who not only seem, seems to uh, misunderstand the situation, he's lost, touch, he's lost touch with the debate altogether. Let me say that when you look further at the comparison of uh, Australia and how it measures up around the world, that same OECD report shows that Australia has the second lowest increase in the rate of enrolments in university. This is not something we should be happy about. 
Even before these latest barriers were put in place, Mr Deputy Speaker, those wanting to go to, uh, to university found themselves out on the street. 20,000 qualified Australians miss out on going to university each year. That is an alarming waste of opportunity and talent, not just for the 20,000, but for all of us who would benefit from their skills and contribution. And you see it now reflected. You see this government's approach now reflected in the impact on universities. Between 1996 and 2002, the number of students per teaching staff has blown out by 31 per cent. At some institutions, the increase has been over 50 per cent. And we all know what that means. That means fewer subject offerings. It means uh, fewer tutorials. It means bigger classes. And ultimately, all that means reduced learning opportunities. And this in a country with the opportunity and wealth that we have. The people of Australia understand the opportunity and wealth this country has, and they know they've been betrayed by this government. They know that it's not possible to spend too much money on education. There's no such thing as a population too well educated or trained. And that is why they have embraced Labor's package that the Deputy Leader referred to in her address a little while ago, a package which substantially uh, increases the amount of money going to education and to tertiary education, but does it in a socially responsible way, recognising the realities of Australian uh, uh, social life. Mr Deputy Speaker, I look forward to this debate as the, the weeks ahead unfold. I was at the QUT minister when they made the decision. Order. If you had been there, you would Order. have had an interesting the afternoon. The member's time has expired. The member for Macquarie. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. This motion needs to be seen in the context of Labor's current approach to almost every issue. It fits the same old pattern that is more about politics than it is about policy. For Labor, it doesn't matter about the facts. It doesn't matter whether it's good policy or not. It doesn't matter whether it's affordable or sustainable, so long as it's popular, so long as the rhetoric fits, so long as it gets some attention, then it seems to be acceptable to Labor. A policy, an approach that promises the world and worries later about how to pay for it, an approach that is all too familiar with the Labor Party. Mr Deputy Speaker, the facts are simply these. This government's higher education reform package will deliver $2.6 billion, $2 billion in extra funding for our universities over the next five years, including an extra 34,000 fully funded places. $6.9 billion extra over the next 10 years. That is double, double Labor's much trumpeted Knowledge Nation package. The second point is this, that the rise in HEX is nowhere near as onerous as what Labor is trying to assert. And it's worth pointing out, Mr Deputy Speaker, that it was Labor who first introduced the HEX system, the HEX loan system, because they, in a moment of reality, realised that a system of so-called free university education was in fact unsustainable. They introduced the HEC system and now they rail about an increase, a marginal increase, that is necessary to make that system uh, sustainable, to ensure, uh, ensure its sustainability. Mr Deputy Speaker, overall students will still only be paying a little over a quarter of the cost of their university education. This package means a marginal increase from 26 per cent to 28 per cent of the cost of their university education, remembering that taxpayers, the majority of whom will never have the benefit of a university education, will still be paying for 72 per cent of the cost of that university education. It's worth remembering as well that the threshold, the repayment threshold for those students on their HEX loans have been raised considerably from $24,365 to $35,000 from the 1st of July this year and to $36,814 from next year. And remember as well, Mr Deputy Speaker, that not all universities will be raising the HECS fee. In fact, eight have already said they won't. Another 13 have not yet committed, and I hope that the University of Western Sydney will be one that will not raise fees. And remember as well that courses such as nursing and teaching have been quarantined from any, any rise. So the point is Labor's feigned outrage about the HECS rise uh, really is not supported by the facts. It's a gross exaggeration, great on rhetoric, but very little uh, in terms of substance. Mr Deputy Speaker, the other point that's, that needs to be made is this, that these changes, these modest, 
marginal increases in hex fees are part of an overall package that will vastly improve the versatility, the flexibility and the competition within Australia's higher education sector. They, and furthermore, they have been supported by the Australian Vice-Chancellor's Committee because they know that these changes are necessary if our universities are going to be the sort of institutions that we want them to be. To foolishly attempt to reverse these changes, uh, as Labor wants to do, would, would return the sector to uniformity, to inertia and to mediocrity. Yet that is exactly what the Labor Party is proposing. Coincidentally, Mr Deputy Speaker, last week I met with two representatives of the Australian Vice-Chancellor's Committee, and those representatives said clearly to me that they support these changes. They said we cannot afford for the tertiary education sector, for higher education, uh, to, revert, uh, to, to revert to what Labor wants to overturn these changes. The vice-chancellors themselves are saying that these changes are necessary. The, the benefits, in fact, uh, the benefits of uh, these education changes of the overall package, including these hex fees rise, uh, rises, were summed up uh, in an article, an excellent editorial in the Weekend Australian of 20th of September last year, that I've referred to before in this place. I'll just read from that editorial: "The higher education reforms before Parliament give Australia's best universities the chance they need to grow into world-class teaching and research institutions." By ending the existing funding straitjacket, which rewards all institutions at the same rate regardless of the quality of their teaching, the Howard government's plan provides the incentive for our best universities to compete both against each other and internationally, and academic competition will breed intellectual excellence. This was the editorial in The Australian. Yet Labor wants to return our universities to that straitjacket which will confine them to mediocrity and uniformity. Mr Deputy Speaker, Labor wants to stand in the way of the progress which our universities need, which would help them to develop into centres of excellence in teaching and research and which would make them truly internationally competitive. Two other points are worth making here. If Labor was really, seriously, was really serious about the cost of education, we would see them publicly doing two things. We would see Labor, first of all, publicly criticising the New South Wales government for its outrageous, outrageous upfront rise in TAFE fees by 250 to 300 per cent, not supported by any HEC system, upfront cash rises uh, in the payment uh, in the amount of fees that our students need to pay. Yet what have we heard from Labor on this? We've heard nothing. We've, seen abs we've heard absolute silence. The second point is, if Labor were serious about, about addressing the financial position of our universities, we would hear them saying something about the outrageous payroll tax burden that our universities incur at the hands of our state governments. In New South Wales, for instance, the New South Wales government places an annual burden of $97 billion on our universities. And what do we hear from the other side about that $97 billion cost just on our New South Wales universities? Deafening silence. We hear not a thing from them. The University of Western Sydney last year was slugged by nine a slug $9.7 million, $9.7 million, around 5 per cent of their total revenue, in payroll tax to the state government. Yet what have we heard from the Labor Party? Not a thing. If Labor were serious, if Labor were serious about the financial position of our universities, we would hear them publicly decrying state Labor's uh, tax assault on uh, uh, hex assault, sorry, upfront fee assault on our on our TAFE students, and we would hear them decrying Labor's tax slug through the payroll tax system on our universities. The other point that's worth pointing out, that's worth making here, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is that we've already had some hints from federal Labor. In fact, more than hints, we've had a commitment from federal Labor of their intention to introduce a national payroll tax system. A national payroll tax system. What is that going to mean for our universities again? So, on top of the state payroll tax that hits our universities, we will again have a further impost uh, by way of federal Labor's, uh, federal Labor's national payroll tax. So the point is, Mr Deputy Speaker, that we really need to take with a grain of salt what we're hearing from the other side uh, as cheap political rhetoric and cheap hypocrisy until we hear them publicly criticise their Labor colleagues in New South Wales for their assault on our students uh, in our TAFE system and for their assault on the universities in New South Wales. 
The other point that needs to be made is this. If Labor is going to wind back, if Labor is talking about rolling back these hex charges, we need to ask where is the money coming from. We've already heard the minister point to $662 million over the next four years that our universities will receive in benefit from these hex fees. If Labor is going to reject this $662 million, where will the money come from? What other taxes will they raise? What new taxes will Labor introduce to make up for this almost $700 million shortfall? Will it be on the same old never-never, the same old Labor credit card, Labor same old magic pudding? This is yet another example of Labor's approach. Promise the world, promise what appears to be popular and worry later about how to pay for it. The fact is there is a bottom line. Labor likes to pretend that there's not, but there is a bottom line. Its promises need to be funded and we've heard nothing about how they're going to fund them. Mr Deputy Speaker, this motion is more of Labor's myopia and hypocrisy. It's another of their unaffordable promise. It's another of the populist efforts which can never substitute for costed, affordable, sustainable policies that we have from this government. The member for New England. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm pleased to be able to speak on this uh, matter of public importance in relation to the cost of education. And there's been a number of issues raised here today, but I'd like to uh, uh, raise the issue, particularly with the, the minister in the chair, uh, Brendan Nelson, in relation to uh, the goods and services tax on textbooks being uh, reinstated. I just listened with great interest to the member for Macquarie, and he quite rightly said uh, and condemned the New South Wales State Government uh, for imposing a payroll tax on some of the educational arrangements within New South Wales. And I couldn't agree more. I think it's an absolute disgrace that a government is actually moving in that way to tax education. It's a, it's a burden that our students shouldn't be asked to, uh, to take in relation to uh, uh, their education, and neither should the, the families. But I also think it applies to the federal government. I think the, the federal government really does need to re-examine its position in terms of reimposing the goods and services tax on textbooks for our students. We've spent a lot of time, and to his credit, the minister has spent quite a lot of time talking about the sorts of things that we're doing for our younger people, trying to encourage them in relation to extending their education. The leader of the opposition has spent a lot of time talking about education as being a priority in terms of our young people. The Prime Minister has spent a lot of time talking about our young people, and in fact it's become a major issue at the next election. And I was very distressed to hear that the government uh, is going to go ahead with the reintroduction of full goods and services tax on textbooks for students. Uh, for those members who aren't aware, that the <coughs> when the goods and services tax arrangements were made, a, a deal was done with the Democrats to exempt uh, the uh, goods and services tax from textbooks for very good reasons, uh, so that uh, the cost wouldn't be passed on to students uh, in, in that sense and make uh, education a, a more expensive avenue and actually put in, we were putting in place a disincentive for those students to continue their education. <clears throat> and I think the circumstances that were around at that time are around now. But I'm led to believe, and I don't think it's a fait accompli, and I would hope that the minister and the prime minister would reverse this. I'm led to believe that the government is looking at reimposing a full 10% goods and services tax on textbooks for students at universities, TAFEs, and uh, and schools. Obviously, that will mean an increase in the price of education. It's not an increase that can be borne in terms of the hex arrangements that can be paid at a later date when an income flow is coming to those particular students. <coughs> it's an upfront cost and it is a cost that should not be there. Uh, I have two, students, uh, two uh, children at university at the moment. I'm aware of the costs of keeping children at university, particularly country universities where they're away from home and you've got the additional accommodation expenses, etc., and the uh, vehicle expenses and all those sorts of things that accrue to parents. <coughs> But I do not believe that this scheme should be uh, 
reintroduced so that they, our students will be disadvantaged. I'm aware that the uh, member of the Democrats uh, in the Senate, uh, Natasha Stott-Despoir, introduced a private member's bill, which hasn't had uh, success in the House so far. But I would ask the Leader of the Opposition and the Labor members in the chamber to consider their position in relation to this. This isn't an issue that should be allowed just to go away because of some old feelings in terms of the Labor Party and the Democrats and the agreement in relation to the, the goods and services tax arrangements. It's something that should be addressed by this parliament, and I ask the minister uh, to consider uh, reassessing the government's position on this. If the government isn't prepared to reassess its position, I would ask the opposition to look seriously at putting in place the appropriate legislation uh, to uh, uh, reverse this decision. If we're serious about uh, trying to encourage our young people to be educated, we, sh we shouldn't use the vehicles of education as a source of revenue for the taxation coffers, particularly at a time that we're entering now where the government, uh, through what it says is good management, and I don't disagree with its economic credentials in relation to that, we've had a massive surplus and here we have uh, a chance where we could have passed on some uh, advantages to people, to our younger people in relation to uh, uh, goods and services exemption, goods and services tax exemption. And I call upon the minister and the opposition to look very seriously at this issue. On the broader level, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I see a number of things starting to be unfolded in terms of goods and services legislation. And, uh, uh, there's two issues that I may raise uh, that uh, I think uh, uh, parallel the textbook subsidy issue of goods and services taxation. The fuel sales grant scheme, for instance, was brought in uh, in the year 2001 to compensate country motorists for the inequitous effect of the application of the goods and services tax to regional people because of the differences in relation to the price of petrol at the Bowser. And uh, two months ago, the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, the supposed champion of regional Australia uh, in his own uh, lifetime, uh, would announce that he would be removing the fuel sales grant scheme and in doing so would impose two to three cents a litre more in terms of uh, the price of fuel at the Bowser to country motorists. So there's a gradual unfolding of some of the commitments that were given at the time of the goods and services taxation arrangements. The other issue that I would range, uh, raise very briefly, if I could, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, concerning this particular issue. At that particular time, just prior to an election, there was great outrage by the building industry, from the building industry about the application of the GST to the building industry. The industry said that 10 per cent GST would have a, an enormous impact on employment and the, the profitability of that particular industry. So the government reacted and put in place a first home owner scheme and uh, the states came along as well. Uh, my information is that since then, and I think it was 2001, <coughs> there's been something like a subsidy to the building industry of around $4.3 billion. Now, it's OK to allow that sort of thing to be going ahead, and I'm not saying that's not bad policy. Well, I don't think it's terribly good policy, but, uh, but we're going to allow that to be continued and remove a similar benefit for our students. $4.3 billion to the building industry to encourage people to build homes. There's no doubt that that's had an impact uh, on the property boom. There's no doubt, and in fact the Reserve Bank has been quite upfront in saying that it's had to enter the financial uh, markets to dampen down the property boom and has used uh, interest rate policy to do so. And the rest of the population is actually paying for that. So I'd, I think it's a little bit hypocritical of the government to maintain the first home owner scheme and then remove a, a very critical assistance to our students, that of the uh, textbook subsidy arrangements that were put in place when the goods and services tax came in. So I would ask the, uh, the minister once again 
consider the students that we're talking about, if you're serious about the sorts of things you've been talking about in this House, if both sides of this parliament are serious about our young people and making it easier for them to learn, not using them as a source of taxation revenue into the future, this uh, subsidy, as it's called, uh, should be uh, reimposed so that our kids get a fair go. Order. The discussion has concluded. The member for Latrobe. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I ask leave of the House to present executive minutes on reports of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit. Is there any objection to leave being granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. The uh, member for Latrobe. I present uh, the executive minutes on reports number 390, 393, 394 and 396 of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit. And I ask leave of the House to make a short statement in connection with the minutes. Is any objection to leave being granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Mr. Deputy, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. On behalf of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit, I present executive minutes for four of the committee's reports, namely 390, 393, 394 and 396. The first three of these, report number 390, uh, reviewed Auditor General's reports for the first three quarters of 2001-2002. The report examined four performance audits of the Auditor General concerning the administration of taxation rulings, Commonwealth and state property taxes, uh, sales, administration of the Federation Fund program, and the management of security clearances. I might add as an aside that the committee has taken an ongoing interest in the management of security clearances by the Commonwealth, including post-budget report briefings and ongoing correspondence with the Attorney General. The second report, number 393, was a review of the Auditor General's report for the fourth quarter of 2001-2002. Report also examined four performance audits of the Auditor General. Those audits focused on corporate governance in the ABC, research project management in CSIRO, the management framework for preventing unlawful entry into Australian territory, and finally, the management of the DAS fleet sale and tied contract. The third JCPA report, at number 394, reviewed Australia's quarantine function. Uh, the report mainly reviewed three broad areas, the parameters within which Australia must operate as a member of the World Trade Organization, Australia's quarantine operations at the borders and quarantine preparedness generally, and finally, quarantine public education programs. The fourth JCPA report, entitled number 396, a reviewed Auditor General's report for the first three quarters of 2002-03. Report 396 examined 10 performance audits of the Auditor General. Subject coverage ranged from facilities management at HMAS Cerebus to client services in the Child Support Agency, to physical security uh, arrangements in Commonwealth Agency. The executive minutes to these four committee reports respond to a total of 32 recommendations. I am pleased to say that the vast majority of these recommendations have been accepted by the government. Only two of the committee's recommendations were rejected outright and another was superseded by events, namely the announced abolition of ATSIC. I note with satisfaction the high rate of support for the committee's recommendations as indicated in these executive minutes. This is especially so as the committee is not shirked from hard-hitting recommendations if warranted by the evidence. Sometimes acceptance of such recommendation has concurred a significant cost to the Commonwealth. Mr. Deputy Speaker, as a final comment, I'm pleased to advise that the Departments of Finance and Administration and Prime Minister and Cabinet have modified and codified the arrangements by which the Executive responds to JCPAA recommendations. I hope the new procedures will facilitate speedy responses to uh, committee's recommendations. The committee continues to monitor the implementation of its recommendation and has not hesitated to seek further information if it believes that an executive minute has lacked sufficient detail. The tabling of executive minutes remains an important accountability mechanism, both for the committee and the parliament as a whole. The committee looks forward to making future reports to the parliament on the responses uh, to more recent reports. 
Clark. Government business, order of the day number one. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission Amendment Bill 2004. Resumption of debate on the second reading. Order. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. The member for Fraser. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Formally, this bill before us gives effect to the government's decision to abolish the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission. In practice, it does much more. It gives effect to the Prime Minister's long-held desire to dismantle every means available to Indigenous Australians to participate in decisions about their future. It's not surprising that this bill has been introduced in this an election year. With an eye to the polls, the Prime Minister has again embraced the politics of community division in pursuit of electoral gain. But I have to tell you and make it very clear that the Labor Party won't be complicit in this attempt to divide our nation against itself. Today, the caucus of the Parliamentary Labor Party has determined that we shouldn't allow this bill to pass until it's had very careful consideration of all its provisions. For this reason, the Labor will be moving in the Senate to refer the bill to a committee for inquiry and report. That's a proposition of significant interest to me because I chaired the last Senate committee that looked into similar matters. When I was a senator uh, on the back bench in 1988-89, we conducted a major select committee inquiry into the then ATSIC legislation uh, and into the propositions that underpinned it. And one of the things that was noteworthy then, and is an interesting contrast with the circumstance we find ourselves now in, is the extent of the consultation. There was a massive consultation exercise undertaken by the then Minister uh, Jerry Hand and a very comprehensive consultation in conducted by the committee. In fact, the Liberal Party and National Party members of the committee complained that the original consultation by the minister hadn't been sufficient. I wonder what those people, at least one of whom remains in the parliament to this day, uh, is going to say about the fact there's been absolutely no consultation about this proposition. I suspect they'll say nothing. And that committee in its review and in its report looked at the three key principles that underpin the move towards ATSIC. They were the consolidation of a number of Indigenous organisations into one major body, but more importantly, the development of a representative national structure and a representative regional structure. That committee concluded then, and I remain of the view today, that it was the regional councils that were the key to Indigenous representation and to then ATSIC, and in my view, they remain the key to any effective form of Indigenous representation and effective participation in decisions affecting the life of Indigenous people all around Australia, but particularly in the Indigenous communities in the remoter areas of Australia, particularly in the north of Australia. So in sending this matter to a Senate committee, we'll ensure that Indigenous Australians at least get some chance to do what the government has de denied them, to have a voice in the debate about their future. This debate will be conducted, if the government has its way, exclusively within the chambers of this parliament. We want to take it out to the people and particularly we want to give an opportunity to Indigenous Australians to have a say. Amongst other things, Mr Deputy Speaker, this bill abolishes the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission as it now stands. And let me restate clearly and unambiguously that the Labor Party does support the abolition of ATSIC. We do so for the reasons outlined in the framework statement released by the Leader of the Opposition and the Shadow Minister for Indigenous Affairs on the 30th of March this year. We believe that ATSIC as it's currently constituted, doesn't have the capacity to do the things we need it to do effectively to serve the interests of Indigenous Australians. But unlike the Prime Minister and some, but I'm certain not all, of members on the other side of the House, we don't hold that view with any glee. We understand that for many Indigenous Australians, ATSIC represents the only form of self-determination available to them. Indigenous Australians haven't had access to power or the capacity to influence decisions that affect their lives. 
It's true that a growing number of talented Indigenous MPs uh, have been elected to state parliaments, serving the Labor interest, and in particular in the Northern Territory, two very fine Indigenous ministers serve in the Martin Labor government, as previously an Indigenous minister served in the West Australian Labor government. But just one Indigenous Australian sits in this parliament. If the, parliament, if the debate is confined to this parliament, one Indigenous Australian will get a chance to have a say. No Indigenous Australians sit in this House, and that's a source of great shame to me as a member of the Labor Party. We've, no, we've never elected an Indigenous member to the federal parliament. We're doing better and better in state parliaments, and that's a source of satisfaction, though it's still a long way to go. But uh, it is a failure by the Labor Party for which we, which we need to redress and redress quickly. But it's pointless coming in here and looking at the criticisms and many valid criticisms of ATSIC without acknowledging the emotional attachment many Indigenous Australians felt for and in many cases still feel for ATSIC. So that has to be put on the record as we also acknowledge that many Indigenous Australians, sometimes the same people who felt that emotional attachment, feel let down in particular by the suspended chair of ATSIC and by, what's, by the dysfunctional behaviour of the elected representatives in recent times. In 1988-89, we looked to and set down the development of ATSIC as a challenge to Indigenous leadership. I think in recent years, the Indigenous leadership has failed that challenge. Not all of them. Many members of the current board have worked very hard, both locally and nationally, seeking to put forward a decent alternative voice. But collectively, they have failed that challenge. Over the years, that's not always been so. Many of the elected commissioners, including some currently serving, have served very well representing their local area and taking responsibility for specific areas uh, of activity. Many of the female members have been active in raising the issue of violence in Indigenous communities that needed to be raised. Previous chairs, uh, Lois O'Donoghue and Mr Jakura, uh, and many commissioners past and present have done a fine job, but it, we cannot walk away from the fact that many Indigenous people are entitled to and do feel let down by the leadership of ATSIC and particularly by the currently suspended ATSIC chair. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, the bill does much more than just abolish the board of ATSIC on the 1st of July this year and the ATSIC Regional Councils on the 1st of July next year. It goes far beyond that. Although the life of regional councils is extended for a single year, the Minister for Indigenous Affairs is vested by this legislation with new power with respect to the operations of the council, including the approval of staff engagements and the convening of meetings. Apart from a general vesting of much of the power previously vested in ATSIC in the hands of the Minister for Indigenous Affairs and or her delegate, the bill makes a number of significant amendments to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Commission Act. The government characterises these amendments as consequential, but they're not necessarily consequential. They are in fact consequential only to the government's radical Indigenous Affairs agenda. The bill provides for the wholesale transfer of ATSIC's assets to the Commonwealth with implicit protection for the Indigenous estate counting for little. I know the member for Lingiari, who will speak later in this debate, has specific concern about some of the assets held by ATSIC in his constituency in trust for local communities. Now, those assets are no longer going to be held if this legislation is taken at its face value, and we want in the committee to pursue if this is going to be the case, but it appears to be the case. Those assets are no longer held in trust for the Indigenous community. They are now the property of the Commonwealth. And many of those assets have been building and accumulating in value far beyond any original Commonwealth contribution. And we want to be very sure that we've examined whether there is any potential for those assets previously held in, currently held in trust, but should this legislation be passed, transferring to the Commonwealth, for that trust to be breached. For example, is it within the power of the Commonwealth 
to sell those assets, as this government has been wont to do with anything that isn't nailed down. A uh, shopping centre in uh, uh, Alice Springs that the member for Lingiari spoke to me about, uh, and many others that I think we need to examine very closely. So I think there are some very serious problems here that need to be fully examined, and at the moment I'm particularly concerned about the provisions of the bill as it relates to that matter. The bill proposes significant changes to two key portfolio agencies, Indigenous Business Australia and the Indigenous Land Corporation, and they're both very important. Indigenous Business Australia is being asked to assume responsibility for a new Indigenous housing fund and the administra administration of the successor to the ATSIC home loan program. Now, I'm not sure that, that Indigenous Business Australia is the right place for those funds, uh, and I'm not sure that those funds will, in, in administering those funds, that will enhance the activities and very successful role of Indigenous Business Australia. That is fundamentally a commercial agency. And the Indigenous Housing Fund and the Home Loan Program have quite different drivers. They require quite different administrative approach. I am seriously concerned that without some enhancement of the resources of Indigenous Business Australia to allow it to develop a second stream of administration to deal with uh, the Housing Fund and the Home Loan Program that we'll see both the Housing Fund and Indigenous Business Australia adversely affected by this awkward marriage. I've previously discussed with Indigenous Business Australia the idea that they might have taken over the small business activities of ATSIC. This is long before there was consideration of its abolition. And I think that was a possible proposition, but it would have needed a separate stream of administration kept separate from the fundamentally commercial investment role of Indigenous Business Australia, and this doesn't seem to me to have been properly addressed in the legislation as it stands. Alongside this new function, it's proposed that, once again, the Minister for Indigenous Affairs will be given new powers, the power to issue written directions to Indigenous Business Australia. The bill provides for the Indigenous Land Corporation to assume responsibility for money held in the Regional Land Fund and extends its power, including the power to make payments to Indigenous Business Australia. So that's an issue we'll want to look at because the consequences for the Indigenous Land Corporation uh, are very significant. We need to make sure that this doesn't impact on its capacity to undertake its fundamental task that was developed as part of the native title package. Among the most significant of the proposals is the expansion of the role of the Office of Evaluation and Audit. Under the terms of the bill, the Office would have a mandate to undertake evaluation and audits of Indigenous programs across departments and agencies. Additionally, its power would extend to the investigation of individuals and organisations that have received funding under an Indigenous program with little apparent restriction on the scope of its activities. Now, the question of enhanced accountability is not something about which I directly have concern, but when we're looking at setting up a structure to replace ATSIC, and that's what's wrong with this bill, it talks about what it's not going to do, but it doesn't talk about what it is going to do. It doesn't talk about seizing this new opportunity to do something positive for Indigenous Australians to lead us to a, a better way, a, more, a, a better way of implementing the principles that give Indigenous people more effective say in, through a more effective agency than ATSIC. It's all about taking opportunities away, about taking responsibility away, about taking the chance to participate away, and in this instance, missing the opportunity to give enhanced accountability to Indigenous people themselves. It's not that I object to what the Office of Evaluation and Audit is proposed to do, although I want to have, I think the committee should have a long, a long hard look at that, but in principle, there's nothing wrong with that. But one of the things that an elected representative Indigenous body that replaces ATSIC, and under this bill there will be no such thing, but there should be, should look at, is how do we ensure that those agencies spending public money to serve the interests of Indigenous people, to provide services to them, are accountable, of course, in a continuing way to the parliament and through them to the Australian people, but also to Indigenous people. So we get questions asked to those agencies by the elected representatives about whether services have been effectively delivered, for example, in the communities that those elected people represent, 
and over the years we build up a body of responsiveness by agencies to those elected Indigenous representatives through a proper process of accountability. That's one of the functions that should have been put in place by this legislation to replace ATSIC and which has not been done. In a little remark change, the government is also determined to abolish the Office of Torres Strait Islander Affairs and the Torres Strait Islander Advisory Board. In one fell swoop, the government is sweeping away key organisations concerned with Torres Strait Islander interests on the mainland, which is in fact the place where most Torres Strait Islanders live. We will still have representative bodies in the Torres Strait, but Torres Strait Islanders on the mainland, which is where the majority of Torres Strait Islanders live, will no longer have any of those agencies that ensure that their interests are reflected in the decision-making processes. Torres Strait Islanders have been very badly treated by this piece of legislation. This is not a simple legislative proposal. The bill amends 12 acts in total. In addition to the ATSIC Act, it, do, it deals with some Indigenous specific things like the Land Rights Northern Territory Act, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage, Heritage Protection Act, and as I'll mention in a moment, makes changes to a number of other important bills. As an example of the scope of the bill, for example, just as one example, uh, and a demonstration of which the deal with which the, the zeal with which the government has chosen to pursue the elimination of Indigenous participation in decision making, let me just have a look at some of the consequences of these amendments. The proposed amendments to uh, IATSIS, the Aboriginal Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, uh, that act is amended to remove the requirement for the Minister for Indigenous Affairs to consult with any Torres Strait Islander organisation prior to the appointment of a Torres Strait Islander to the board of the Institute. Why? Why is the government doing that? What's the point? What's the purpose? What's achieved by that change other than taking away some effective opportunity for people to participate and express a view. The proposed amendment to the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act removes the requirement for the Minister for the Environment to inform any Indigenous representative organisation of a proposal received under the Act and the requirement for that Minister to invite comment on that proposal. Now, that's just not a bureaucratic change. That's a change of profound significance affecting the capacity of Indigenous people to have their views reflected in decisions made under the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, which has been a very fundamental right. Now, I think that's a poor act, and the, the protection of Indigenous heritage has been poorly pursued by this government. It had opportunities to do better and failed. But this is one aspect where Indigenous representatives get some, and through them Indigenous people, get a chance to have their views heard and reflected in a bill that's important to them and it's being taken away. Now why? What's the case for that? What is the government's rationale for that mean-spirited action? The proposed amendment to the National Health and Medical Research Council Act of 1992 removes a requirement for a nominee of an Indigenous representative organisation to sit on the National Health and Medical Research Council. Now, there's no group of Australians whose health, with lower health outcomes than Indigenous Australians, and yet we are re reducing the pressure to ensure that their views are re reflected in health and medical research decisions in this country. And the I wonder why, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, we have a proposed amendment to the Native Title Act which gives the Secretary of the Attorney-General's Department the new power to determine grants to Native Title representative bodies. There is an inquiry being done by a joint committee of the Parliament to look into the funding and responsibilities of Native Title representative bodies, but I'll be very surprised if giving power to the Secretary of the Attorney-General's Department is one of the propositions that's likely to be reflected in, as a result of the considerations of that committee. This bill was only tabled last Thursday. So we're seeing this bill rushed on for debate. It's afforded the Labor Party very little time to consider its response. It's fascinating that the government would do this. After its criticism of the Labor Party in 1989, for the inadequacy of the 
consultation which was undertaken when 50 Indigenous communities were visited, hundreds of meetings were held both by the uh, uh, Minister and then by the Committee, and uh, the Liberal Party thought there hadn't been enough consultation. But here we have a bill tabled last Thursday uh, with no prior consultation and brought on for debate today. Uh, and the government will be rushing it through this House, and if they had the numbers, they would rush it through the Senate as well. There may be other important consequences beyond those which I have outlined that would arise from the passage of the legislation. The truth of it is none of us yet know. The government does not know. Certainly the government backbench does not know. They have not had the opportunity to consider it. And Indigenous Australians do not know. This bill has been rushed into the House being rushed on for debate and we, we as an opposition will not accede, accede to its hasty passage. One of the other consequences and causes of concern is the secrecy surrounding how the government is going to implement its proposed mainstreaming of ind Indigenous programs. The, that secrecy reached absurd heights last week, Mr Deputy Speaker, when the government refused to reveal details of the administration of Indigenous programs by mainstream departments and agencies. On the 15th of April, the Prime Minister and the Minister announced that the government would abolish ATSIC and mainstream all the programs. On the 28th of April, the head of the government's executive agency, uh, Mr Wayne Gibbons, issued an internal memo to staff allocating programs beginning on 1 July 2004. Two days later, on 30 April, the Minister for Citizenship, acting as the Minister for Indigenous Affairs, issued a media statement which purported to show the final allocation. On the 11th of May, the budget provided for the transfer of ATSIC and ATSIS assets and appropriations for 2005 and subsequent years to the Department of Immigration, Multicultural and Indigenous Affairs as a so-called interim measure, pending a decision of the Prime Minister on final program allocation. But last week, the Shadow Minister for Indigenous Affairs, Senator O'Brien, sought to examine the government's plans through the Senate estimates process, an obvious thing which would, you'd always expect to happen. But regrettably, the, government, the government's failure to make Major O'Kane available to the parliament is not the only abuse of accountability we've witnessed during this estimates round. Last Thursday, the Department of Immigration and Multicultural and Indigenous Affairs acting under direction from its senior minister, refused to tell the parliament how any Commonwealth program will be managed after the 1st of July. Less than five weeks from the end of the financial year, no details were forthcoming on the future of dozens of Indigenous programs worth hundreds of millions of dollars. The Howard government refused to tell the parliament where Indigenous employment, Indigenous legal services, sport, family violence, women's issues, native title, heritage and broadcasting programs would transfer at the beginning of the financial year. Now we're into the last month of this financial year, we're into June, and the government still refuses to reveal these details. Thousands of staff and hundreds of thousands of Indigenous Australians are subject to unnecessary and continuing uncertainty by the Howard government's confusion or failure to make up its mind or its secrecy in refusing to disclose what decisions it's made. My colleague Senator O'Brien made the observation that on the day the government introduced its ATSIC legislation into this House last Thursday, it conclusively demonstrated its disregard for the principles of good governance and the requirement to account to the people it serves, particularly Indigenous Australians. I couldn't agree more. But not only has the government refused to explain how these programs will be managed, it's failed to outline its argument for the way in which it's going about mainstreaming these issues. In every sense, the wholesale mainstreaming of Indigenous programs represents the apex of the government's failing practical reconciliation agenda. And that's an agenda which has failed every objective test. Late last year, the Australian National University's respected Centre for Aboriginal Economic Policy Research, one of the leading, if not the leading, Indigenous research organisation in this area, published a damning assessment of the government's performance as part of a survey of reconciliation for the period 1991 to 2001. CAPER, the centre, found that even using the government's own measure, 
there was less practical reconciliation in socio-economic terms in 2001 than in 1996. On almost all counts, Indigenous Australia went backwards during the first five years of this government's life. Areas of improvement evident in the period 91 to 96 had been eroded in the period 96 to 2001. Alternatively, the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Social Justice Commissioner has made a starkly similar assessment of the government's performance in Indigenous affairs. His latest social justice report reveals the devastating reality. During the period in which the current Prime Minister has occupied that high office, the life expectancy of Indigenous women in this country has declined, while the gap between life expectancy of Indigenous and non-Indigenous women has grown. And while life expectancy for Indigenous men has increased marginally, to just 56.3 years, I might point out, the gap between life expectancy for Indigenous and non-Indigenous men has also grown. We are, in terms of that fundamental measure of social justice, the gap in life expectancy and the trend in the narrowing or otherwise of that gap, our performance is the worst in the Western world and getting worse. The, if you make the comparison with the, the three countries with similar history and experience and current uh, economic circumstances, the United States, Canada, New Zealand, compared to Australia, our performance in, in that fundamental measure is far worse than those three and the trend in those countries is for improvement. The trend in this country is deterioration over the last five years. That's what practical reconciliation has delivered to Indigenous Australians. In moving for an inquiry into this bill and looking and into related matters, the Labor Party is hoping that we're going to get a greater understanding of the government's plans for the mainstreaming of Indigenous programs. We hope that they'll be exposed, that the plans hitherto hidden from the Parliament and Indigenous Australians will be revealed. The Labor Party has been outlining an alternative approach to Indigenous affairs, not confined by the narrow ideological view that shackles current government policy. A future Latham Labor government will give Indigenous Australians the opportunity to take responsibility for key decisions on Indigenous program development. We are committed to reaffirm and strengthen the right of Indigenous Australians to inform and shape national policy and to have elected representatives reflect their view in terms of advocacy, in terms of advice and in terms of accountability. And we'll work with Indigenous Australians to develop these arrangements. We won't be rushing bills into the parliament before Indigenous people have had a chance to be consulted about what's in them and what should be in them. Labor will also work in partnership with the states and territories and the community and private sector to get better coordination of funding and services and to ad that address endemic Indigenous disadvantage. It's very important that we harness the energy, commitment and expertise resident in local communities. The Indigenous people and the non-Indigenous people in those communities applying those resources to solve local problems. That's why a Labor government will transfer responsibility for Indigenous program development and delivery to the regions with appropriate support from government. Efforts by Indigenous communities to take greater responsibility for addressing in endemic problems will be central to the success of Labor's plan. That's why we'll create new regional Indigenous bodies to make key decisions about local programs and maintain Indigenous specific programs. During the development of the ATSIC bill, the government's ignored two key findings of the Commonwealth Grants Commission, uh, which are very important and shouldn't have been ignored. One is that mainstream services don't meet the needs of Indigenous people to the same extent as they meet the needs of non-Indigenous people. And secondly, that the effectiveness of those programs is significantly enhanced by Indigenous control of or strong influence over service delivery. More interestingly, the, the Menzies Research Centre, under the cover of a media statement from the Liberal candidate, Mr Malcolm Turnbull, has said that has recommended the creation of new invigorated governance structures and regional development for Indigenous Australians. And the Menzies Centre's got it right and the government's got it wrong. So, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, before I conclude, I want to make sure that I've moved the amendment which is being circulated in my name. I won't read it, but it's been circulated and I move that. And I conclude by saying that it's very important 
that we deal with this bill in a serious way, that we don't rush hastily to do it. The government spent $1.4 million reviewing ATSIC and then ignored the outcome. We don't want another circumstance where the Indigenous voice is not heard, where this parliament makes decisions that ignores and fails to reflect the interests of Indigenous Australians. If this government won't do it after the next election, a new Labor government will. I move the amendment circulated in my name. Is the amendment seconded? Seconded. The member for Lingari. The original question was that this bill be now read a second time. To this, the honourable member for Fraser has moved as an amendment that all words after that be amended with a view to substituting other words. The question now is that the words proposed to be amended stand part of the question. I call the honourable member for O'Connor. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. This is an issue of which I have demonstrated over a very long time a practical interest in addressing problems that are fundamental to an administration designed in Canberra and, of course, that is not the place in the Australian mainland where there are major difficulties for Indigenous people. Those difficulties get worse the further you get away from Canberra and, in fact, and in response to the constant repetition coming uh, from the member for Fraser, the further you get away from so-called regional centres. Regionalism is not an answer to the problems of Aboriginal people any more than centralism. This is an issue that must be addressed at the local level, and whilst it became absolutely imperative that this government act and mainstreaming was the only short-term solution to the circumstances that existed within ATSIC, something recognised by the Leader of the Opposition, there is a need that I would like to support for further progress to treat the decisions covered in this bill as work in progress so that Australia can achieve a, an outcome for Aboriginal people uh, that includes both their things, and I'd like a copy of the amendment, please, um, that uh, in fact include the opportunity for Aboriginal people, yes, at the local level, to decide what the needs are specific uh, to their particular locality, and b, to ensure that a process of prudential management exists that ensures that all sectors of that community can benefit and that, of course, they cannot be held accountable under the law for any failings uh, that they might otherwise make if that prudential ma uh, management wasn't there. Now, they're fairly simple issues. It was interesting to hear the member for Fraser bemoan the life expectancy issue, which is primarily one arising from Aboriginal health issues. But of course, going back to the Labor government, we had the Aboriginal Medical Service. And that's just the point. The system that was implemented by Labor to deliver for Indigenous people has failed on the fundamental tests. And whilst the member for Fraser was more than brief in addressing Labor's issues, and I find the amendment is one of those typical amendments that doesn't say anything about what Labor would do. It's all about condemning the government for this, that and something else, ABC. In other words, the opportunity for the member for Fraser with 30 minutes of speaking time to put down a workable alternative was lost. It was criticism. We are going to have a Senate inquiry. Notwithstanding one of the reasons that this legislation is before the House was an inquiry conducted independent of politics by, I might add, a couple of recognised ex-politicians, the Hannaford inquiry, 
has been out there talking to Indigenous people for what was probably a couple of years, and included in that board was retired Senator Bob Collins, a man whom anyone would say is not only highly experienced but highly committed to the Aboriginal cause in both his philosophical, political and personal arrangements. And those people have reported to the parliament. And we are interested, of course, in the submissions put to them. And what were they fundamentally? That the Aboriginal people of more remote areas were fed up with the system. They were fed up with being asked to put thousands of dollars into submissions to so that they could buy a dialysis machine for their own community, where the diseases, kidney diseases and other were a severe problem. They were fed up with nepotism, where that was obvious, and they were the ones who missed out. But worse, the member for Fraser is concerned about the thousands of staff. It has always been my view, sir, that that's the big problem, that throughout Australia, the monies provided by our taxpayer has been used to employ people, many of whom, from my personal knowledge, had quite good employment at various levels throughout the general Australian society and made the shift over and got another job, but in the process did very little for those where alcoholism where drug and petrol sniffing abuse, substance abuse, I guess is the word, where isolation, where poor hygiene, where loss of hope, where they're frequently isolated in so-called communities where there is no opportunity for employment. All of those issues have not been addressed by the very people who are on the payroll. And of course, the government had to act again in a throwaway line. The leader of the opposition announced that he was going to do it if he got elected. Now that the government has thrown the Labor Party the challenge, they're not really sure. And the best they can do by putting an amendment to this legislation, not in the time available, and with the advice of the Hannaford Committee and obvious, their obvious reading thereof, have they come up with any form of, um, uh, of alternative? No. Three things all starting, three amendments starting with failing to, failing to, failing to. Condemns the government for. Now that's great, isn't it? We've got people with the lowest life expectancy, as the member for Fraser says, in the world, and he gave us a few words that meant nothing in specifics as to how the Labor Party would address this issue. Well, I can't yet speak entirely for the government other than to say I am confident that this initiative is both necessary and work in progress. But a number of people on this side of the House quite a large number, thought it not a bad idea to put a submission to the Hannaford Inquiry and did so openly. And When asked could it go on the inquiry website, answered immediately yes. We were not frightened to be identified. We were not frightened to be attacked by a media who have about the same knowledge of the problem as most members of the Labor Party, and that's nil. The reality was that we argued and did so for some years for a reversal of the process of funding for Aboriginal people and, of course, that we refer to as bottoms-up funding. Instead of having a large amount of money that's creamed off at every level, legitimately and unfortunately occasionally illegitimately, dishonestly, have the money out there on the ground and empower local communities in how that money might be spent. 
Now, the Institute of Aboriginal Research has identified some 300 odd Aboriginal language areas, and that would appear to provide an excellent base for the distribution of these funds. There is no shortage of the processes to do that because, in fact, the Commonwealth, quite some years ago, many years ago, in fact, set up and, and reorganised the legislation and empowered the Grants Commission, the Commonwealth Grants Commission, in this case in conjunction with State Grants Commission, something that would not be necessary for Aboriginal people, to distribute monies to local government throughout Australia on a weighted per capita basis. So, in other words, in that precedent, if the Australian government puts two billion dollars into the kitty, and someone like you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, who went round on an inquiry on this matter, were to add up the dollars arriving in the bank accounts of 700 odd Australian local government authorities, it would add up to the last cent to that amount of money shown in the budget. Nobody got anything during the process of distribution from those allocated funds. And that, in my view, should be the starting point for how we assist Aboriginal people. And of course, within those communities, they would know. They would know what their problems are. And I've got to tell you, and unfortunately, that many members of the Aboriginal elite don't know what they are. Don't know. They are about as ignorant as most Australians. It's interesting to me that in that regard, and during my term as Minister for Territories, when I raised questions about the legitimacy of the so-called Aboriginal Tent Embassy, it didn't take long for the local Ngunnawal people to agree with me. They didn't think the motley crew down there, many of whom are not indigenous, had any right to be on their land. And it's quite an interesting thing to get correspondence from well-meaning souls who talk about the rights of all Aboriginal people to camp in Canberra, not the view of the Ngunnawa. And I could say, if the member for Lingiari wanted to admit to it, there'd be many parts of his electorate where other Aboriginals weren't welcome. And I'm not saying that critically. I'm just saying that's how little understanding people have of the fundamentals of of the culture of Aboriginal people and how, consequently, governments in Canberra should distribute funding so that they were able to allocate it to their best interest. And that is not, Mr Deputy Speaker, by letting every one of the council members elected to decide on this expenditure first buying a white Toyota a very highly respected Aboriginal that I knew in Carnarvon confronted me some years ago when I first knew him he was running his own truck. He was a businessman in town and I guess it's not a bad idea that he was picked up in the Aboriginal administration to try and teach other people how to look after vehicles. And He grabbed me and he said, when are you going to stop replacing these vehicles every time someone fails to replace the oil? He said, how can I teach them? proper vehicle maintenance. So why don't we recognise the view of an Aboriginal person on that particular matter? But is that where we start? No. We start with a dialysis machine if kidney failure is the problem in that community. Do we start with the Aboriginal Medical Service, which has typically put a general practitioner in a small community on the other side of the road to the established general practitioner? when the real need is for additional specialist visits that should be funded and could provide a service uh, to all members of that small community. Might I add, anybody that checks on those who visit Aboriginal medical services will find that a very large percentage of the uh, European, if I can use that word, community attend there also, and I'm not criticising that. But what I'm saying is there's no common sense approach to what the genuine need is. But I think it would be discovered if we empowered people at that level and sent them the money. And what am I talking about? If you want to lobby in Canberra, 
then of course you affiliate. Your 300 odd councils with the money can affiliate. If they think the local lawyer is not good enough and they don't want to hire them, they can hire someone from the Aboriginal Legal Service. But the Aboriginal Legal Service is not guaranteed a life at the expense of someone who needs dialysis. Let the local community decide. If there's a need for public health nurses and the state government won't provide them, well, offer to pay for some. But hopefully, in conjunction with a training program for Aboriginal people so they can service their own in those important areas. All this is achievable if you empower people at the bottom and you distribute the funding on known processes and give them the assistance of a proper localised prudential arrangement, which we have suggested. And of course, it's not set in concrete that there should be a partnership with the nearest local authority to assist those people with financial and prudential management. There's nothing wrong with that, provided it's a partnership. And these are the sort of issues we want, so that the issues, the problems can be addressed. I lived for a long time in the town of Carnarvon, and I know a lot of Aboriginal people there. I've still got the opportunity to talk to a couple who've got scars on their chest, and they have a very different view of Aboriginal management that will be expressed shortly by the member for Lingiari. They are truly cultural people. They have a true understanding. And they're not all that wrapped in the fact that a cultural centre, which is estimated to cost $4 million, and some of the building contractors tell me you couldn't build it for that in Carnarvon. They think there are other issues of more immediate need to help individual people. And of course, alcoholism is one of them. And these are the issues that are not being addressed, where the system as it was created in Canberra has failed. I support entirely the minister's decision to do something about it. And obviously, in the short term, there can be um, no other solution than mainstreaming and bringing it in under the normal umbrella of the Canberra bureaucracy from whence the money comes. But the great opportunity missed tonight, and I'm prepared to have a small bet that it won't be provided by the member for Lingiari, is to put up sensible solutions, not to stand there and say, well, we criticise this, we're going to have a Senate inquiry so we can run around and make some political advantage from it, when we've already had an inquiry with a Labor retired senator, who is a man of some understanding, who've made a report to the parliament. Why do you need another one? Why don't we get on in this House and make, and make the opportunities? Well, the opportunity remains for that. The opportunity was to take the first step. The first step is to change and, 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 and remove a failed organisation which has lost the confidence of the Australian people, including most of those in Indigenous localities. They haven't got confidence in it. A better system is required. And in fact, I hope that it will not remain the temporary situation put before the House today. I support it, but I will continue, and with support, I'm sure, of a number of other members, those who quite openly and courageously put their name to a suggestion that wasn't exactly the fright flavour of the month at the time they put forward their thoughts. But the reality is this side of the House, at the backbench level, has got suggestions for a better system which we're convinced would work, and we will work very hard to convince the minister and others that the final solution be of this nature. But we're not here just to criticise, and as the minister has advised the public, there is no suggestion in these arrangements for lesser amounts of money. A number of the institutions will remain, and of course there will be every attempt to ensure that more money gets to the places it's needed and that it's not lost in administrative processes that favour no one than people who have other opportunities to gain employment 
within Australia, and many of which, from my personal observation, had those sort of jobs right across this spectrum. They worked as labourers on the council and the electricity authority in Carnarvon. They worked in the main roads. Some owned their own trucks on the main road, and as I mentioned, one had a trucking business back in 1958 and was doing quite well. These people are all people who can um, manage their own affairs. They need an arrangement that protects them from the pressures that can arise within families and others. Nothing wrong with that being put as part of the process, but we don't want to create another bureaucracy that gets all the money and leaves those suffering substance abuse and uh, kidney disease and short-term life expectancy, infant mortality. We don't want to see that continue. There's no need. It's not for short waste or lack of money. The There's plenty of time money. Has expired. The question is the words proposed by Minister Stampar. The question I call the honourable member for Lingiari. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, I noted the contribution from the member for O'Connor, uh, and whilst uh, it is a challenge to respond to each and every one of his wild assertions. It's not my intention to even bother to give them the time of day, because I think uh, it is far more important the, that we ana analyse what's gone on here and why it is that the Labor Party has taken the position that it has. We need to comprehend, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, that this uh, proposal before us tonight was built around wrong-headed ideas false assumptions, false understandings and a direct and, I think, deliberately ideologically driven approach to why we need change. And I don't believe that what we have before us tonight can be seen as anything other than that, and I'll explain in some detail why that is the case. It's perhaps interesting to note, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the day this legislation was introduced into the parliament was the very day was the 27th of May was the um, same day of the referendum in 1967. The anniversary, the anniversary of the referendum to recognise Indigenous people in this country was marked this year by this proposal from the government, uh, and I think it brings nothing but shame upon the Prime Minister and his government that they should bother to have done it on that day apart from anything else. Early this month, Mr Deputy Speaker, the late Mr Jakura, who chaired ADSIC between December 1996 and December 1999, launched Mark McKenna's latest book titled This Country, A Reconciled Republic, here in Canberra. Mr Jakura died two weeks later at the age of just 54. But it's worth reminding ourselves of what he said at that book launch. And he was referring there about this decision by the government to uh, close ADSIC, to abolish ADSIC, and not have any vision for a replacement organisation which would give Indigenous Australians representation and a voice at a national level. And I quote, It is no coincidence that John Howard announced his intention to abolish ADSIC when the, when the organisation was at the weakest point in its 14-year history. For me as a former chairman, but also in my capacity as an Aboriginal leader, one of the most disappointing aspects of Mr Howe's decision was the manner in which it was made and the language with which it was delivered. In the classical imperial fashion, without negotiation, without understanding and with little empathy, the great white leader announced that Aboriginal people had, yet again, been a failure. ADSIC would be abolished. No more paternalistic model of government could be found. It's worth noting, Mr Deputy Speaker, that at one time uh, Mr Jakura might have been regarded as something of an ally of the Prime Minister. He sought to work with him and educate him about the needs and aspirations of Indigenous Australians. A hopeless quest, if ever there was one. When the Prime Minister announced his intention to abolish ATSIC on 15th of April, he said, quote, our goals in relation to Indigenous affairs are to improve the outcomes and opportunities and hopes of Indigenous people in areas of health, education and employment. We believe very strongly with the, that, experiment, with, that the experiment in separate representation, elected representation,
for Indigenous people has been a failure. Programs will be mainstreamed, but arrangements will be established to ensure that there is a majority, a major policy role for the Minister for Indigenous Affairs. <clears throat> Let's just analyse for a moment what the Prime Minister said. The rationale for getting rid of ADSIC, from his, from his point of view, was to address issues in regard to health, education and employment. Now, those of us, particularly those people in the gallery this evening, would know that ADSIC never had that responsibility. They were the fault of mainstream agencies failing to deliver their services. This was the incapacity of government at a federal level and at a state and territory level to do the job they were supposed to do on behalf of all of Australian taxpayers and provide rights to Indigenous Australians that they should properly accept as Australian citizens. This was not a failure of ADSIC. This was a failure of government. Now, I didn't see the Prime Minister carpet the Minister for Education, the Minister for Health, ask them for their resignations or carpet their agencies for their failure to address these issues of great national and international concern. What we're seeing here is the government is rewarding failure and blaming the victims yet again. The Commonwealth Grants Commission has expressed serious doubts about the capacity of these mainstream departments to meet Indigenous need. What a surprise! In its report on Indigenous funding in 2001, the Commission wrote, and I quote, it is clear from all available evidence that mainstream services do not meet the needs of Indigenous people to the same extent as they meet the needs of non-Indigenous people. End of quote. Yet this advice was ignored by the government in the same way, in the same way that its very own ATSIC review was ignored. And the member for O'Connor made much about this review. He mentioned it at least two or three times in his contribution. The government paid $1.4, $1.5 million to have this review undertaken by Jackie Huggins, Bob Collins and Mr Hannaford. They went around and they consulted with Indigenous people around not all of Australia, but certainly parts of Australia. They came back with a comprehensive report, at least as far as it could be comprehensive in the limited consultation that they could have. And they had a series of recommendations. All of the recommendations which were in that report were ignored by the government. So let's not have any more of this rubbish that somehow or another the government is following the uh, recommendations or even the philosophy that underpinned the recommendations in that report. It's no wonder that Indigenous people across Australia find it difficult to trust governments and their departments with their well-being, given the abysmal failure of these departments and of their ministers to carry out their responsibilities to address the serious needs of Indigenous Australians wherever they might live. Last year, the Centre for Aboriginal Economic Policy Research released longitudinal research to measure the impact of Indigenous policy over the 10 years <coughs> pardon me, from 1991 to 2001 in the areas of employment, income, housing, education and health. The paper, Monitoring Practical Reconciliation, Evidence from the Reconciliation Decade, was revealing. Practical reconciliation forms, quote, practical reconciliation forms the rhetorical basis for much of the Indigenous policy initiatives of the current government. But despite that, the policy rhetoric of, the, of three Howard governments, there is no statistical evidence that their policies and programs are delivering better outcomes for Indigenous Australians at the national level than those of their political predecessors. This intractability is worrying in part because it is evident during a time when, Australia, in, when the Australian macro economy is growing rapidly. A major problem for both Indigenous Australians and the nation is that other research suggests that the situation described using the latest 2001 statistics is likely to get worse rather than better over the next decade. Let me describe just briefly the reality of Indigenous poverty in this country. In March this year, the Fred Hollows Foundation released analysis of what it, what it calls our health emergency. Overall, quote, overall, Australians enjoy amongst the highest standards of health and life expectancy in the world but compared with other Australians, Indigenous people have life expectancy, which is 20 years less, infant mortality rates, which are about twice as high, 
a median age of death of 53 years, 25 years less for the population of a whole, and in some regions the median age of death was 47. It goes on to describe the impact on Aboriginal children. Many Aboriginal kids are at, quote, many Aboriginal kids are at health disadvantage from birth. Twice as many Indigenous children are born at low birth weight than other Australian babies, an important indicator of chronic health problems in later life and a possible causal factor in serious illnesses such as kidney failure, diabetes and heart disease. In remote areas, Indigenous children are three times as likely as non-Indigenous children to die before the age of one. The major cause of the illnesses that lead to these deaths is preventable infections. And I could go on, Mr Deputy Speaker, <coughs> because these statistics are compelling and they are a shame on all of us. They are a shame on all of us. Yet the government, in seeing the need, says that somehow or another ADSIC has failed. And indeed, in the second reading speech, which was made uh, by the minister in the other place, I quote, she said in a paragraph, quote, all too often the specialist agency ADSIC provide an, ex an excuse for mainstream departments to avoid their responsibilities to Indigenous Australians, end quote. What does that mean? What the hell does that mean? It means that these other agencies copped out and didn't do their job. So what does the minister do? This is a justification, by the way, for a knocking off ADSIC. Because other agencies use ADSIC as an excuse, well, what should we do about it? Get rid of ADSIC, of course. How absurd. How fundamentally and basically absurd. Let me just uh, finally go to this issue of, uh, of uh, uh, living standards for Indigenous Australians. I just want to quote from a study, a Canadian study, which was uh, um, released in Melbourne some weeks ago. Uh, and this is from a, uh, an article in The Age of the 28th of April. The quality of life of Australia's Aborigines is the second worst on the planet. The second worst on the planet. This is not ADSIC's fault. This is not ADSIC's responsibility. There may be of failings in ADSIC. Of that there is no doubt. And clearly we on this side of the House see, saw a need to have a, a new body created. We took the view that we needed to do something different. But we did not do as this government has done and preemptively cut ADSIC's life short without any alternate program, without negotiating with Indigenous Australians of what should be in its place. Rather, this preemptive strike has left us with a proposal to give the minister absolute power over all areas of Indigenous affairs and a power to delegate those powers to public servants. With no Indigenous representation, no advice, no Indigenous Australians accepting responsibility. The Prime Minister has never had the capacity to put himself in the shoes of those who are different from him personally. Remember, in those days ago, he couldn't understand uh, why people took offence to his comments that Asians were less welcome than Anglos. He can't understand why it's wrong to incarcerate the children of asylum seekers for years, to the point where they become mentally ill and attempt suicide. It's why he was never interested, really, in foreign policy and why he's never been interested in Indigenous Australia. He just can't understand. He just doesn't get it. He can't understand why people should be different and has revealed this many times. The late Mr Jakura eventually saw this and in his last public speech, Mr Jakura reflected on, this, on his earlier failed attempts to help the Prime Minister see things from the perspective of Indigenous Australians. And I quote, the Prime Minister has long refused to accept the fundamental difference of Aboriginal people in our community. He is never, it was never sympathetic to the principles on which ADSIC was based and founded. He, always, he has always rejected any suggestion of Indigenous autonomy and self-determination. Even when the Prime Minister took up my invita invitation to visit Arnhem Land in 1998, he seemed incapable of understanding Indigenous aspirations. I suppose we should not be surprised. The Prime Minister walks early and often, but he has never walked for reconciliation, nor has he been able to bring himself as a leader of our nation 
to say sorry, end quote. But don't think for a moment that the Prime Minister's problem is just one of perspective. Do not think that this is, this is, his intent is innocent. He is aware of the wrong he is doing. He is aware of the base sentiments he brazenly stokes to gain political advantage. In what was perhaps the only honest moment of his prime ministership, he provided a tacit admission of the hurt he had caused to Indigenous Australians on election night in October of 1998. After a parliamentary term which had seen the appeasement of Hanson, bucket loads of extinguishment as part of the WIC package and the grotesque denial of the stolen generations, the prime minister made a coded confession following that victory. Quote, I also want to commit myself very genuinely to the cause of reconciliation with Aboriginal, Austra Aboriginal people of Australia by the centenary of federation. No. We may differ about the best way of achieving re a a reconciliation, but I think all Australians are, in, are united in determination to achieve it. Now, he knew the immense pain he caused, particularly to those families that were part of the stolen generations, but that commitment to reconciliation as with the many other things, never went anywhere. And it was the last time the Prime Minister ever expressed an interest in Indigenous Australia or reconciliation. The truth is that the Prime Minister has never supported Indigenous self-determination. This is what he told the House in 1989, responding to the ministerial statement on Indigenous affairs on the introduction of ADSIC. And I quote, I think it's a very bad step for the long-term unity of this country to establish the structure and visage under the ADSIC legislation. The ADSIC legislation strikes at the heart of the unity of the Australian people. It's very clear that the Prime Minister's agenda, agenda all along has been getting rid of ADSIC. He didn't agree with it to start with. He doesn't believe that Aboriginal people should have any right to self-determination or a voice at a national level. He doesn't believe they should have a place at the table. And so what did he do? When he thought the political moment was right, when he thought he could tweak some votes in some areas of Australia, he took this decision, this preemptive decision, without providing any alternate vision for the future. It's clear that the Prime Minister is intent on turning back the clock. And it's very clear that where he's taking us is back to the sad old days of assimilation. That's where this bill takes us. And what it seems to ignore is the fact that self-determination accept is about responsibility. And of course, what he doesn't seem to understand, that progress without responsibility is not possible. A per the paternalistic approach never did work and it never will work. Governments must work with Indigenous Australians to tackle the crisis of poverty. Governments will never get it right by acting alone. And governments will certainly not get it right if they don't give Indigenous people the responsibility for making decisions. As far back as 1938 at the Aborigines Conference in Sydney, John Patton gave a speech that may as well have been given today. He said, we refuse to be pushed into the background. We have decided to make ourselves heard. We do not, wash, do not wish to be left behind in Australia's march to progress. We are looking in vain to white people to help us by charity. We must do something ourselves to draw public attention to our plight. At the same conference, Aboriginal leader William Ferguson made a stirring call for recognition. Can anyone wonder why we revolt against persons who suppress our people and then, and then accuse us of being backward. If our young boys and girls were given proper education, they would be able to take their place with the other Australians in the community. We ask that the government should give us some encouragement to make progress. It's progress we want. We are backward only because we had no real opportunity to make progress. We have been denied that opportunity. These speeches were made not today, not yesterday, but 66 years ago. And what changes have taken place since? And how ashamed we must be. Mr Deputy Speaker, Labor has an alternate view. Last week, Patrick Dodson gave this year's National Reconciliation Week address delivered in the Great Hall of this parliament. He called on all of us to use the opportunity provided by the abolition of ADSIC to build something better. He said, if political leaders are prepared to enter into a dialogue with us, we now have an opportunity to realign the relationship between an Indigenous Australians and governments. We have available to us a camp along the side of the road, where as a nation we can again develop a strategy to take us forward as mates, where formal and substantive equality can be achieved without other citizens losing out. Yet another opportunity for a resolution of our unfinished business. 
We require a national Indigenous voice that has its authority grounded in support from Indigenous Australians. And I say here, here to that. Unwittingly, the government has given us an opportunity, an opportunity for a new way forward, to develop a new plan, to work out new sets of relationships with Indigenous Australians, to provide new ways of making governments accountable for what they do, and giving a national body a voice which not only has an advocacy role but also has a role of holding governments accountable, to making sure that those government agencies that this, this government won't, won't take into account, to make sure they actually do their job, to make state and territory governments accountable for their bad performance, and to make these ministers who sit on this side of the chamber responsible for what they do, instead of blaming other organisations and, worst of all, blaming those people who are most innocent, those people who can't defend themselves and those people who most need our intervention and assistance, and those people who want their Indigenous voice heard through regional Indigenous bodies and a national Indigenous voice which is properly representative and has a role at the national level. We in Labor believe that there is a vision for the future, and that vision requires that Indigenous people have a proper place at the table, a proper place expressing a national voice. The question is the words proposed to the Minister Stampar. The question I call the Honourable Member for Farrah. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak on the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission Act reform bill, which I sincerely hope will be a new beginning on the long road back for the Aboriginal people of this country. I'd like to explain in more detail why I think ATSIC does need to be abolished, why it has demonstrably failed the Indigenous people it is supposed to represent, and what we need to focus on in order to generate happiness in our Indigenous communities because no one can visit some of our more troubled, remote Indigenous communities and not be touched by what they clearly do not have, and they deserve the opportunity to be happy. It is as simple as that. And I have spent some years working in Western New South Wales in towns with large Aboriginal populations, pubs which were designated black only, and I've worked alongside various Aboriginal shearers and shed workers. I've seen the appalling conditions in which many of them live and the despair with which they're regarded by the mainstream community because of vandalism, drunkenness and family violence. And I think that the feeling that the mainstream community has to them now is despair, overwhelmingly. There was no official apartheid, but my God, there was an unofficial one. And when you considered the amount of money being delivered to Aboriginal programs, you wondered why the average Aboriginal person had nothing. The point is this, if I went back to some of those places tomorrow, I don't think very much would have changed. I, well, one thing would have, the increased use of drugs instead of alcohol and the increased use of amphetamines instead of marijuana. But you'd still see the same vacant stares on the faces of the youth and the same level of disconnection with the other Australia. Now, there have been some bright lights, there have been some improvements, and there are still some excellent programs that deliver benefits that are obvious to all, and I don't wish to downplay the very real successes that we have had. But it is not enough. There is not enough money hitting the ground, and it is time to do things differently, and this bill is an important part of that. The ATSIC reform bill will abolish the National Board of ATSIC on 1 July this year and abolish the regional councils one year later and transfer ATSIC's assets and liabilities to other mainstream agencies. The $79 million in savings that will be generated over four years will be allocated to Indigenous-specific programs. Mr Deputy Speaker, I do represent a significant Aboriginal community in the west of my electorate centred on the town of Dayton in western New South Wales. Dayton is not far from Mildura. There are problems in this community, and from time to time they seem to get worse. I received some distressing correspondence from the elders of this community some time ago, and they have continued to keep in touch with me about matters that concern them. They've outlined many serious issues, particularly serious family violence issues. They wanted me to bring these issues to this parliament, and I want to quote briefly from what they've told me in one of the appendices to their letters. And this does demonstrate the level of, um, of disconnection, I think, between the Aboriginal community, parts of the Aboriginal community in this part of my electorate. A 13-year-old child recently gave birth to an infant. The father of this infant is 12 years old. The 13-year-old mother says she had the baby so she doesn't have to go to school and she can get the pension like her mother. A nine-year-old boy is often so drunk he has to be wheeled home in a shopping trolley. Recently his mother and family celebrated 
his first dory, which means sexual intercourse, which he had with a 30-year-old woman. Another 30-year-old woman tried to have a 14-year-old boy that she'd been living with in a sexual relationship for the last two years charged with rape so she could claim crimes compensation. A distraught mother of five children went into a domestic violence unit to seek assistance because she feared she would either abuse or kill her youngest child and that she had difficulty handling it. The mother states she was turned away without assistance because the family care unit could assist the child victim but they could not assist the possible perpetrator or the distraught mother. The elders, the, the genuine decent Aboriginal elders of this community um, bring these matters to my attention all the time and they cause, cause me a great deal of distress, which is nothing like the distress they must call in, cause in the community. This group of elders, I must say, is very critical of ATSIC, in part because what they see as ATSIC's promotion of a housing estate on the edge of town as one of their greatest success stories. This housing estate forces Aboriginal people to be fringe dwellers. It has no services and no street lighting. The street lighting was installed two years after the first houses were built, but it was such a poor system that kids were able to access the batteries and use them to start cars, which of course they did. The lighting system has not been repaired. I understand about 10 new houses were built in this housing estate at a cost of almost $10 million. The houses are basic. They have pull chain toilets. They have not been passed by the Shire Council and I don't believe they've achieved the certificate of occupancy. They do not have air conditioning. Drunkenness is of course commonplace as unfortunately are drugs. What is of particular concern is the fact that the drug and alcohol worker has been openly observed dealing drugs and attending drug parties. And that a person employed as a youth worker has been involved in many incidents of family violence and lives with young Aboriginal girls and no other adult. Complaints to the police apparently got nowhere but simply went back and forwards between various New South Wales government departments. Another complaint that I received concerns $50,000 funding from the New South Wales Department of Ageing and Home Care, which disappeared. Docs was asked to call in the auditors. I think nearly a year later the auditors had not begun their investigation. Obviously, where you have drugs and alcohol and despair, you have crime. This escalated to a level in Dayton recently where some members of the general law-abiding community took it upon themselves to take the law into their own hands. So strong was their feeling that the police were powerless to act. Accusations of vigilante squads and a general escalation of tension followed. Something um, I think that we don't need and um, I think the police in general do a, do a magnificent job under extremely difficult circumstances. Now, Deputy Speaker, I describe these incidents not to specifically address any of them but rather to give the general flavour of what life can be like from day to day in some of our remote Aboriginal communities and how different it is from the lives of most Australians, how long it has been like this and how totally unacceptable it is. But may I say in strong defence of the area that I talk about, Dayton is a magnificent part of Australia. The junction of the Murray and Darling rivers, an important part of the Sunraysia horticultural area with expanding wine grape industries and tourism. And there are serious efforts underway to address the problems. They won't go over, away overnight, but I do think a useful model has, is being followed. Most of the distress the community feels is directed towards New South Wales government departments for their lack of resources, support, intervention or understanding of what's going on. And that's because obviously the main providers of services to Aboriginal communities are state governments. That's why the COAG model is so important. And this model is the COAG community trials. COAG has agreed to work in a new way with selected Indigenous communities to significantly improve coordination across the Commonwealth and between Commonwealth and state jurisdictions. One of the eight trial sites is the Murdy Parkey area of New South Wales, headquartered in Burke, and that takes in the western part of my electorate. Now, the model is one of establishing community working parties. The Dayton Community Working Party has entered into a memorandum of understanding with the Wentworth Shire Council, which covers Wentworth, Dayton, Baronga, Golgol and Pooncarry. They've developed a social plan which addresses housing, drugs, youth substance abuse and links directly with federal and state agencies to provide the resources to run the programs. And one interesting feature of this plan is that the council will be the auspicing body. Money will actually come to the council 
and, uh, and the council will be responsible for the record keeping and the audit trail. Now, this type of model has been criticised by some who say, well, there you are, you have um, you know, a predominantly white council controlling what happens to the money um, and Indigenous people lose control. That's not what's happening here. What's happening is simply that they will be providing the administration of those funds and, as I said, the audit trail. They will not be responsible for where the money goes. That will be decided by the local people. And um, I think it's important that when we look at new models for the future, we do keep coming back to the local community, to the need to have a plan which um, encompasses everybody in a local community, but is not delivered from on high or from elsewhere. I want to make reference to a recently released study by the Menzies Research Centre, a study by distinguished Australian Bob Biedman, and the title of his paper is Does Indigenous Youth Have a Dream? And this study correctly identifies that one of the greatest challenges we face is to raise the living standards of Indigenous Australians, to get Aboriginal Australia out of the destructive cycle of welfare dependency, substance abuse and incarceration. I really do recommend this paper. We all know that we've spent billions of dollars on the so-called Aboriginal problem over so many years and yet the problems remain. Well-intentioned policies have had either no result or resulted in the poison of welfare dependency. Some sections of our community, after a brief visit to the back country, a drive past an Aboriginal housing estate, a visit to a pub where only black people drink, return to civilisation full of the horrors they've witnessed and speaking at length about human rights, individual rights, equal opportunity and the terrible damage that European settlement has done to the Aboriginal psyche. But what I say to this is that the reconciliation and human rights arguments are secondary to the simple rights of Aboriginal children to be looked after and to have some hope in their lives. In making policies, those who ignore the harm that people do to themselves or their children, their families and their communities are guilty of a serious wrong. As I said, Bob Biedman's paper is a good paper. It's not just an exercise. It's not even an exercise in hand-wringing. It makes some serious worthwhile suggestions, and they include inventory all jobs on a community-by-community community basis, identifying whether they're being done by local recruits or by others. So make the point that we need to train local people, not just bring in outsiders and leave the insiders on welfare. Um, related to this, construct a, a scheme of mutual obligation testing for use in the bush so that jobs can be taken by local people after they've been training. Seriously examine the provision of food vouchers instead of cash, and I think that comes back to uh, one of his suggestions surrounding substance abuse. And it's it's obviously quite a a severe recommendation because to to say that people don't have control over money that is rightfully theirs under whatever program is a serious thing to say. But uh, you know he goes further. He says we need to awaken section 122 of the Liquor Act and move to place prohibition orders on habitual drunkards, ban advertising alcohol products and restrict the availability of all those products being misused by kids for inhalant person purposes and give custom sniffer dogs more work by putting them over the luggage consigned to remote Aboriginal communities. Uh, he spent a lifetime in the Northern Territory and I respect his views on those, on those things. But I think one of the most important recommendations he makes is to tie the payment of family allowance to satisfactory school attendance. This is, is really the heart of the matter. It's critical because truancy of Aboriginal kids from school is at epidemic proportions, and what hope do these kids have without an education? I mean, if as a parent you are in a second or third generation of welfare dependency and alcohol has more power over you than the love for your children, then you and the community in which you live are in trouble. And young children can only develop the skills and the discipline they need to escape from welfare dependency. If they learn these skills, and if they can't learn them at home, they have to learn them at school. School is their great hope. No measure better illustrates, however, the separation and alienation of Aboriginal people more than the various Land Rights Acts, which were supposed to provide secure land ownership to people who've had their land taken away from them, a people whose spirituality and very existence is tied up in the stewardship of their land. And I think that's well recognised and well respected by most Australians. But the question is this, does giving land to Indigenous people make them better off? Does it alleviate their poverty and does it provide a better future for their children? If the land is a commercial asset, then maybe yes. 
if the new owners could sell off the part that's unproductive in order to develop the rest, or if the owners could use the property as collateral for borrowings, for stock or plant or other improvements, then maybe yes, but this is not the case. The, the land title is inalienable and it is virtually without value. Similar outcomes are seen with home ownership. And I spoke to a constituent of mine, Nigel Gill, who was a community administrator, CDEP manager in the Kimberleys, and he recalled that when the houses in the community he managed ceased to be seen as an asset of the whole community, uh, at seek the government or someone else, the individual families actually took on ownership of their homes and the change was remarkable. They came in, they asked for basic garden implements, for brooms, and they began to take pride in managing their home. If we look at the development of modern <coughs> Western Pardon liberal me. democracies, the ability to own property has been a key turning point in all of the indicators of an improved standard of living. It would therefore seem that Aboriginal citizens living on their own land are now second-class citizens, and isn't that ridiculous? We need to work towards a system that encourages individual endeavour. We've had too much concentration on cooperative and community ownership. Back to um, Bob Beedman's paper, he recommends that we encourage and facilitate home ownership on Aboriginal lands for Aboriginal people. And while we have much to admire about the family links in Indigenous culture, they do have a downside. This comes back to the obligations and responsibilities families have towards their children. Unfortunately, we see too often family members, sometimes distant family members, drinking the welfare benefits of others, preventing that money going towards buying food, clothes or school shoes. So this paper suggests splitting the benefits so that they can be better directed to the individuals that need them, generally the mothers and the children. Now, I want to acknowledge the role of Aboriginal women in this country. They are often subjected to dreadful forms of family violence and their political contributions are ignored. The public face of Aboriginal politics is seen to be male. However, many of the most successful organisations are in fact run by women. ATSIC was a sham the, the commissioners of ATSIC uh, were a shambles. They failed entirely to express Aboriginal needs, aspirations or opinions to facilitate any sort of debate about the ideas that they did put forward. They presided over a system that time and time again rewarded men and overlooked visionary competent women. They mismanaged and misused public funds. They behaved unlawfully and yet they were elected to the highest public office. They slighted the hard-working men and women in their own organisation and they have left a slur over Aboriginal advocacy that it does not deserve. The best programs, as I've said and I keep coming back to, are at community level and our government's already established community working party is an excellent approach. But I note today that Labor has executed a backflip on, on, on this bill, referring, it to, referring the legislation to a Senate committee where presumably the idea is to bury it completely before the next election. This means that we keep paying the ATSIC commissioners beyond the 30th of June and that we ignore what Aboriginal people are telling us on the ground and have been telling us for some time. And let me give an example in my own hometown of Albury where the Wandu Aboriginal Corporation and its chairman David Clark have been battling with the local ATSIC regional council and others over the future of their CDEP program, which is a nursery of native tree seedlings. Uh, Minister Andrews and I visited the facility during the recent polypedal and uh, he was pretty impressed with what he saw. Actually, I think David Clark's first words to the minister were, thank God you're getting rid of ATSIC. From his perspective, ATSIC was acting against the interests of the local community, didn't have a presence in the local community and did not listen to the local community. Now, there'll always be personalities and differences of opinion and uh, many are quite valid and there'll always be different approaches to how you achieve results. And all of these things exist in the mainstream as well as Aboriginal politics. But as long as those involved do not break faith with the needs of young Aboriginal people, then we can accept all this and manage it. But I think there was an ongoing struggle for power between the regional ATSIC councils, which did have genuine local representatives on them, and the ATSIC commissioners, who were elected from within the ranks of the regional councils. And unfortunately, this seems to have led to a culture of vying for power, manipulating votes, competing for funds to come to an area, but uh, the competition for funds not necessarily associated with the merits of the case presented. 
I'd like to reassure people that regardless of what Labor does about this bill, we won't change some of the things. Uh, but I don't think we'll be able to change the burden on the Australian taxpayer of having to fund the ATSIC commissioners until the Senate committee has concluded. This bill Deputy Speaker, is a chance to say to Indigenous people, particularly to women, children and families, that we won't break faith with the rights of your children to have a dream. And I want to leave the final comment to uh, the paper that I have uh, referred to quite extensively, and I, I, I do again recommend that it be read by all people interested in this issue. The way out will require even more courage on the part of governments and their policy advisers than ever before. The way out will involve requiring people to give something, like their labour, in exchange for what their neighbour provides, under threat of their benefits being taken away. It's far easier to give than to take away, and we've seen where that got us. We will need to be more conscientious than ever before to have any hope of implementing such changes. I hope I have assisted in pointing to some of the issues that simply must be turned on their heads. The time for fine-tuning and incremental adjustment is over. We must fix things for the kids. Order. The question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. I call the honourable member for Banks. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I believe it's appropriate that at the outset I acknowledge the traditional owners of the area where we're debating tonight, the Ngunnawal people. And uh, also want to acknowledge the fact that a number of ATSIC commissioners and Indigenous people were in the gallery earlier this evening listening to the debate. People like um, Alison Anderson, uh, amongst others. And I think it certainly will be a better place when we have actually Indigenous people on the floor of this House as representatives rather than what has for 14 years obviously proved an inadequate model, having elected Indigenous representatives advising government. Um, and uh, the quicker that happens in this place, the better. I find it interesting that everyone now wants to attack ATSIC and use it as a, if I could say, whipping boy in terms of all the ills in the Indigenous community. I suppose the one good that comes out of the abolition of ATSIC, which will eventually occur because both sides of politics believe it should be abolished, is that mainstream Australia won't have an alibi anymore for the health and employment statistics that this country has had to put up with in recent times. For too long, the perception has been that ATSIC has been responsible for health, and it was for a short period of time, and those responsibilities were taken away from it under the Keating government. One only has to go to the ATSIC report to find out what the responsibilities of ATSIC are. And indeed, uh, there was a good paper by the Parliamentary Library, as nearly all uh, the papers out of the Parliamentary Library are excellent papers um, that uh, was a background to the ATSIC changes and the ATSIC review, and it was uh, produced on the 26th of May 2003. And uh, at page 11, it pointed out, whilst it's a bit dated, I think it's still relevant, that ATSIC currently receives about one, or did receive 1.1 billion in funding from the Commonwealth government each year. There was a table that showed the majority of money, usually around half of ATSIC's total budget, was spent on economic development programs, including community development and employment projects, known as CDP, which has worked for the dole, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, some 50 per cent of ATSIC's expenditure was on that. Um, CDEP was an employment training and community development program which began in 1977 and which provided uh, work and training opportunities for, un for unemployed Indigenous people in community-based and community-managed activities. And in June 2002, there were over 270 Indigenous community organisations and 34,182 Indigenous people participating in CDEP nationally. 
Participation in CDEP accounts for around 25 per cent of Indigenous employment. And too often we hear about how bad ATSIC was in certain areas, but we don't hear the good news. When I was the Shadow Minister for Aboriginal Affairs from 1996 through to 2000, I got out and actually looked at some of these communities. I talked to the ATSIC board. CDEP was work for the Dole before whitefellas were put on work for the Dole by this government. And Aboriginal people were happy to do that um, because it was about self-esteem, amongst other things. And that was a program that was working well, and it was independently audited. You see, we've had a number of reports and audits into ATSIC. That's the one thing that's happened consistently throughout its 14 years. The last report by the government cost $1.4 million and was ignored. Three eminent people looking at, at ATSIC. And a lot of that money came out of ATSIC's budget. That was the same thing in relation to a lot of uh, investigations that were done into the legal services, and most of them passed the test. Now, there's no doubt that in recent times um, there were some problems on the board of ATSIC. There was some bickering and a whole range of other things. No prosecution successfully achieved, but certainly it did damage to the organisation, and one can't deny that. But this government was pouring petrol on the fire, as it was in 1996, when it ripped $470 million out of the ATSIC budget that resulted in women's organisations, training for Indigenous youth programs, having to be closed down because money was also quarantined. Then we had ASIS you know, evolving recently from the government in terms of its role an interreaction with ATSIC and Mr Gibbons. Barrier after barrier put in because there was a war that was raging with certain individuals and, and certain individuals that the government had appointed. And in the end, it was a situation where, in the eyes, I think, of the majority, it couldn't continue. And Labor has said that we support the abolition of ATSIC the government jumped onto it real quick. It wasn't long after that the Prime Minister sort of came out with his uh, policy, which was get rid of it and mainstream it. That's not Labor's policy. Labor's policy has been announced, and it's about replacing the organisation. Because we do have to learn from the mistakes of the past. And one of the things that the ATSIC uh, uh, board did submit to the ATSIC review that is worth quoting is in the preamble at page two that self says, self, and I quote, self-determination is both a right and a necessity. Programs and policies imposed on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples rather than negotiated with them do not work. There has to be ownership of programs by Indigenous people. Indigenous people must participate in the design and delivery of all programs that impact on them for positive outcomes to be achieved. And in the time that I was Aboriginal Affairs spokesperson for the Labor Party, the one thing that struck me for, from all the successful programs or the ones that succeeded were the ones that had Aboriginal involvement and ownership. They were controlling their own destiny when it came to housing projects within various communities. The most successful housing projects was where we had Indigenous people involved and properly trained. And the point is, there has to be a place at the table for Aboriginal people. And for those people that think that health and education outcomes are going to improve without having Aboriginal role models, Aboriginal involvement, you are kidding yourself. Because what was another thing that the Prime Minister did? Attack ab study. And what did that do? It meant a dramatic reduction in the number of Indigenous people going into higher education. This has to be a partnership, Mr Deputy Speaker. And that's why the Labor Party, quite rightly, can't say to you tonight 
what we're going to replace ATSIC with. We said ATSIC's got to go, but it's got to be replaced with something else. But we also added onto it the component of consultation. Because you've got to give Aboriginal people and others an opportunity to work through, to make a submission in relation to the way forward. The ways of the Prime Minister will not work. Howson, former Aboriginal minister, Prime Minister, have a view about mainstreaming and assimilation. It will not work. If you want to improve these outcomes, involve Aboriginal people, train them, educate them. We are prepared to spend money and extra money on services for the bush and remote Australia and regional Australia because it costs more to provide the same services. And I don't apologise for us doing that because if we want people out there in the bush, if we want people in harsh environments working it through, they need assistance because it's not the same as if you're living in Sydney or Melbourne. In remote Australia, Indigenous Australians need additional assistance. And most of the ripping off in communities has come from whitefellas, Mr Deputy Speaker. Overcharging. Try and get fresh vegetables at a reasonable price in remote Australia. The honourable member interjects about lawyers. I agree. We introduced a Native Title Act in the Keating government that was about non-confrontation that was supposed to provide an opportunity to get rid of the lawyers, and we had a raft of amendments imposed under this government, and indeed it needed to be a work in progress, that has basically been a boon for the lawyers. I acknowledge that. But let's learn from the mistakes of the past, not repeat the mistakes of the past. Alcohol is a problem in remote Australia. Australia for Indigenous people. Don't blame ATSIC. And so that's the big thing coming out of this, because there'll be no whipping boy anymore in terms of the problems of Indigenous Australians, because I believe at a national level we have failed. The high point was the 90 per cent mandate that this national parliament got in 1967 on the 27th of May. We amended our constitution, which is not easy to amend. We have a mandate as a national government to work and protect Indigenous Australians, and that includes, in some instances, from state and territory governments of both political persuasions. There should be, in a new model, benchmarking of state and territory governments Stuff that was worked upon by the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation and Senator Heron was the then minister. There's a lot of good reports that are gathering dust that don't need reinventing the wheel on. Now I believe that the big thing for us is to be big enough to set politics aside when it comes to Indigenous people and come up with solutions that work. And all we say on this side is there's got to be involvement of Indigenous Australians, and that's not a big ask. This parliament, through the House of Reps committee, tackled a report on the Northern Territory Aboriginal Land Rights Act which became a unanimous report in 1999 under the chairmanship of the Honourable Lou Lieberman. I think it's worth quoting a couple of paragraphs of that report because, again, they summarise, to me, the basic principles that we on both sides of the House should adopt. See, I don't take delight in the fact that health outcomes haven't improved, literacy outcomes haven't improved. I know that Minister Wooldridge, as he then was, put a lot of effort into a particular area and created a lot of improvement, and he deserves credit for that. But this is what uh, was in 
the chairman's uh, report, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I think down the bottom he says, and this is the other point: the involvement of Aboriginal people in a number of project teams to consider the committee's recommendations for amending the Act represents a new dynamic. The committee trusts that it will give Aboriginal people greater ownership of the Act and a greater sense that they control their own destinies. Hopefully, it will also facilitate a more productive partnership between Aboriginal people, land councils, the Northern Territory government and the mining industry. So what this unanimous report said, and it was a House of Reps committee with a majority by the government, was let's involve Aboriginal people in an act that has something to do with them. That hasn't been done yet with this act that's been placed before the House and introduced on the 27th anniversary of the 67 referendum. You know, a bit of salt into the wound. It's not the first time that this government has inappropriately introduced legislation in an insensitive manner. And what was the unanimous recommendation of that pre committee of uh, Mr Lieberman's? It was the, by the way, it was the uh, House of Representatives Standing Committee on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs. Recommendation one was that the Aboriginal Land Rights Northern Territory Act of 1976 not be amended without traditional Aboriginal owners in the Northern Territory first understanding the nature and purpose of any amendments and as a group giving their consent, and any Aboriginal communities or groups that may be affected having been consulted and given adequate opportunity to express their views. And that's all we're saying in relation to a reference to a Senate committee. There has been consultation in the past. Well, what's wrong with a bit of consultation? What's wrong with a bit of people, sort of, well, sorry, people who are affected by this legislation having a say over it? You know, we're getting all these because, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the lesson is, unless we involve them, we are bound to fail. For all the goodwill in the world of the government, as they say they have, towards Indigenous Australians, and you can look at that in their second reading speech, it will not succeed unless you take them with them. And that's the same of non-Indigenous people. And we shouldn't be frightened of that. Why the indecent haste? Now, the, you know, the minister finished up with a quote, the time for defending the status quo and protecting vested interests at the expense of Indigenous Australians has passed. Well, I agree with that, totally. But the question is, who's to blame? And what are we really arguing about? The one per cent that we're using as the excuse? Because there might be, in the eyes of some, a few rogue commissioners or whatever, and damn the many. I can tell you, Mr Deputy Speaker, there are many commissioners, Alison Anderson, Rick Griffiths, a whole range of others. Steve Gordon has been there from the beginning, who have worked their guts out to deliver to their local community, yet they have been stained by others, and that is not fair. That is not fair. ATSIC, in many ways, did good things. In my involvement with it, I saw it firsthand. But the other thing that I find the most offensive it, is, it has got nothing to do with the abolition of ATSIC in this legislation, is the transfer of assets to the Commonwealth, the purported transfer of assets to the Commonwealth. Indecent haste, poorly thought through and, in my legal opinion, vulnerable to successful challenge. And I know there's discussions in relation to that. I'm not giving a definitive opinion but total insensitivity, the way it's just expatriating assets that were assets of Indigenous communities across to the Commonwealth. I don't think that's—it's just not on, Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker, to do it in that way, because I think this bill, in some respects, actually goes a bit further than abolishing ATSIC. And one of the reasons I think some of those provisions are there is that I think this has happened pretty quickly. 
and it followed very quickly the announcement that the Labor Party supported the abolition of ATSIC. It's a bit more complex than that, which is another reason that I believe a Senate inquiry is relevant and important to look at some of these other issues so that we make sure we get it right. I repeat, the party's position is very clear. It has made a decision that we support the abolition of ATSIC. So in effect, you know, I think the difference is we believe there should be another body there working in a manner different than what the current ATSIC operates on. The government says, no, we just want to mainstream everything. Now, there's a divide there, and I accept that. But there are other aspects there that are very important, Mr Deputy Speaker, that need to be looked at properly so that wrongs are not done. I'm not saying it's being done intentionally. I understand exactly what the drafters of this legislation have sought to do in terms of the assets of, of, of ATSIC. I say I've got a real problem with that, a real problem with it. So I uh, commend the amendment that uh, the Labor Party um, in the Honourable Member for Can um, Fraser has placed before the House. Um, and I say to all members present, it's too Order. easy to just bash ATSIC. The Honourable Member's time has expired. The question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. I call the Deputy Speaker, the Honourable Member for Page. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, I spent some time with the Member for Banks on the, the uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Land Fund and, uh, Committee and uh, Joint Standing Committee, and uh, I know his views and uh, probably agree with some and disagree with others. And, uh, I dare say that uh, uh, coming from Sydney, he probably doesn't know the Aboriginal people as well as I do. And, uh, Hopefully I can put some of that into the, into the hand side tonight. My lineage, actually, my, my, uh, my grandmother's or great-grandmother's family, uh, when they first settled the Clarence River, lived beside a, an Aboriginal tribe in its native state. And uh, they got on very well. They, 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 they were a very amicable uh, relationship between the settlers and, and the Aboriginal tribe. And uh, we still know them today. Five generations down, we still, we still know those people and still get on very well with them. But I, I think that uh, uh, it's interesting to note that the Labor Party originally raised this issue of the abolition of ATSIC. And of course, when the government agreed, uh, they seemed to find that they need to backpedal very quickly. And uh, we now see that it's going to be sent off to a Senate inquiry. I think if you talk to the Aboriginal people, especially the grassroots Aboriginal people, they will agree that ATSIC did not work. And it didn't work for some very simple reasons because the Aboriginal people are different. The customs are very different to the European uh, traditions that we have. The Aboriginal people are basically a, a tribal groups, family groups. Uh, they never did, there never was an Aboriginal nation in Australia. And I think from memory it's something like 320,000 different groups across the country when Europeans first come to this country. And their system was that those tribal groups were, they were very, very supportive. It was a nomadic life, although on the coast where I come from it was probably a little bit different because uh, food was uh, fairly, fairly uh, uh, available in those areas and uh, therefore it was quite different. But their system is that they look after themselves, they look after that family group. And one of the reasons that, the, that ATSIC failed, I think, is, was the fact that we were trying to impose upon them a system that we understood but was not native to their, 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 their belief. They didn't believe in this overall system and it was quite difficult for them to come to terms with that. The, uh, I think the abolition of ATSIC has been supported in many ways and, uh, and uh, many of the local Aboriginal people have supported it. Uh, for instance, the administrator of the Bundjalung Tribal Society in my ele electorate, Maria Bolt, in the Northern Star, uh, uh, which was uh, the April the 4th uh, this year. And it's reported uh, Maria Bolt didn't shed any tears when Prime Minister John Howard axed Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Commission ATSIC. Uh, obviously, I'm quoting, Mr Deputy Speaker. She has new respect for the veteran politician's courage in abolishing ATSIC, which is set up to give Aboriginal people separate elected representation and said Mr Howard would get her vote at the next federal election. 
Uh, she went on to say the, uh, within the grassroots, Aboriginal communities were, were not happy with that six performance, particularly that of the ATSIC leaders, and laid its, failure square, laid its failure squarely at the feet of the commissioners. They have done the worst job and caused untold damage to Aboriginal people, Ms Bolt said. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I talk very, very regularly with Aboriginal people in my electorate. I have a close affinity with them. And uh, I certainly try to work as closely as I can with them. And I think that there's no doubt that, uh, with all the good intentions of the parliament at the time, that set up ATSIC and tried to give the Aboriginal people a voice, it just didn't work. And there are many reasons why, I believe. Having said that, I believe that, uh, and I'm, I applaud the fact that the Prime Minister has said that uh, the programs will be funded and that the programs will continue. And I heard the member for Banks talking about the CDEP program, which is a, a valuable program in the Aboriginal community. And it's interesting, I think, that he was applauding CDEP, but in many other areas the, the Labor Party oppose and, and criticise the government for work for the dole, yet this is a work for the dole program. And it, was a, uh, it originated with Aboriginal people. And it's been very successful, I believe, in many of the Aboriginal communities. But uh, it's important that we continue these programs. I also think that uh, while I understand that the government has to move to mainstream bureaucracies to deliver services in the short term, uh, I would argue, and I, I will certainly argue within the government, that I think in the long term we have to get back to local groups. We have to empower local groups. One of the problems we had was the fact that even though there were quite substantial sums of money being made available, it didn't get down to the uh, the grassroots people in some instances, for the reasons I, I, I said earlier, that uh, if you were a part of a tribal group or a family group, you looked after that particular group. If you were outside that group, then you missed out. You didn't get any support. And I think that that was one of the failings of the system, that uh, it didn't get down to every individual Aboriginal person. It was a, a, a particular problem. And I think that uh, while I, I understand that in the short term there will have to be people appointed to advise the government and there will have to be mainstream delivery of services, I think in the long term we need to think very carefully about how we administer these services. And one of the failings of ATSIC itself was the fact that elections were voluntary. Now we don't have voluntary elections in our own community, we have compulsory elections. And I think one of the reasons that the, 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 uh, it was seen that the the ATSIC commissioners didn't represent Aboriginal people, was that not all Aboriginal people voted. Very few, in fact, voted. So I think that that was a particular problem. In the long term, I believe I would like to see the advisory body to the government elected by Aboriginal people. But it needs to be a compulsory election. So at least Aboriginal people can have their say as to who the representatives might be. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, let me talk about some of the problems within the Aboriginal community, which I think that we are obviously we've failed. We've failed in many of these areas. Uh, there's no doubt, and it's been raised on many occasions, about Aboriginal health, and it is appalling if you look at the if you look at the figures and the and the ages that Aboriginal people die. Uh, I mean, there's no doubt that we have failed in this particular area. And one of the problems where we really have to go back and, and address is that it starts with diet, and it's not just the Aboriginal community. We're now starting to hear about it in mainstream community, that it starts with diet. And while the Aboriginal community were hunters and gatherers and used to live off the land and uh, they'd uh, eat a diverse diet, whether it be berries or fruits which were available or, or uh, meat which was available, many of the instances these days when you go and visit these Aboriginal communities is that it's the takeaway, it's the potato chips, it's Coca-Cola, uh, alcohol, which I'll come back to. And I think that that's most of the issues with, with Aboriginal uh, health comes basically back down to diet, which really is, is an educational thing. It, it's a basic educational thing. Education. Now, successive governments have tried very, very hard to get Aboriginal children educated. And we all know in this, this particular world, if you don't have an education, then you have very little chance. It doesn't matter where you come from. You have very little chance. It is extremely difficult to get Aboriginal ch children an education. We have succeeded. It is improving. And there are many workers and there are many people within the Aboriginal community 
that are out there supporting education for their people, but we are still failing. We are still failing, and we must. We have to make a, a greater effort to try and improve this situation with education, because obviously, and I disagree with the member for Banks on this particular point, because I believe that the future of the Aboriginal people has to be with integration. We can't have a separate culture. We can't have a nomadic system anymore. I mean, obviously, that's fairly obvious. That's fairly obvious. And the, uh, there's the, if you're going to get integration, if you're going to get people into work, then you need education. You need the support to get them into work. And I think that that, that obviously is integration. And uh, some of those areas that we fail upon is fairly obvious at the present time. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to spend some time on, on, uh, uh, on the issue of, uh, of, of the, the female, the women in Aboriginal culture. Uh, I, uh, I, so I said I grew up with Aboriginal people. I went to school with them. I played sport with them. I cut cane with them. I mean, I, I know them very, very well. And uh, I have, I've had visits on several occasions from Aboriginal women explaining to me the problems they have within their community. Aboriginal women are the, are the most abused, disadvantaged people in our, in our community. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And our system fails them. It completely fails them. Because if they go and seek help from the legal system that we have in this country, then it fails them. And basically it comes back to the fact that there's been a, a lot of publicity about deaths in custody, and we can have that debate about you know, whether in fact uh, it is and I think it probably is a little bit higher in the Aboriginal community than it, than it is in the mainstream community as far as prisoners in jails. But our legal system seems to have adopted the attitude that they will not enforce the law with Aboriginal men when they are brought before the courts. So women are bashed, they're abused, they're raped. It is very commonplace in Aboriginal communities, and yet we can do nothing about it. And they are frustrated. I have to say to you, the women in those communities are completely frustrated with the system that is just le leaving them to their own devices. They have no protection, no protection from this society. And I think it's, a, it's a, certainly a, an absolute problem in our community. I've spoke to different ministers, and uh, I recall going to Minister Heron, and I was told uh, clearly by his advisor, who was an Aboriginal woman, that you know this is not just in my area, but it's across Australia that there's a, a particular problem in this area. Now, we need to do something about that. We need to support. I mean, there's no use white people going in there and trying to tell Aboriginal people what to do. We have to work with those communities. We have to work closely with those communities. We need to get Aboriginal men to understand that this is not, it's not, it's an action that cannot be tolerated. It is not, it's not acceptable that this behaviour can carry on. And I, I dare say that that needs some work, and it, uh, it needs work with Aboriginal communities. And I dare say again, we need to get back to the local group, the local mob, if you like, as they call themselves, whereby we can get some support and help in that particular area. The funding needs to come through. We need to have support in those areas if we're going to achieve any, any breakthrough in this particular area. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, I have a great affinity with the Aboriginal people. I, I have known them very well, as I said. Uh, I, they are great sports people in my particular area. Uh, they're great, uh, uh, they knew the local area very well. We learnt a lot from them. My family learnt a lot from them as to how to manage the local area. And I, I, just, I just cry at times about what's happening in those particular areas. We, we are now getting to the stage where we have a division in the community, and that's not acceptable. That is not acceptable because some of the areas that, that uh, the uh, overall community see where we are, we are giving support to the Aboriginal community, they believe we're not giving the same support to the, the mainstream community and it's creating divisions. And I, I, I really do believe we must, we must take note of that and we have to try and tackle that because in the long term that's not going to be in the best interests of anyone if we're going to have these divisions within the community. For instance, uh, all too often we're hearing about crime, uh, mostly petty theft, a break and enter, uh, that, that's, that's happening in our communities. And uh, unfortunately, it's, it's often uh, targeted. Uh, the law and order issues are often targeted at young Aboriginal youth. 
And that's causing great divisions, great divisions in the community because the community doesn't believe that, that it's being addressed. And I have to say to you again, Mr Deputy Speaker, that even the Aboriginal women are telling me the same thing, that it's not being addressed. So I, I think that we need to look very, very closely in this whole area of Aboriginal area, that we need to get this right. We need to look very closely at the structures that are going to be put in place. We don't need to do it from a European or Caucasian perspective. We have to think very, very carefully. We have to think very, very carefully about Aboriginal culture as to how they handle these things. I'm not a great proponent of the idea that we should have traditional uh, uh, law. Uh, I think that even though their law was a, was a very, very tough law, and I know most of their laws, as I said, as my family have grown up with Aboriginal people, I know most of the, the tribal law. Uh, it, was a, uh, it was a very tough law. Uh, undoubtedly the young ones uh, respected the elders, but the elders administered a fairly tough law. Uh, and I think that uh, we in this day and age would not accept some of the, the penalties that were imposed uh, uh, in those, uh, those uh, tribal systems. But nevertheless, I think that we have to get some strength back to the elders in the community, because the elders in the community at the present time don't have any, any respect their respect has been undermined uh, by our system of law and it, they, they no longer have the respect of the younger people who they are trying to instil in them the, the basic principles of living in a, in a society and living together. So uh, I think that there's, there's no doubt in my mind that uh, there's a lot of work to be done here and I, I implore the government to, to think very carefully about where we're going in this area. Mr Deputy Speaker, as I said, uh, I have examples in my electorate where Aboriginal people sought loans through the ATSIC. Uh, they had good collateral, but because they didn't belong to the group, they were not accepted. They didn't get loans. Uh, I have an instance where uh, a particular Aboriginal person uh, set up a business and was very successful in this particular business, was, was, promised, was promised funds through ATSIC to, to uh, uh, expand this business and in fact finished up not getting any funds and they walked away from it. He has them now in the court over this particular issue. Uh, there's no doubt that, that, that the advice that was given to them or the, the decisions that were taken uh, didn't help, didn't help in trying to, the, 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 to uh, support these Aboriginal people in their endeavours to get involved in business and to, and to do some work in that area. Uh, I have many examples of that and I think that there's no doubt that that just shows a particular failing in ATSIC and, um, and the decisions that were taken in ATSIC. I don't really believe that the decision by the government to abolish ATSIC had, well I won't say anything to do with the leadership of ATSIC, obviously it was, a, it was a, a fairly difficult problem with the leadership of ATSIC. I don't really believe that is the reason ATSIC failed. I think the reason that ATSIC failed is much broader than that. It's much broader than that because I think that Aboriginal people themselves believe that it was not delivering to them the services that the government and the governments in, in the, of all persuasions that have tried to deliver services to the, to the Aboriginal people. So I think that uh, this, this is obviously a decision that, uh, and the, the Leader of the Opposition initially raised this, this is a decision that was made that uh, it was a failure. I, I, cannot come to terms with the fact that the Labor Party are now trying to play games on this and going to a, a Senate uh, inquiry. I think uh, if we're going to do the right thing by Aboriginal people, we need to, to consult, as I agree with the member for Banks, we need to consult very closely with Aboriginal people. We need to come up with policies that are going to give them some say in their, in their future. We're going to have to come up with policies that in fact deliver the services to all Aboriginal people, not just some, all Aboriginal people. And I think that uh, uh, obviously uh, that can happen. That can happen. And I'm sure that that's what the, uh, I will be working for. And I know that there are another, a number of other members in the government who will be working very closely to try and achieve this because uh, we need to put in place something that's long term and that will deliver services to, to the Aboriginal people. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, as I said, I'm pleased to be able to contribute to this debate because I think that. Uh, I have some background in this area, uh, as I said, uh, a close association, a lot of close friends, a lot of close friends, many of them quite successful, many of them very successful in fact. Uh, 
you know, the, uh, there's, there's groups in South Grafton that are, that are being very, very successful in the, in the area of Aboriginal art, managing their affairs very, very well. Uh, there's groups down in the Lower Clarence near uh, McLean and Yamba who have been uh, very successful in the management of their own affairs. They just need to make sure that they get the empowerment, that they themselves have the empowerment, that they don't have this bureaucracy which developed in ATSIC, that they don't, they don't lose the finances that have been available to the Aboriginal people with the waste of money that's gone on in many of these areas. And as I said, uh, you lose confidence in the community when you have the waste of money in, the, in, in ATSIC. The, the, community, the general community, who are basically very sympathetic, lose faith, absolutely lose faith when you see some of the excesses that go on. And it's not, look, I'm not going to say that it's, it's the Aboriginal community alone. We see excesses in other areas as well. But uh, the general community are critical. And they're, they're, they're critical of the, the, the effects of uh, this, this particular uh, system. And I think that they, they are looking to try and support Aboriginal people in the long term. And I would ask the parliament to think very carefully about playing politics with this. I think we all need to work very closely on both sides of the house to try and come to terms with this and make sure that we do get it right, that we do get a system in place that will in the long term deliver services to Aboriginal people. Order. The question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. I call the honourable member for Shortland. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, this legislation demonstrates the attitude and the commitment of the Howard government to Indigenous Australians. It's not legislation that's been developed in consultation with Indigenous Australians. It's not legislation that recognises the voice or the needs of Indigenous Australians. Rather, it is the Howard government trying to manipulate the political landscape at the expense of the most disadvantaged, disempowered people in Australia. This is not legislation that's about empowerment. This is legislation that is taking away any empowerment that Indigenous Australians have managed to grab over the years. This government, in its mealy mouth, hypocritical, paternalistic way, is preparing to dispense services to Indigenous Australians in the way it believes is appropriate, because only the Prime Minister and his band of men and women know what is best, best for Indigenous Australians. Only they know what will work best for Indigenous Australians. And only they should be able to dole out money for services and programs they believe are appropriate for Indigenous Australians. This is the Howard government's approach that is embodied in this legislation. No consolation, consultation, abolition, then telling Indigenous Australians what is best for them. Nothing demonstrates the difference more graphically between the government and the opposition's approach to the abolition of ATSIC. Yes, we support the abolition of ATSIC uh, and that of the Howard government than, than the ALP's commitment to consultation and inclusion. We know that if any legislation is going to work, it can only be made to work when you involve the people that that legislation uh, is, is, uh, is for. Whilst the ALP supports the abolition of ATSIC, it is only it is, uh, it is how that abolition is handled. And what happens next that really demonstrates the difference between us on this side of the House and the government. The Labor has already, Labor has already cons consulted widely with Indigenous Australians throughout Australia and will continue to do so. I cannot emphasise strongly enough that good legislation and good government both involve consultation. A grassroots approach to government involving the people that that legislation is for. And in no area is it more important than a, way a government is legislating for Indigenous Australians, Australians who are having their voice silenced silenced by this legislation. This bill um, 
gives effect to the government's decision to abolish the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, ATSIC, by amending uh, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission Act 1989. Uh, it's concentrating much of the power that was previously held by ATSIC in the hands of the Minister for Indigenous Affairs and his or her delegate. Now, uh, there are all, the bill also makes some consequential amendments uh, to the Act. It transfers ATSIC's assets and liabilities to the Commonwealth, new housing fund to replace ATSIC housing fund to be administered by the in Indigenous Business Australia, um, transferring money held in regional land funds to the Indigenous Land Corporation and extending the function of the uh, Indigenous Land Corporation, including um, empowering it to make payments to uh, the uh, Indigenous uh, Business uh, Australia, which I previously mentioned, expanding the role of the Office of Evaluation and Audit to undertake audits and evaluations of Indigenous programs, um, the departments and agencies, and also the individuals and organisations that receive funding under Indigenous pro programs. Abolition of um, the Office of Torres Strait Islander Affairs and Torres Strait Islander Advisory Board investing the Minister for Indigenous Affairs with new powers for the proposed life of the ATSIC regional councils. It really concerns me that the Minister will have so much power. There are not, to my way of thinking, appropriate checks and balances in place. The accountability that is involved is all directed towards Indigenous Australians. Um, and, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'd like to see greater accountability, greater transparency on behalf of the government. The government has always, always demanded very high levels of accountability from Indigenous Australians, has always been highly critical of Indigenous Australians, and now it's going to take all the money, all the, all the responsibility for delivering programs to Indigenous Australians and mainstream them. This is of great concern, great concern to many of us on this side of the House, and uh, we really worry about the long-term well-being of Indigenous Australians. Among some of the other changes that are included in this uh, piece, is, uh, piece of le legislation is um, the removal of the requirement for the Minister for Indigenous Affairs to consult with any Torres Strait Islander organisation prior to appointment of a Torres Strait Islander to the board of the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. If that's not a paternalistic approach, well, I, I've yet to find one. No consultation. The minister makes the decision and Indigenous Australians, Torres Strait Islanders, are ignored. Removing the requirement for the Minister for the Environment to inform an Indigenous representative organisation of a proposal received under the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act 1999, and in inviting some comment on the proposal. These are changes. These are uh, pieces of legislation. These are pro proposals that will affect Indigenous Australians and their voices being silenced. Not only has there been no consultation in the development of this legislation, but the plan is for no consultation in the future. And uh, that makes me very sad, Mr Deputy Speaker, because I really wonder where we're going as a, nature, a nation in our relationships with Indigenous Australians if we can't even respect them to such an extent that they're able to um, have input into decisions and proposals that directly affect them. One of the things that concerns me more than uh, many of the others is the removal of the requirement for a nominee of an Indigenous representative organisation to sit on the National Health and Medical Research Council. Now, I, like most members of this parliament, are aware of the abysmal, abysmal mortality and morbidity rates of Aboriginal Australians, Indigenous Australians. 
We're aware of the fact that their life expectancy, their level of illness, the weight of their babies, every health indicator is much worse than the remainder of Australia. Yet, no longer will it be a requirement for an Indigenous representative organisation to sit on that National Health and Medical Research Council. It's the same approach, this paternalistic approach. We know what's best. We'll tell you what to do. We'll dial out the dollars. We'll put them into the programs that we think are the best. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm, I'm really quite disappointed with the government's approach, the approach that's embodied in this legislation. The final uh, point I'd just like to uh, touch on is that um, this uh, legislation also provides the Secretary of the Attorney-General's Department with a new power to determine grants to native title representative bodies. Same old story, same thing. You uh, put the power in the hand of the government, you put the hand, power in the hand of the Howard government and uh, you have it doled out, you have money, you have decisions. You have decisions made, made for Indigenous Australians. And they're not included, they're not consulted, they're just told what to do. Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker, much of the Howard government's rationale for the abolition of ATSIC is that it is committed to practical reconciliation, which I have often heard, and, and I've often heard members on the other side of the House say is much better, much better than the feel-good approach of uh, reconciliation, whole of person reconciliation. Uh, and, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the government argues that it is its practical reconciliation approach that has delivered better outcomes for Indigenous Australians. I'd argue that that's not true, and in support of my argument, I'd like to uh, refer to a paper from the ANU, uh, the Centre for Aboriginal Economic Policy Research, and this paper is called Monitoring pra Practical Reconciliation, Evidence from the Reconciliation Decade, 1991 to 2001. And, uh, this paper uh, outlines uh, and, and evaluates the period between 1991 and 96, which saw a focus on uh, a whole of government approach, a symbolic uh, Indigenous rights approach, and a uh, and um, practical uh, socio-economic improvement reconciliation type approach. And then it compares it to the period uh, following, which is the period of the Howard government, 1996, uh, to I think the period 2001, uh, the two periods that are compared. And this uh, paper, clearly demonstrates uh, that there's no evidence that the Howard government has actually delivered better outcomes for Indigenous Australians than, uh, than, pre than previous governments did in the previous period. In particular, it shows that the relative gains appear to be better 1991 to 96 than they do for this period 1996 to 2001. Now, I'll just refer to a few uh, of the key socio-economic determinators to support what I'm saying. The, the number of participants in the labour force relative to um, other groups in the community is less, less Indigenous Australians are actually participating in the workforce as a percentage in comparison, in comparison to non-Indigenous Australians. Um, the, their housing, their health outcomes are no better. They're actually worse. Their educational outcomes are actually worse. And um, the population over 55, in comparison to the remainder of Australia, to all other groups of Australians, is worse. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, rather than 
the social in socioeconomic indicators showing the practical reconciliation has worked. They're actually demonstrating pretty strongly that uh, practi practical uh, reconciliation uh, hasn't been successful. Rather, um, if I can just refer to one particular uh, part of the conclusion of that paper, practical reconciliation forms the, uh, the rhetorical basis for much of the Indigenous policy initiatives of the current government. Despite the policy record, rhetoric of three Howard government, there is no statistical evidence that their policies and programs are delivering better outcomes for Indigenous Australians at the national level than their predecessors. In fact, as I've already shown, those, social, those socio-economic indicators are worse. This is also supported by the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Social Justice Report of 2003, uh, which goes through and looks at uh, progress in addressing Indigenous disadvantage. It looks at gross uh, household income. Uh, Indigenous people has their income has increased by between by 11 per cent between 1996 and 2001. Um, but that, in comparison to non-Indigenous um, Australians whose income has increased by 28.4 per cent, employment um, tells us a similar story as does education, housing. Um, the only thing that's probably increased is contact with the criminal system during the period of the Howard government. That has actually increased in comparison to the overall population of uh, Australians. Life expectancy generally within Australia has increased. It's increased with the Indigenous Community, within the Indigenous community, but in comparison to non-Indigenous populations, that increase is smaller. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, much, much of uh, what I have said is fairly easily accessible, but unfortunately the Howard government chooses to ignore it. They rely on the rhetoric uh, and their, their paternalistic approach to Indigenous issues. Um, Ms. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'd like to. Uh, I, like many of the members of the opposition, have met with Indigenous leaders, and the message they have given me is that they are very, very unhappy with the Howard government. They do not like its decision and approach uh, in the matter in relation to ATSIC, and they don't like its approach to, to dealing with Indigenous Australians or the issues that are important to them. They're not happy with its consultation process and they fear for the future. One Indigenous uh, Australian uh, I was speaking to feels that uh, they're being and who's, uh, has a, who's quite active within the Indigenous community says that um, this is little more than blackmail. Um, it's a form of economic assimilation are the words that he used, that it's taking away the control of his own destiny. His individuality is being taken away for, and, and, and makes the point that if the government had problems with um, ATSIC, why didn't they take legal action and clean up the problems rather than abolishing it? He, he argued that, that there should be greater accountability for, but for all Australians, but he, but he felt that the accountability for Indigenous Australians was much greater than others. He, he also went on to say that qualifications, uh, Indigenous Australians are encouraged to stay at school, get better qualifications, and they're built up. And uh, then once they get these qualifications, they're discriminated against and not uh, treated in the same way as non-Indigenous Australians. He argues and argued very strongly to me that the whole issue of reconciliation needs to be revisited and that changes to ATSIC should be made in consultation with the Indigenous community. They shouldn't be made for the Indigenous community. He strongly believed and, and, and said that his family believed that, uh, that what was happening at the moment was 
disempowerment and uh, taking away of the initiative, local initiatives, regional initiatives, and that uh, that he was particularly upset with the approach of the Howard government. Mr Deputy Speaker, just another quick issue that I would like to address is that with the abolition of ATSIC, um, I believe that, that $79.1 million will be saved over four years and $6.8 million in cash balance at, 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 at I The government says it's going to put that money into uh, programs, uh, high priority programs. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I don't have faith in this government and where that money will go. I see it cost cutting and I see that it's going to be an, it's going to be an exercise that, that will not involve the Indigenous community, just as this legislation has. Ms. Madam Deputy Speaker, this legislation is an example of an arrogant government led by an arrogant Prime Minister that has no respect for Indigenous Australians. Until our Indigenous Australians are respected and allowed self-determination, the appalling health, employment, education, housing and other social determinants will continue to worsen. Indigenous Australians need to be included in the policy and program development, not mainstreamed without being consulted. The question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question to which I call the Honourable Member for Throsby. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. When this bill was introduced into the House by the member for Morton, he argued, and I quote, that the purpose of the bill before the House is to make major changes to the Australian government's institutional structures in Indigenous affairs in order to improve the lives of Indigenous Australians. I think it would have been far more honest for the member to say that the bill really is about turning the clock back and denying even a modicum of self-determination for Indigenous Australians. At the heart of the bill are two significant changes which, contrary to the Minister's assertions, I believe are detrimental to Indigenous people and their aspirations. And these are, firstly, to abolish a national representative voice for Indigenous peoples and have this replaced with a national Indigenous council. The Council would be a non-statutory advisory body of hand-picked members, not necessarily representative of Indigenous peoples and their communities. And hand in hand with that, to remove current programs, which ATSIC and ATSIS are responsible for, and to allocate them to mainstream government agencies in accordance with the government's mainstreaming philosophy and their belief that practical reconciliation is what will um, address the long-standing injustices and disadvantages faced by Indigenous Australians. My opposition to the government's proposals are based on the fact that, firstly, they were arrived at with, without any consultation or discussion with Indigenous peoples, and secondly, because they fly in the face of the recommendations made by the government's own review panel, the first comprehensive external review of ATSIC since its inception in 1990. One could ask why have a review if all of its major recommendations are so easily and thoughtlessly jettisoned? A fundamental principle is the right of Indigenous peoples to have a say and a role in any agreements between governments on proposed new models which might replace ATSIC. In the words of Patrick Dodson, who is known throughout Australia, I think, as uh, the father of reconciliation, and I quote from him, it cannot be another artificial construct foisted on us by governments deciding what is acceptable. A starting point must surely be the right of Indigenous peoples to engage and negotiate as equal partners in a relationship based on mutual respect. This starting point is nowhere in this government's calculations. The review report of November 2003 argued that ATSIC was in need of urgent structural change. I think we all agree that change was needed. The ALP's position, as put by um, the shadow minister earlier in the debate, supports that proposition that change is necessary. 
The review committee itself a, uh, recommended a revised structural arrangement, which would have given greater control of ATSIC to Indigenous people at the regional level, with the chairs of the 35 regional councils becoming the core of a reformed ATSIC. The committee argued that the existing objects of the Act should be retained, and at no stage did the committee recommend the abolition of a national representative voice for Indigenous peoples. In my view, the objects of the Act remain a sound framework for designing new structural arrangements that are informed by the experiences of the past 14 years. The Review Committee's findings state quite categorically, and I quote from them, in the course of the review, there have been many suggestions about ATSIC and the way it has evolved, with crit criticisms levelled at nearly all aspects of its structure, role and operation. However, the overwhelming view expressed to the panel was that ATSIC should continue to operate as the national representative organisation. Labor's policy position supports the continuation of a national representative body because we believe in the principle that Indigenous peoples have the right to drive change and shape their own futures. We want to ensure a continuing participation of Indigenous peoples in decision-making processes on matters that are so vital to them and that affect them and their communities. And that, in the words of Lionel Quatermain, the acting chair of ATSIC, means the following, and I want to quote from him. He said, taking control of our own lives and our own affairs means taking ownership of the mistakes and responsibility for fixing them, as well as taking credit for achievements. We want to learn from experience <coughs> and adjust accordingly. And there's no doubt that a lot has been learnt in the period since at six inception. Some of that experience has been decidedly positive, and it's of great regret that the government never talks about some of those positive achievements. I know firsthand of the wonderful work being undertaken by Aboriginal elders and the community in the Illawarra region. <clears throat> One needs only to visit the Aboriginal Cultural Centre in Kenny Street, Wollongong, to feel and sense the enormous pride of the local Indigenous communities. I've seen at first hand the services that are being delivered be it through the childcare centres, the medical centre, the legal services, through the promotion of Indigenous arts and crafts and the CDEP program at Windang. I pay my respect to the elders and the community for their wonderful efforts over so many years to, in, to address the concerns of the people they represent. ATSIC is an organisation unique in the world. As well as being the elected voice of Indigenous peoples, it also had the responsibility for funding and administering many programs. The recent splitting of the elected arm from the ad administrative arm was not a new suggestion. I can remember some time ago the then chair, Lowitcher O'Donoghue, in fact raised this proposal, but it took until 2003 for the government to give it legislative effect. The separation of representative functions from decision-making on funding has widespread support, not least because it, it provides the means of avoiding any possibility of conflict of interest. Similarly, one needs to appreciate that from the beginning, a fundamental dilemma inherent in the original ATSIC proposal was the imposition of a Western political and administrative model alien to Indigenous family, clan and community structures. In the words of the Centre for Aboriginal Economic Policy Research, in commenting on the environment in which ATSIC and other organisations have operated, they said this. These organisations are extremely new, having only emerged in the last 30 years as ways of delivering government-funded services to Indigenous communities. They are also extremely complex hybrid organisations, which have to try and balance and mediate Indigenous social norms of personal reciprocity and support with more impersonal bureaucratic norms emanating from the government funding context. Having learned from the experiences of ATSIC, the need for structural change is obvious. 
It is, however, important to restate that there must continue to be a national representative voice for Indigenous peoples and that the nature of that body and the model to be followed must be a matter for negotiation and engagement with Indigenous peoples. It is of much regret that the review panel, in reaffirming the objects of the original Act, now sees this bill jettisoning many of those uh, fundamental objectives that were enunciated when ATSIC was first created. To remove ATSIC and replace it with a hand-picked non-statutory advisory council is counter to the principles and objects of the original legislation, which had at its core the need to ensure maximum participation of Indigenous peoples in the formulation and implementation of government policies that affect them. I want to just touch on this issue of self-determination, because I know this government has the view that it's not interested in engaging in what it uh, crudely describes as symbolic uh, matters to do with reconciliation, but its emphasis has to be, as they argue, on practical measures. I don't think either are mutually exclusive. But I found this quote from the Murdi Pakhi Regional Council, which I think expresses very simply and cogently what uh, the Aboriginal communities mean by the notion of self-determination, and I quote from their submission to the Review Committee. Appropriate structures for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people should be based on ensuring we have the capacity and support to manage our own affairs and control our own development. We see improved government governance arrangements as central to achieving our goals. Through them, we are aiming to improve our living standards and quality of life and to give us social justice. It involves empowering our communities to make their own decisions and ensuring accountability to us of the way services are developed and their outcomes. I think the aspirations expressed in that statement would have widespread support in communities across the nation, but have little, if any, expression in the proposals contained in the government's bill. I now want to turn to the issue of Indigenous disadvantage, funding arrangements and the issue of mainstreaming of programs for which ATSIC and ATSIS are responsible. The government rightly argues that the rate of progress in eradicating entrenched disadvantage is not good enough. I think anybody uh, that follows the debate can agree with that sentiment. That is not controversial. But what is controversial is the government's uh, abrogation of responsibility. For I believe the rate of progress and the lack of it in many areas is a collective responsibility and a collective failure that absolves nobody from the equation. The perpetuating disadvantages endured by Indigenous peoples have been the subject of many reports, and I don't want to cite um, all of them. They're, they're well known to people who follow the debate. Um, one, can only, one, one need only look at the recent report by the Social Justice Commissioner and the Commonwealth Grants Commission. But what I did find interesting, and it's only in recent years, that there is any uh, analysis of government responsibilities at all levels. Uh, the Grants Commission report in 2001 examined the delivery of programs and services and made a number of significant observations which pointed to systemic and government failures, including cost shifting, the obscuring of responsibilities between different levels of government, the fact that funding was generally not allocated on the basis of need, except in housing and infrastructure, and the links between funding and outcomes were not direct or strong enough. However, when you read the minister's second reading speech, one gets the feeling from his comments that all the blame somehow rests with ATSIC, with ATSIC that he describes, and I quote, as Labor's failed experiment. Well, the review panel took up the issue of the public perception and debate about just who is responsible for the lack of progress in dealing with Indigenous disadvantage. And I want to quote a number of findings of that report, as a number of misconceptions need, need to be nailed in this debate. The first point I want to make is this. 
ATSIC, from the beginning, was intended to be a supplementary funding body, and it was never intended or funded to be the provider of all programs and services to Indigenous people. In 2001-02, its budget was approximately $1.1 billion, less than half of the government's allocation for Indigenous-specific programs. Its two largest programs, CDEP and the Housing and Infrastructure Program, together account for about two-thirds of ATSIC's budget. The creation of ATSIC did not absolve mainstream agencies from their responsibility to meet their obligations to Australia's Indigenous citizens. Primary health care, for example, was transferred and mainstreamed in 1995. And I must say, when you look at the reports, the outcomes, even in that mainstream service, still leave a lot to be desired, even though this was mainstreamed some eight years ago. The review commit committee rightly pointed out, and I quote, <coughs> the mix of funding and program delivery is often confused, illogical, not effectively coordinated, blurs responsibility, creates duplication and produces suboptimal outcomes. So taking all that into account, the uh, ATSIC uh, review came to the right conclusions that the hopes pinned on the organisation, namely ATSIC, that it could and would affect instant changes were not realistic. The review panel also believed that mainstream Commonwealth and state agencies from time to time have used the existence of ATSIC to avoid or minimise their responsibilities. And because public blame for perceived failures has largely focused fairly or unfairly on ATSIC, those mainstream agencies, their ministers and governments have avoided responsibilities for their own shortcoming. So the solution for the eradication of entrenched disadvantage, in my view, will require much more than the simplistic response that we see in this bill, and that is to move everything from ATSIC uh, eliminate the notion of self-determination, hand it all over to mainstream agencies, and somehow this will achieve the results that we all want to see. But what the government doesn't say is that up until the last couple of years there was little, if any, coordination of government programs, nor were there benchmarks or performance monitoring so that we could assess the progress or the lack of it that was being made in so many areas of disadvantage being suffered by Indigenous peoples. In fact, as I said earlier, progress to date in important areas like health and education, which are mainstream agencies, have left a lot to be desired. So I don't believe mainstreaming is the solution that will produce the outcomes that we all want for our Indigenous peoples. The review committee argued against the mainstreaming option because, as they said, and I quote from their report, there was no persuasive evidence that the programs would be delivered more effectively by any other agency. Well, as a former member of the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation, I welcome the belated fact that a national coordinating framework is now being set in place by COAG agreement. This will help our country establish meaningful targets, benchmarks and performance monitoring strategies to address the endemic uh, problems that uh, confront so many of our Indigenous peoples and their communities. There are eight trials of this whole government approach to service deliveries now in place, in partnership with and with the cooperation of Indigenous communities. Much will be learned from these trials. Hopefully, too, the work of the Grants Commission and the Productivity Commission, in cooperation with them, will provide us with a better in index of determining relative needs of uh, various Indigenous communities. I want to conclude by saying that the way forward in attacking endemic disadvantage is not to have this phony debate about practical versus symbolic reconciliation, as this government likes to have but to recognise that if we want to produce positive outcomes, we have to develop models that place regional Indigenous governance in a direct relationship with governments and agencies. That is, that you have the uh, local communities participating in decisions and the delivery of services that they believe are essential 
for the well-being of the people of their communities. You can't do it on your own. A mainstreaming option that denies the rights of uh, self-determination and involvement by Aboriginal communities will only lead to failure. We moved away from the mainstream assimilationist model many decades ago, and it's of much regret that the tenor of, um, the, tenor of the debate uh, on this bill by government members would see that as some form of viable solution into the future. I think there has been significant progress made in coming to an understanding that we all have a collective responsibility for the failures of the past and that the collective way forward is to ensure that all levels of government stop passing the buck, accept their responsibilities, have their performance measured against uh, agreed objective standards, that they stop cost shif shifting, that they stop blaming ATSIC and Indigenous communities for the failures to break through and achieve significant progress in all the areas of endemic and entrenched disadvantage. So, in conclusion, I want to say, Madam Deputy Speaker, that I commend the, the amendments moved by my colleague, the member for Fraser, and urge support of the House for our alternatives to the government's ill-conceived bill. The question now is, as the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question, to which I call the honourable member for Cunningham. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. This is a sad day indeed for the Indigenous people of this nation. The question now is, as the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question, to which I call the honourable member for Cunningham. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. This is a sad day indeed for the Indigenous people of this nation. For we are here to debate the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission Amendment Bill 2004, which implements the government's unwarranted decision to abolish ATSIC, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, a decision which has unfortunately received the support of the opposition. This bill is a national disgrace, Madam Speaker, for the abolition of ATSIC and the current push to mainstream its programs is nothing less than a return to the bad old days of assimilation a further whiteout of Aboriginal society and culture. Madam Speaker, I welcome the opportunity to outline why I say this, for Aboriginal issues are rarely discussed or debated in this place. At least they haven't been dealt with to any substantial degree since I was elected some 20 months ago. This bill repeals the provisions in the ATSIC Act, which establishes the National Board of ATSIC. It will take effect from 1 July 2004. The bill aims to repeal part two of the ATSIC Act, and that part provides for the establishment of ATSIC for its functions, constitution, administration and operation. It also makes consequential amendments to the ATSIC Act arising from the abolition of ATSIC. This includes the transfer of ATSIC's assets and liabilities to other agencies and the establishment of a new housing fund to be administered by Indigenous Business Australia to replace ATSIC's housing fund. The bill also modifies the role of the Office of Evaluation and Audit to take into account the abolition of ATSIC. The government's decision provides for the retention of ATSIC's regional councils only until 30 June 2005 and for their abolition after that date. The government has argued that $79 million in savings will arise over four years from the abolition of ATSIC and the regional councils and that these programs will be reallocate, and that these savings will be reallocated to Indigenous specific programs. Madam Speaker, this is a regressive piece of legislation. It has been introduced to scrap Australia's major Indigenous representative body with no immediate plans to appoint a replacement. It is clear this government does not believe that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have a right to control their own affairs. And this has all occurred amidst strong criticism and protest from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and from their supporters. Aboriginal leaders have claimed that the changeover is a shambles. And to make matters worse, on the 37th anniversary of the constitutional recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people back on the 27th of May 1967, the government moved to take away a body which was established to assist in the process of self-determination. It is clear, Madam Speaker, that this government does not believe that the Indigenous people of this nation, the original owners, have a right to self-determination does not believe in empowerment of Indigenous Australians. It believes in their marginalisation. It means that they see nothing wrong in our history, 
in the massacres, the taking away of the children, the racist slurs, the dispossession, the denigration, the destruction of cultural heritage, the disempowerment. It means the government is blind to all of this. It means that they wish to sweep aside the overwhelming issues faced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today, issues which the government is clearly not up to facing. It means that in their most devastating blow to Aboriginal self-determination since coming to power in 1996, this government has undermined the ongoing fight by the, by the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of this country to determine their own affairs. This is a right which this parliament should be supporting, not undermining or removing. Surely the symbolism of this government acting to abolish ATSIC on the anniversary of non-Indigenous recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in our constitution is lost on no one. It's a nasty government and another nasty piece of legislation. Madam Speaker, the problems with ATSIC were fixable. They were not purely of the making of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. They were largely inherent in the system, a system which fails to show due respect to the culture and civilisation of the first Australians. The government just does not get it. The Prime Minister obviously, obviously does not understand Aboriginal society and culture either. He is perhaps a hopeless quest, as the member for Lingiari suggested. Some members of the government do, I suppose, to a degree. I note the considered words of the member for Page and his rejection of across-the-board mainstreaming, pointing out that, and I quote, we need to empower local groups. I couldn't agree more. But the member for Page also rejected the adoption of traditional law. Madam Speaker, the Minister for Indigenous Affairs has announced that she will establish a government-appointed National Indigenous Advisory Council by the end of the year. Why, I ask? Is this what the Aboriginal people want? No. Acting at ATSIC Commission um, Chairman Lionel Quartermain was scathing of coalition and Labor support for the abolition of ATSIC. Aboriginal leader Alison Anderson warned that anyone who joined the government's new advisory body would be absolutely crucified by the black nation. And Aboriginal people in my own electorate of Cunningham have said to me that they once again feel let down by this government, and understandably so, Madam Speaker. As Patrick Dodson so eloquently stated in the inaugural National Reconciliation Week address delivered in the Great Hall of Parliament House on the 25th of May, and I quote, too often governments have chosen to pursue the path of denial, to continue to ignore our interests and our rights as citizens, chosen not to heal the wounds of division and discord. The power brokers and politicians choose confrontation over negotiation, legislation over compromise and litigation over mediation. Now government seeks to remove the one small formal voice of Indigenous people from the table of our national discussion on the basis that it was failing the Indigenous people in terms of service delivery, advocacy and advancement of our place in, this, in the society. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission was created by government to give Indigenous people a national and regional voice. We are now in the position where this voice is to be removed, on a whim, in a fit of peak, and without any discussion or negotiation with Indigenous Australians, and without a vision for any alternatives. For 200 years, Indigenous people have been living in a time of cultural drought where the sustaining of our language, law and culture under conditions of social stress caused us enormous damage. But, like the land from which we come, we have survived." End of quote. Madam Speaker, I was in the audience to hear Mr Dodson speak that night. I was saddened by his words, which rang so true, and once again ashamed at the actions of this parliament and politicians in regards to our native people. We fail to go to the core of the problem. We fail to listen to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of Australia. We fail to see. Indigenous Australians die on average 20 years younger than non-Indigenous than non Australians, and the gap is widening. In a speech delivered by former Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser at the Sydney Opera House on National Sorry Day this year, um, he pointed out, and I quote, health experts say that another $300 million a year spent on Aboriginal health would reduce the death rate 30 per cent within a decade. Neither Labor or coalition governments have been prepared to commit these resources. Yet we have just had a federal budget that gave several billion dollars to middle class and wealthy Australians. Both the main parties say they will abolish the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, but neither seems to have any idea what they will replace it with, if anything. End of quote. 
And there's the rub, the rub, Madam Speaker. The decision by the opposition leader to jump right in and support the Prime Minister's move to abolish ATSIC bodes ill, I think, for the Aboriginal people of this country if the ALP should happen to win government at the next election. This decision is a real setback. The Aboriginal people must now turn to parties such as the Greens to support them in their fight for self-determination, and they can rely on us for that support. Madam Speaker, it's fascinating, it was fascinating and painful to read the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission submission to last year's ATSIC review. I'd like to draw your attention to some of the important points that were made and subsequently ignored by this government. They clearly outline in un unambiguous terms the position of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, a position the government should perhaps listen to one day. The submission opened with the following, and I quote, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, as the original owners and occupiers of this land and its seas, never relinquish the rights and responsibilities to go, that go with being the owners and custodians of the land even though colonisation resulted in the dispossession of much of our lands, territories and waters. The rights of Indigenous people to autonomy, self-determination and informed consent in respect of activities on Indigenous land have, not been have long been recognised by international law. These rights are protected by United Nations Human Rights Treaties. ATSIC supports the protection of Indigenous rights set forth in the United Nations Draft Declaration on Indigenous Rights. Self-determination is both a right and a necessity. Programs and policies imposed on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, rather than negotiated with them, do not work. There has to be ownership of programs by Indigenous people. Indigenous people must participate in, in the design and delivery of all programs that impact on them for positive outcomes to be achieved. In addition to the expropriation of land and seas, successive colonial, state and territory and Commonwealth governments over the last two centuries have destroyed or disrupted existing forms of governance and the knowledge systems that underpin them. These systems of knowledge, laws and governance evolved over thousands of years, providing Australia's First Nations with sustainable communities able to manage their own lives and destinies. In their place, successive governments have imposed forms of governance that are alien to the traditions and social organisation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and that have never provided the opportunity to ensure our communities are able to grow and develop on a healthy and sustainable basis. While for some the principal vehicle at a national level for self-determination is ATSIC, neither the original legislation nor subsequent amendments in fact mention this concept and therefore ATSIC has fallen well short of the expectation, expectations and hopes of others. While the concept of self-determination itself was never embraced formally in the legislation, the legislation provides a platform upon which to build an organisation that could lead to an appropriate form of self-determination for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, a basis which all Australians might one day accept as a starting point to build a truly inclusive Australian identity. This is indicated in the preamble to the ATSIC Act. The preamble refers to the aims of self-management and self-deficiency and notes that it is appropriate to establish structures to represent Aboriginal persons and Torres Strait Islanders to ensure maximum participation in the formulation and implementation of programs and to provide them with an effective voice within the, the Australian government. Despite its shortcomings, the current legislation establishes a unique organisation. ATSIC is not simply another agency expendable with changing circumstances. This does not mean that ATSIC is or should be immune from change. However, it is essential that any changes to ATSIC promote its current role and ideally enhance the opportunity for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to enjoy and express our right to self-determination. Given the significance of ATSIC, changes must be very carefully considered. They certainly must be fully negotiated. Anything less would mean falling short of Australia's responsibility to respect the human rights of its Indigenous citizens, would further increase the risk of adopting inappropriate approaches to the delivery of public policies, programs and services to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and would reduce the chance for building a truly inclusive Australia." End of quote. That says it all, Madam Speaker. Self-determination, empowerment, rights and respect. ATSIC emphasised the need for careful and constructive deliberations in respect of change and the need to consult widely and to negotiate fully. This wasn't done. 
The primary object, objective of the submission stated must be to enhance the social, economic and cultural rights of Indigenous people in the context of self-determination and full and equal partnership. This is clearly not what this government has chosen to deliver with this bill, Madam Speaker. Indeed, I don't believe that the government was ever committed to dealing honestly and fairly with the, this review. The continuing existence of a relatively independent body such as ATSIC was obviously at odds with the philosophy of a, this government, which, which repeatedly fails to acknowledge the significance of Aboriginal society and culture in this land. Whether it is based on racism, self-interest or just plain ignorance, at the end of the day it has the same result. Indeed, the outcome of the extensive review specifically warned against the path that this government has chosen to follow via this bill. This is despite the fact that the review panel undertook two major rounds of public consultation, visiting state and territory capitals, a number of regional centres and meeting with all 35 ATSIC regional councils. The panel also met with the ATSIC board, the Women's Advisory Committee, the Torres Strait Islander Regional Authority and the Torres Strait Islander Advisory Board. The panel considered the abolition of ATSIC, with all its activities being devolved to relevant mainstream agencies. Importantly, the review panel specifically stated that it was not supportive of this abolition option. Madam Speaker, the first rally in Australian support of ATSIC after the government's announcement of, of its proposed abolition was held in my electorate of Cunningham on Thursday, the 29th of April 2004. The speakers at the Wollongong rally included Auntie Mary Davis, ATSIC Regional Representative and Director of the Illawarra Aboriginal Corporation, Stan Jarrett, Coordinator of Aboriginal Client Service specialists at New South Wales local courts, Chris Foley, current ATSIC commissioner, Fred Moore, retired miner and social justice act activist, Cole Markham, former New South Wales parliamentary secretary for Aboriginal affairs, and there was emceed by Richard Davis with music by Auntie Betty Little. This formidable group passionately outlined to a large audience why such pre-election pre announcements by both sides of parliament were disingenuous and sought to play on complaints of maladministration rather than seek solutions for ensuring better use of funding in the future. Speakers highlighted the hypocrisy present in our society at the moment. They rightly pointed out that improper behaviour by a parliamentarian does not result in the abolition of, that of the institution, but rather strategies are put in place to ensure future best practice and honesty, likewise with ATSIC. Speakers outlined the hardship facing Indigenous Australians and called for genuine commitments to fund health, education, and welfare improvements within Aboriginal communities. There is no dispute that what is urgently needed is increased funding for grassroots organisations such as the Illawarra Aboriginal Corporation and other bodies that provide valuable community and welfare services. There was widespread support for our local CDEP program, for example. Many Aboriginal communities throughout Australia and even in my electorate of Cunningham and individuals face great social disadvantage and are not appropriately consulted on issues affecting their lives, thereby making moves to abolish ATSIC a decidedly negative step when development and further financial and social investment is what is needed. The gathering applauded the sentiment that this was simply the beginning of a campaign for social justice for Indigenous Australians. Madam Speaker, the Greens call on the government to immediately open a dialogue with Aboriginal people and allow them to determine their own future. As we've seen, Aboriginal people in this country have been governing themselves for thousands of, and thousands of years, more than 40,000 years, in fact. They have in place traditional structures and means of governance. Why do we then, as a nation, continue to ignore them? Why do we, in our arrogance, continue to belittle Aboriginal traditions and culture? We think we have all the answers. Well, our involvement in places such as such as Iraq reveal that we clearly do not have all those answers. And I'd call on the government and the opposition to work with Aboriginal people in finding the best way forward for this country. Aboriginal self-determination, a word that I've used a lot during this speech, is based on Aboriginal governance and empowerment. This is an area in which we, non-Indigenous Australians, are clearly not the experts. I often despair at our stupidity and ignorance in this regard, for after 200 and 16 years, we appear to have learnt very little. Our invasion and occupation has left the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of this nation sick, dispossessed, disempowered, disillusioned and dying. This bill does nothing to address these issues. And while government in this country, at all levels, local, state and federal, commits 
And until government in this country at all levels, local, state and federal, commits to true self-determination and recognition of the rights of Indigenous people, I cannot see any change forthcoming. In fact, we seem to be going backwards. And that's the feeling out there in the, in the community, that they are, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community are going backwards. Madam Speaker, I'm also very disappointed by the opposition stand on this matter. I have to ask myself, why isn't the opposition opposing this bill in this place, the People's House? Why isn't the passion and knowledge of the member for Lingiari, for example, reflected in the ALP's action? The member for Fraser has told us that the ALP will not allow this bill to pass until it has received very serious consideration in the Senate. Well, frankly, Madam Deputy Speaker, that's just a cop-out. History will show that the opposition did not oppose the abolition of ATSIC in this place. And that is sending a clear message to the community, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous. And the Greens will not be party to this. Our position is clear. We support Aboriginal self-determination. It's a disgrace that the major parties do not. I therefore cannot support this bill. The question now is the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question, to which I call the honourable member for Charlton. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. At the outset, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'd like to acknowledge that whenever we meet in this place, we're meeting on Ngunnawal land, and I'd like to pay my respects to the elders of this country. I'd also too like to, um, as the Deputy Chair of the House of Rep Standing Committee on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs, convey my condolences to the family of Mr Jakura, who passed away last week during Reconciliation Week. And in doing that also, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'd like to refer to Mr Jakura's uh, last public address at the launch of the book This Country, A Reconciled Republic by uh, Mark McKenna. Mr Jakura said at that time that ATSIC had, his, had its flaws but deserved better than execution by a prime ministerial decree. He said, as we have so often heard, the federal government is the champion of practical reconciliation. As a senior elder of the Wanguri people in East Arnhem Land, Yukala Aboriginal community, I live every day understanding the extreme urgent needs of Aboriginal people. But I also understand the importance of symbolism, he said. Symbolism matters because it is a reference point for all Australians. The symbols of our nation embody our ideals. They speak to us and to other nations of our identity and beliefs. Symbols can also be a sign of change, a beacon of hope and a declaration of intent. When they reflect our aspirations, they are empowering. At that same address, Mr Jakura also said, let me be clear, the Prime Minister has long refused to accept the fundamental difference of Aboriginal people in our community. He was never sympathetic to the principles on which ATSIC was based and founded. He has always rejected any suggestion of Indigenous autonomy and self-determination. Madam Deputy Speaker, that, those um, sentiments are exactly what we see reflected in this bill before us this evening. In our history, it's been, always been Labor which has proposed every initiative to advance Indigenous Australia. Most notably, land rights for Indigenous Australians, both under the Whitlam and Hawke gov governments and the Racial Discrimination Act. Labor's amendments include condemnation of the government for failing to consult or negotiate or discuss with Aboriginal Australians on the provisions in this bill. This lack of discussion and consultation stands in stark contrast to wide-ranging discussions which were undertaken by Minister Gerry Hand prior to the establishment of ATSIC. To emphasise this point, I refer to the, the then Minister's second reading speech. In introducing the um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission Bill back in 1988, uh, Gerry Hand said, today, 21 years after 19 after the 1967 referendum, which gave the Commonwealth the power to legislate for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, I present legislation which for the first time will ensure the place of Indigenous peoples of this country in the decision-making process of government, that very place that this government is trying to rip away from Indigenous Australians. 
He goes on to say it would mean their own elected representative, one of their own people, would be part of a commission which would have the power to formulate and implement policies for all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Madam Deputy Speaker, in referring to discussions and negotiations uh, Jerry had at that time referred to a meeting in faraway Wingelina as being just one of hundreds of meetings around the country held to discuss this new proposal. This is prior to the uh, Labor government um, establishing ATSIC. He said this legislation is the product of a great deal of consultation with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. More than 21,000 uh, copies of his parliamentary statement, Foundations of the Future, and 1,000 copies of a video were distributed to more than 1,000 separate Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations and communities throughout Australia. In the order of 537 preliminary meetings were held involving some 14,500 people to discuss the proposals outlined in foundations prior to the meetings with communities and organisations. He said in um, between January and March of 1988, he personally visited and spoke with some 6,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander representatives at 46 separate meetings. Uh, subsequently, an options paper was prepared which identified a range of alternative proposals based on suggestions and recommendations received as a consequence of his consultations with the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, that pe paper was widely circulated and was discussed at another 88 meetings involving some 2,700 people. Madam Deputy Speaker, that's what discussion and negotiations and consultations with Aboriginal people should have involved. Uh, that's what Labor is committed with, a wide-ranging discussion with the um, communities about the kind of um, elected representation that Aboriginal people wish to have and about the kind of uh, service delivery that they expect from government and how, that how that, uh, those services would be delivered in their own communities to their, for their own benefit. Labor's position in relation to ATSIC has been very clear and widely accepted by Indigenous Australians. On 30 March 2004, Mark Latham released Labor's new framework statement on Indigenous self-governance and program delivery. Two weeks later, the Prime Minister and the Minister announced that the government would eliminate Indigenous Australians' input into policy and programs by abolishing ATSIC and mainstreaming all Indigenous programs. Unlike the Howard government, Labor is committed to self-determination for Indigenous Australians. We believe that Indigenous Australians have a right to determine who speaks for them and a right to inform the development of programs delivered to their communities. Labor will create a new, new directly elected national Indigenous body that will support directly elected Indigenous regional bodies that will have key responsibility for program development and delivery at the regional level. In the past month, Senator Kerry O'Brien, the Shadow Minister for Reconciliation and Indigenous Affairs, has been travelling around the country meeting Indigenous leaders and communities and talking about Labor's plan. Kerry has also written to elected ATSIC representatives and peak Indigenous organisations inviting comment. I have also written to and met with many Indigenous organisations in my electorate, and I am sure all of my colleagues on this side of the House have. As I stated, Madam Deputy Speaker, that is what this genuine consultation and genuine discussions and, and engagement is all about. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission Amendment Bill, as proposed, is totally inadequate in that it fails to acknowledge the accepted right of Aboriginal people to self-determination as enshrined in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission Act of 1989. The bill as proposed has obviously been prepared hastily, with little thought to the consequences of the amendments, and it seems more with an eye to implementing the Howard government's strategy of cultural assimilation. The principal change throughout is a semantic one that replaces the words Minister or Secretary that replaces the words Minister or Secretary of the Department with any reference to the ATSIC Board of Commissioners. Significantly, it contains no proposal for an alternative structure for elected representation for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, which is Labor's policy. Apart from the glaring problem that the, ideology of the bill, that the ideology of the bill represents, 
It also contains some highly dubious propositions as far as the administration of programs currently administered by ATSIC or ATSIS, the Howard government's executive agency that is currently subject to a High Court legal challenge by the commissioners. These include the proposed changes to the Aboriginal Home Loan Program, the Indigenous Land Fund and Indigenous Business Australia. What the proposed amendments do is to move the Housing Fund to operate within Indigenous Business Australia and rename it the New Housing Fund. The concern is that, given the commercial imperatives of the IBA, as distinct from the non-commercial imperatives of the Board of Commission, under which the Housing Fund presently functions, there will be pressure to increase grants to commercial lenders and reduce those individuals and com Aboriginal community organisations. The point is that without the oversight of the Board of Commissioners and down the track without the regional councils in place, schemes like the housing loan program in the hands of mainstream agency will lose their Indigenous-specific tailoring. There is also a risk of large slush funds of money sitting in the coffers of large um, commercial lenders. This risk is quite real. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'd like to um, talk about some, some good news stories, some good programs, some good work that has um, been occurring under the ATSIC model in my particular region. In my area, we have uh, the Yarnteen Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Corporation. Um, Yarnteen was established in 1991 in Newcastle, and it has both social and economic objectives. It has an objective of improved social wellbeing to build capacity within Indigenous communities, share information and encourage strong ethical leadership. And it has an objective of sustainable economic self-sufficiency to encourage greater Indigenous participation in the broader economy through Indigenous-owned enterprises and self-employment. Some significant achievements of Yarnteen include the Yarnteen CDEP, which is one of the largest CDEPs in New South Wales. Uh, it's been successful in providing mainstream employment pro opportunities for the participants and, through its group training company, has placed over 200 participants into traineeships and apprenticeships over the past four years. Another achievement is the uh, Port Hunter Commodities. This is a wholly owned subsidiary company of Yarnteen and is a modern, up-to-date bulk warehousing and commodity bagging enterprise located within the Port of Newcastle area. In 2000, Port Hunter Commodities was awarded a National Australian Quarantine Award for Excellence in Plant Quarantine. It has a small business assistance and incubation program, which has helped several Indigenous small businesses get established and continue to support them. We have the Yamalong Resource Centre, which is located in my electorate. Yamalong means coming together. This community resource centre is, was established to provide a facility for training, cultural awareness, conferencing and education. Yamalong employs 10 full-time employees, of which nine are Indigenous. Yamalung has uh, achieved numerous awards, uh, including in 2003 the New South Wales Tourism Indigenous Business of the Year and in 2003 the Many Rivers ATSI Council Awards for Community Service, Small Business and Overall Community Achievement Award. Yarnteen also runs an in digital access strategy and information and communication technology strategy for Indigenous communities aimed at bridging the digital divide. It has established a cultural camp on 100 acres in the Wallumbi Broke area. The cultural camp is utilised by many educational groups for cultural education purposes and by sporting and recreational groups. Individual members of Yarnteen have reached the highest positions in Indigenous affairs in Australia. Yarnteen has been held up as a model and benchmark for Indigenous community and enterprise development. The success of Yarnteen has been attributed to the vision, stability, cohesiveness and cooperation we've been they've been able to generate from all sectors of the Indigenous and wide community. Yarnteen has advocated the way forward for Aboriginal people and continues to place a great, greater emphasis on economic empowerment of the individual and family and the consequential development of the means for financial independence at this level. 
Yantian states that they must empower family units and youth to enable them to participate in education, employment and business development opportunities and to have the choices to make informed decisions. Yantian wouldn't exist today if it wasn't for ATSIC. Yantian is one of the, 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 the many, many success stories which far outweigh the, um, the, the bad news stories that this government would have you believe right across this country. Leading in these successes, they were uh, Sean Gordon, a young, dynamic Aboriginal leader who I thought might be here this evening, um, who's, in, who's in the area, in the parliament somewhere this evening with, with a strong, supportive and active family background. Sean is the uh, CEO of Yamalong Resource Centre and also with him um, leading in these successes is the Indigenous businesswoman Leah Armstrong, who is the general manager of Yarnteen, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Corporation. Leah is also chair of the New South Wales Aboriginal Business Roundtable, which was established in 2002 to foster partnerships with Aboriginal communities and enterprises and the private sector and to advance Indigenous economic development and job creation. I applaud the work that, that Sean and, and Leah have done in our community and many others um, with them. Uh, Jim Wright's another one that, that comes to, to, to mind straight away. There are many, many great people working, out, out, working in our communities for the advancement of Aboriginal people to rectify some of the disadvantage that Indigenous people uh, experience. They are being, um, these are the people who are being told that they're failures by this government. They're not failures. This government has failed uh, Aboriginal people, and this particular piece of legislation is no way to address um, the, the failings of this government. The only way that those failings can be addressed by government is for a Latham Labor government to be elected. But our region also has its problems. I'm currently working with uh, Beverly Dargan, OAM, a Many Rivers councillor representing my hometown of Toronto, on finding solutions to problems in the local rental market for Indigenous people. Beverly initial, initiated this process in a letter to me in November 2003. She says, I'm writing to tell you of the difficulties Aboriginal people experience in inquiring homes to rent in Toronto. As you may know, it is effectively impossible for an Aboriginal person person to rent privately in the West Lakes area. We have demonstrated this many, many times. Racial discrimination may be silent and hidden, but it is none the, nonetheless real. She says even tenants with a perfect rental history, such as April and Mark, married with two children and living and paying rent for the past two years in a one-bedroom flat, cannot move on to larger premises. It's utterly disheartening and discouraging. She says, Kelly, I ask you to do some creative imagining. I ask you to imagine what it would be like to be black and to be in need of a home and to have to face 30 humiliations before being considered as a potential candidate to rent a home. Would you give up or would you stick it out? Would you, as a confident professional person, have the moral strength to be dragged through the manure pit 30 times as a precondition to being considered worthy, to being placed on a list, to maybe sometime in the future getting a home to rent? when you had no alternative in the private rental market and the three-bedroom house you were living in with 15 to 27 other couriers. No, Beverly, I don't think that I can imagine that I would be able to put myself through that process. I don't think any Australian should have to. She says, Kelly, I know you are a caring person. I know you have a good heart and you have a heart to help Aboriginal people. I ask for your help. We need to solve the problem of Aboriginal homelessness and overcrowding that is caused by cruel and heartless racism. Madam De De Mr Deputy Speaker, this is having, happening right across our country, and we're talking here about a, um, a, a regional urban area, Lake Macquarie, just south of Newcastle on the west, west coast of the lake. Beverly and I are, are hosting a, um, a housing forum in July this year where we can invite the real estate agents, the Chambers of Commerce, uh, the Real Estate Institute to come along and hear firsthand the stories that their policies and their actions um, put everyday Australians through. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, notwithstanding any government programs, the, uh, there is continuing an unacceptable disadvantage um, in Aboriginal Australia. And that's this disadvantage continues to be highlighted and most recently in the Aboriginal and 
Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner's Report of 2003. And I just refer to a, a couple. I know a, a few of these statistics have already been referred to in this um, discussion, in this debate. Mr. Deputy Speaker, gross household income for Indigenous people is 62 per cent of the rate for non-Indigenous Australians. In 2001, 54 per cent of Indigenous people of working age were participating in the labour force, compared to 73 per cent of non-Indigenous people. The unemployment rate for Indigenous people was 20 per cent, three times higher than the rate for non-Indigenous Australians. And 18 per cent of all Indigenous people in employment in 2001 worked on a CDEP scheme. 69 per cent of Indigenous students progressed from Year 10 compared to 90 per cent of non-Indigenous students. In 2001, 63 per cent of Indigenous households were renting uh, compared to 27 per cent of non-Indigenous households. Indigenous people have consti consistently constituted uh, 20 per cent of the total prison population. Indigenous people are imprisoned at 16 times the rate of non-Indigenous people, and Indigenous women are imprisoned at over 19 times the rate of, of non-Indigenous women. Mr Deputy Speaker, these um, statistics go on and they speak for themselves. In conclusion, I just want to quote the father of reconciliation, Pat Dodson, in his ANU reconciliation speech in the Great Hall of Parliament last week. He said ATSIC was created by government so as to give Indigenous people a national and regional voice. We are now in a position where this voice is to be removed on a whim, in a fit of pique, and without any discussion, consultation or negotiation with Indigenous Order. Australia, and without any vision for alternatives. Order. The honourable member's time has expired. The question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The member for Fremantle. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. This bill should carry a title that more accurately reflects its genesis. It should be called Howard's Revenge. It's a crude payback for the humiliation the Prime Minister believes he suffered when members of the Indigenous community took him to task at Corroboree 2000, for his refusal to apologise to the Stolen Generations, for the WIC legislation which neutered native title, and for his refusal to acknowledge the unique position of Indigenous Australians dispossessed of their ownership of this land. Corroboree 2000, celebrating reconciliation, was meant to be a great national occasion to begin the process of acknowledging and redressing past wrongs and of building a future based on mutual respect and understanding. After having seen so many Australians open their hearts to the idea of reconciliation and take part in marches and celebrations around the country, Many expected Howard to respond to the momentum for change and behave like a statesman. He couldn't do it, he wouldn't do it, and subsequently adopted the policy of so-called practical reconciliation as an excuse not to say sorry. And the people present on that occasion, on what could have been a moment of renewal, jeered and booed a mean-spirited, graceless speech, as Australians do, and some turned their backs on him. Howard has never forgotten or forgiven. Remember order his lectern the thumping. The Prime, Minister, her seat. The, the Prime on a Minister. The Prime Minister. If I could just ask the honourable member for Fremantle to uh, refer to the Prime Minister by his correct title. Order the honourable member will refer I'm happy to, do to that, the members most people by their title. Know him colloquially as Howard. The Prime Minister has never forgotten or forgiven. Remember his lectern thumping, red-faced, hysterical rant. He certainly does. And now he hopes to act out the last scene of this revenge drama by silencing those who dared to criticise him. These actions by the man and the government demonstrate, as Mick Dodson put it, a deep-seated disrespect for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and our cultural rights and obligations. See the Prime Minister's almost obsessive denigration of the black armband view of history as evidence of this. He has an almost visceral reaction to any attempts to write a history inclusive of Indigenous stories and accurately depicting the grim as well as the admirable and heroic deeds of our settler forebears. He couldn't apologise on behalf of the nation because he really doesn't see that there's anything for which to apologise. In fact, he caricatured the request for recognition and reparation from the stolen generations as an unreasonable attempt to make people like him feel guilty about our past. Mind you, he's got no trouble at all appropriating the courage of our war dead 
and feeling proud of their actions, I say to the Prime Minister, you can't have one without the other. After a sustained campaign of vilification of Indigenous organisations and their supporters, mounted from almost the first day of its election, the Howard government now seeks to close the chapter on what they call, in inverted commas, a failed experiment. In announcing the government decision to abolish ATSIC and not to replace it, the Prime Minister claimed, and I quote, we believe very strongly that the experiment in separate representation, elected representation for Indigenous people has failed. Now the truth is the Prime Minister was never interested in any objective assessment of the experiment, as he calls it. He made up his mind a long time ago. When the bill to establish ATSIC was introduced in 1989, he argued, and I quote, that the legislation strikes at the heart of the unity of the Australian people and would, and I quote again, divide Australian against Australian. Well, if he had his way, it certainly would. The Prime Minister has long been an opponent of any mechanism which gives Indigenous people any form of autonomy, preferring assimilationist policies. That's his history which the government, of course, now seeks to entrench in so-called mainstreaming of Indigenous programs. But scandalously, in my view, in getting rid of ATSIC, the government offers no alternative. No alternative legitimate Indigenous voice, no mechanisms to allow our original people to help design and implement policies needed to improve their lives, no vehicle for holding governments to account for their performance in redressing disadvantage, no body with the breadth of views to represent the interests of all Indigenous Australians. Nothing. They appear to want to replace what they regard as a failed experiment with structures which we know have failed even more spectacularly to deliver improvements to Indigenous communities. Several members in their speeches have already referred to the work by IATSIS on so-called practical reconciliation, so I won't recite those gloomy figures again. Suffice it to say, if you want to find a failed experiment, it's this government's approach to practical reconciliation. The $1 million review, or $1 million plus review, of ATSIC cynically and inaccurately used by the government as justification for the abolition of ATSIC gave people false hope that the recognised flaws and failings of ATSIC would be analysed and repaired, that a new set of arrangements would be developed to improve and advance Indigenous people's circumstances, rights and representation, all three of those things. Amongst other things, the review recommended that a stronger regional focus was needed, but it didn't recommend abolishing elect, elect representation. And the members of that committee, particularly Jackie, Jackie Huggins, the one Indigenous member, have treat, been treated with very considerable disrespect, pretty typical, I have to say. Jackie Huggins found, about the abolition, found out about the abolition of ATSIC from a television journalist. In a recent uh, program on SBS, in response to a question, Jackie, who's always incredibly polite, said, well, for me personally, it was completely a bolt out of the blue. We knew that there would be changes. I didn't realise, nor did many people, how drastic these changes would be. So I was very much shocked and embarrassed and disappointed that as an Indigenous member, the only Indigenous member of this review team, and a woman, that the rightful opportunity to tell us about the review was not given by the government. I mean, I found out, uh, out through Lola Forrester, an SBS journalist, who's in the audience tonight, through the Indigenous media, that ATSIC was abolished. And that's the way Indigenous people are treated by this government. She went on to say in another interview that the axing of ATSIC was in fact contrary to our view, although the Prime Minister has used the review as justification. And Jackie Huggins says, in no way would our review team be aligned with the abolition of ATSIC. It was not our intention, she said. I didn't expect such a drastic situation might occur, with ATSIC being annihilated and abolished. Other Indigenous leaders have made even less kind remarks about the government's actions. But Jackie has, Huggins has good reason to complain. The government indeed didn't even wait for the report to be concluded before stripping ATSIC of its responsibilities for program delivery and placing it with a new body at CIS, a process that took place without consultation and without the scrutiny of this parliament. It's actually a disgrace. It was, as we now see, preparatory to this complete abolition, making the dismembering of at six so much easier than it would otherwise have been, a very cynical ploy. This legislation that we're debating here is a return to the days 
following the 1967 referendum, replacing the elected representatives of ATSIC with an appointed advisory body. I'm sure the Prime Minister would like to take us even further back than that, but even he didn't do that. As we all know, Indigenous people themselves were very keen for reform, but they also knew and they know that ATSIC had been made to carry burdens not of its making and well beyond its capacity to bear. The government and its apologists, the Alan Joneses of this world, have cultivated the view that the poor state of Indigenous health, education and living conditions is principally the fault of ATSIC, the most recent of all bodies, in fact, and the least culpable. The truth is otherwise. Most of the programs to deal with these problems are designed and funded elsewhere by mainstream departments and programs in state, commonwealth and territory governments. ATSIC was always supposed to have a supplementary role. That was the intention of this parliament. Indeed, the original objectives are clearly stated in the original legislation, and I think get washed away in this bill, and they didn't provide for exclusive, comprehensive service delivery. That was never contemplated. However, because of the failure of state and commonwealth governments to adequately deliver services, ATSIC did, in some respects, become the funder of last resort, supplying funds for essential services and infrastructure such as roads, water supply and sewerage, services otherwise routinely supplied by state and local governments for the rest of the community. Australians don't understand, I think, that many of the things that they find shocking about Aboriginal circumstances are mostly not the responsibility of ATSIC. Its programs were meant to supplement the provision of essential services to Aboriginal communities from Commonwealth, state and territory governments. As the Auditor-General reported, ATSIC was increasingly a re replacement funder because governments refused to accept their funding responsibilities to Aboriginal people. And now we're going to do away with the one body who might have given us hope. One of the biggest unanswered questions with this legislation is what will now happen to those communities who've relied on ATSIC, the funder of last resort, for the most basic of services? As the minister and the senior public servants who appeared before the Estimates Committee this week demonstrated, they don't know, or if they do, they're not telling anyone. It's clear that the abolition of ATSIC without a replacement body or the reforms recommended by the government's own review will further disadvantage Indigenous Australians, as if it could be any worse. As Linda Burney, a New South Wales Aboriginal member of the, of the Parliament, points out, the regional ATSIC councils have also been a conduit for leadership development, something I think this government is not much interested in. She says, can Aboriginal people aspire to positions of leadership? ATSIC at a regional level was one of the key vehicles for developing that sort of leadership and capacity, now to be abolished. How, she asks, will these young leaders cut their teeth? This action, proposed by the government, is fundamentally a denial of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's human right to identity and an elected voice, something we certainly intend to remedy in government. If this government gets its way, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples will now have no decision-making context for accessing and participating in the right to self-determination, as defined in the UN International Covenant on Social, Economic and Cultural Rights, to which we're signatories. The, change in the changes in this bill are poorly motivated, as I pointed out, poorly conceived, and as we've seen in the Estimates Committee this week, poorly executed. There's still no clarity in the arrangements for transferring staff and programs to other agencies, and the provisions in the bill for disposing of assets create more problems than they solve. The arrangement have all the appearance of being hastily cobbled together to meet political and not policy timetables, pretty typical of this government. It's also obvious that the abolition of ATSIC and the failure to develop substitute arrangements does nothing at all to address many of the impediments to effective policy development and program delivery, many of which were identified in its own review. For instance, it does nothing to address the cost and responsibility shifting between state and Commonwealth governments. It's not just cost, cost shifting, they pass the buck. The lack of coordination between departments and agencies is not addressed. There's nothing about the persistence in mainstream departments of programs that are short-term and ad hoc, fragmented and overlapping pilot programs coming out your ears. There's nothing to address the ignorance, the lack of capacity that characterises much of the mainstream service delivery. There's much talk about lack of capacity in the Indigenous community 
In my view, it's on, often, often on the other side of the table. There's nothing about the proliferation of policy advisory bodies already, which have been set up and, uh, to um, listen to competing Indigenous voices. As Larissa Berendt put it, allowing policymakers to forum shop for opinions that best suit them. Mainstreaming, of course, doesn't allow for representative input into policy developments and programs. You can pick and choose the voices you want to hear. What we should be doing instead of passing this legislation is trying to learn from an honest assessment of ATSIC's strengths and weaknesses. That's what we in Labor propose to do. And it's why we'll be referring this bill in the Senate for a considered evaluation of the key issues and comprehensive consultation with Indigenous Australians. ATSIC did a pretty good job in policy development, as is evident in the government taking up many of its proposals uh, on domestic violence in the most recent budget. It was, to the government's great discomfort, also a powerful advocate on Indigenous rights and native title. Those areas that the PM has der derided on many occasions, claiming, and I quote, that I do believe it has become, that is ATSIC, has become too preoccupied with what might loosely be called symbolic issues and too little concerned with delivering real outcomes for Indigenous people, as if discrimination, rights and land were not real. We need to learn from the past and work together to build on ATSIC, which was a model of limited self-determination, but which had much to offer and did much good work despite its failings. As one commentator put it, ATSIC has been battered and bruised, poisoned by percep perception, systematically and cynically poisoned by perception. That's why the chair of ATSIC was hung out to dry for so long without resolution of that matter. And that commentator might have added, destabilised by a systematic campaign which has reduced it ultimately to ashes. As parliamentarians, we should now concentrate on building upon ATSIC's successes while conceding it had flaws, like most human organisations, the political parties represented in this place, for example. But as Pat Dodson reminded us last week, it was never a construct of Indigenous people. ATSIC is a creation of this parliament. Instead, ATSIC was, as Dodson said, one small formal voice which was provided with the resources, and I quote, of a poor house orphan and expected to perform like a prodigy. But as he and many other Indigenous leaders have agreed, the concept of providing Indigenous people with an elected voice at the national level was right, and, as, and quoting from his speech again, must be saved from the road wreck. And that's what we intend to do. It's more important than ever that Indigenous people's views are put forward and heard in the forums of government in this country. It's also vital to deal with the unfinished business that the Howard government has steadfastly refused to address. I have to say, Mr Deputy Speaker, that I continue to be amazed at the optimism of Indigenous Australians, that they're still prepared to enter into a discussion about the best means of achieving formal and substantive equality. This time it cannot be, as Pat Dodson reminds us, another artificial construct foisted on us by governments, but rather a matter for Indigenous people. This is a time to listen and to become real partners. We can fashion a new agreement, as Dodson puts it, between mates, but an agreement that represents the views and aspirations of Indigenous people. I have to say I very much doubt that the Howard government is interested in this journey but I hasten, hasten to assure Aboriginal people that we are. Like many Australians, I noted with sadness the death of Gachal Jakura. And he had little to say before his death about the demise of ATSIC. And he said simply that ATSIC deserved better than this. In the course of his discussion, he also noted the way in which this decision was made and the language with which it was delivered. He was very sad about that. He said, in the classic imperial fashion, without negotiation, without understanding and with little empathy, the great white leader announced that Aboriginal people had yet again been a failure, in inverted commas. ATSIC would be abolished. No more paternalistic model of government could be found. And I guess in some ways we shouldn't be surprised at that, considering that the Prime Minister 
who worked with Mr Jakura during his time as chair of ATSIC, indeed appointed him to that position, did not even put out a press release noting his passing. Indeed, it wasn't until his death was raised with the Prime Minister at a press conference that he made uh, the most desultory remarks about a fine Australian. That, sadly, says a lot about this government's approach to Indigenous affairs. It's almost 9 p.m. and I therefore be quite prepared with the, houses, with the consent of the House to propose the question that the House do now adjourn rather than call an additional speaker and have them interrupted 30 seconds into their speech. So if there is no dissent, I, the Minister for Leader of the Opposition just resume his seat for a moment. The Minister? Just a, just a matter with you, Mr Speaker. I just wonder if you might be able to reflect upon the member for Fremantle's contribution to this debate and reminder of standing order. Uh, 76 and indeed standing order 80. Um, order. I, I, for the time I've been in the chair, the comments made by the member for Fremantle caused me no alarm at all. I will look at the hands hard, but I'm not at all concerned. And I intend, without, since there is no dissent, to propose the question that the House to now adjourn. The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, earlier today I wasn't able to give the full record of Liverpool Council's finances, so let me now give the complete account of the Council in the 1990s. During my time as Mayor, the Council's debt servicing ratio fell from 17.2 per cent to 10 per cent, half the Western Sydney average of 20 per cent. At my last Council meeting in mid-1994, the Council adopted a debt retirement strategy that, if followed, would have made it debt-free in 2005. Between 1991 and 1994, Council's working funds balance increased from $770,000 to $1.1 million, that is, its liquidity increased by 50 per cent. At the end of 1994, the budget surplus was $1.6 million. In each of the three budgets during my time as Mayor, the Council achieved significant productivity gains, an efficiency dividend of 3% in 1992, 4% in 1993 and 4% in 1994. Between 1991 and 1994, Council staff numbers fell from 500 to less than 400, a sign of the financial disciplines that were applied. That's the true financial position during my three years as Mayor, a lower debt servicing ratio, higher working funds, budget surpluses, significant productivity gains and tighter staffing. This was a well-managed and efficient council. The efficiency gains were realised through a combination of strategies involving commercialisation of council functions, contracting out, the commercial management of council assets and significant labour market reform moving away from the centralised award to the first enterprise agreement in the Council's history. An example of these reforms was the Outdoor Works Department, which was placed on a full commercial footing and exposed the contracting out and a 25 per cent staff reduction achieved through voluntary redundancies. This reform, this reform I welcome the uh, interjection by the Minister. I should have stayed there. Such was the high quality of financial management. I welcome his support. I welcome Member, his support and urge him to speak to the Treasurer. Of the opposition has the call. Mr Speaker, this reform was described in the Institute of Public Affairs Review, not normally associated with the Labor Party, in 1994 as the most radical and extensive reform in municipal government in Australia. Comment has been made about Council's Capital Works Program and the way in which it was funded. The strategy was straightforward. The Macquarie Street Mall was funded from the Westfields Road sale and the Whitlam Centre and Powerhouse facilities from federal government grants, the Keating government's local capital works program in the 1992 One Nation Statement. Council's efficiency gains, if maintained, were available to fund the long-term recurrent operation of these facilities. Unfortunately, Mr Speaker, the councils elected in 1995 and 1999 abandoned these strategies. For instance, they returned the outdoor works function to in-house management and staff and wound back the commercialisation process and contracting out. They also overturned the decisions in the 1994 Council budget on debt retirement and placing a cap on future capital works commitments. The following commitments had not been planned for in 1994 but were included in the 1995 and 96 Council budgets. Purchase of a $2 million property in the Liverpool CBD and the establishment of a 500,000 Council service centre. $4.5 million funding for a youth centre, plus expansion of the floor space and costs of the new central library. In fact, the Council in 1996 ran a capital works budget of $35 million and also allowed recurrent costs to escalate. In areas not connected with capital works, operating costs increased by between 32 and 600 per cent. 
The council lost its cost control discipline and efficiency dividend. Ultimately, it was sacked in, 19, in, in 2004 for financial mismanagement a full 10 years after I left the council. These are the facts, Mr. Speaker. These are 10 years after I left the council. <coughs> These are a ten-year plan indeed, and also a ten-year misrepresentation by the government. These are, Mr Speaker, the facts, as opposed to the misrepresentations and fantasies of the Howard government. The Liberals, of course, know the truth, but in their political desperation they have invented stories about Liverpool Council during my time as mayor. Why do I say, Mr Speaker, that they know the truth? Well, in January 1994, I ran in a national by-election campaign for the seat of Werriwa, and the Liberals didn't say boo about Liverpool Council. The member for Benelong, the member for Benelong, then the shadow minister for industrial relations, was heavily involved in the campaign for the Liberal Party. I was the sitting mayor of Liverpool at the time, but such was the strong state of Liverpool Council's finances and performance that the Liberals never raised it as a campaign issue. Ten years later, in rewriting history, they now say that there was an issue. Well, why didn't they raise it at the time when I was mayor? Why, when it would have been directly relevant in, to a national by-election campaign, why only raise it ten years later? In truth, Mr Speaker, I'm proud, very proud of my achievements in municipal government, and I'm not prepared Order. to let a bunch of Tories like Order. the Treasurer and his acolytes who have never been to Liverpool, let alone the understood the Council's finances, say otherwise. Expired. Yeah. Questions the House to now adjourn. The Honourable Member for Solomon. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, this week's funerals Order. will mark the passing for Solomon has of the two call. of the Northern Territory's legendary citizens, very different people with very different backgrounds, but both in their own way symbolic personalities of the Northern Territory. I speak of the leader of the Wanguri people, past ATSIC chairman Mr Jakura OAM, and of a pioneer of Central Australia, Len Kittle. Mr Jakura, like a few chosen brightest and best of the Yakala Methodist mission, attended the Brisbane Bible College before returning to his homeland as a youth leader and Sunday school teacher. In 1980, he was a candidate for the Arnhem Land Territory parliamentary seat for the homegrown Country Liberal Party. Defeated by Bob Collins, he worked for a short time for Territory Chief Minister Paul Everingham and the former Department of Aboriginal Affairs. His leadership was such that in 1984 he was awarded the Order of Australia for services to the Aboriginal community, subsequently appointed General Manager of the Yakala Business Enterprises, a joint venture of the Yakala clans. He grew the business from a marginal concern to a company with a multi-million dollar turnover. In 1990 he was a Foundation Chairman of the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Commercial Development Corporation and held that position till his appointment to the ATSIC Chair in 1996. Throughout the 1980s and 90s he was a figure who, bought, who fought for reconciliation for Aboriginal empowerment in both the commercial and political world. His heritage meant that he inevitably faced the conflicts of his own culture and the modern world. With unshakable good humour and commitment, he straddled those two worlds to the great benefit of both. My condolences go to his children, Damien, Fiona and Nathan, and his wider family. As former Governor-General Sir William Dean has said, we, our nation, are greatly the poorer that he is no longer with us. Mr Speaker, Len Kittle, whose family came from Townsville, grew up in the Depression. His young working life before the Second World War uh, was a story of hard yakker in the harsh and unforgiving country of Central Australia. In partnership with brother Jeff, he cut and carted wood, shoveled sand and carried water to the mine sites about Tennant Creek. He served with the RAF during the war years and then returned to, to the uh, Kittle brothers' business, which had profited, uh, prospered sufficiently to construct a new steel building in the main street of Tennant Creek. It was from there that the hard work and business acumen built one of Central Australia's and indeed the Territory's most successful enterprises, initially trucking cattle and fuel and winning the General Motors franchise and later the Toyota car dealership in Tennant and Alice Springs. Len was a man who deeply cared about the Territory's progress. He involved himself in local affairs. He was on the pre-selection panel to, choo uh, to choose the country and later country Liberal Party former member of this House and Territory Representative uh, Sam Calder. He was there 
at the formation of the Country Party in the early 1970s and was a stalwart of the Country Liberal Party ever since. My condolences go to his widow Phyllis, sons Robert and Peter, daughters Heather, Gwen, Sylvia and Shirley and the new generations of grandchildren and great-grandchildren of the Kittle dynasty. The question is the House to now adjourn. The Honourable Member for Swan. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, when I'm out and about in my electorate of Swan, constituents often raise issues concerned with me about law and order in the community. Having chaired or been involved with the Victoria Park Region's Community Policing and Crime Prevention Committee for over a decade, I'm acutely aware of the, how important feelings of security, safety and protection are for people, especially in and around their local community. One innovative and unique program based in my electorate is the Constable Care Child Safety Program, now in its 15th year of operation. Since 1989, Constable Care has successfully run proactive learning programs about respect, safety and crime prevention. Over one million WA primary school students have learnt messages from Constable Care about road safety, crime prevention, school bullying and respect for others. This non-profit organisation is run by Chief Executive Officer Vic Evans plus his staff of 14, namely Administrative and Financial Officers Jeanette Pospisil, Dixie Francis and Alison Papp, Project and Program Coordinators Ian Radford, David Broadhurst, Alan Montgomery and Alison Wall, and actors Cameron Gartner, Rachel McGeehan, Kingsley Judd, Serena Sidud, Jared West and Alicia Garibati. They should all be congratulated for their efforts in educating young people, for promoting community safety and for the crime prevention awareness message that they promote to children and the wider community. Constable Care helps children to develop a greater respect for people, property, the environment and the law. They seek to reduce incidences of juvenile crime, injury and the promotion of healthy and respectful lifestyles. The Constable Care Child Safety Program achieves these goals by using educational puppet shows and interactive plays together with curriculum-based teacher packs, activity books and their highly recognised Constable Care caricature. It is with great pride that I congratulate Constable Care on their nomination for the Gold Swan Award at the 2004 WA Citizenship of the Year Awards being held tonight. As a former chairperson of the Finance Subcommittee of the State Community Policing Council, I was part of the discussion some years ago to purchase Constable Care from the original private operators and to allow for the organisation to be put into community hands where it belongs. John Hudson, the current chairman and former chair of the State Community Policing Council, should also be congratulated for his visionary efforts in getting Constable Care established in the form that we know it as today. Today is Foundation Day in Western Australia, and 175 years ago, on the 1st of June 1829, the state's first settlers arrived at the Swan River Colony aboard the Parmelia. In 1973, the WA Citizenship of the Year Awards were first presented, and this tradition has continued on Foundation Day ever since. Nine annual awards are presented, eight for individual achievement and one for a voluntary service organisation. The WA Citizen of the Year Award acknowledges West Australians for their achievements, inspiration, commitment, leadership and contribution not only to their state but to their local community. The Gold Swan category for voluntary service organisations is open to those groups who demonstrate outstanding concern for the community. This service or their service delivers that service effectively to improve the lives and opportunities of West Australians. Other worthy nominees in the Gold Swan category include the Amanda Young Foundation, which was established in March 1998 after the tragic and untimely death of Amanda Young from meningococcal septicemia. Amanda was just 18 years of age. And I had the fortune, Mr Speaker, of meeting Amanda in her role as a student councillor at the City of South Perth. She was an A-grade student at Penrose College in my electorate and a very successful rower. It was during a regatta in Penrith in 1998 that Amanda con contracted meningococcal. The foundation honours her name and was established to highlight greater public awareness and understanding of individual roles in public health in maintaining a healthy lifestyle in a, living, a healthy living environment, especially for our future young leaders. Congratulations to Lorraine and Barry Young on their efforts in maintaining and establishing this worthwhile foundation. Another worthy nominee in the Swan Gold category is the WA, in the WA Citizens Awards is Lifeline WA, who operate a 24-hour crisis counselling telephone service to help individuals, couples and families. Congratulations to all workers, program coordinators, Lifeline WA CEO Tim Hawkins and founder Graham Mabry for their efforts. Nagala Family Resource Centre is located in Kensington in my electorate of Swan, and this group has also been nominated in the Gold Swan category of the WA Citizenship of the Year Awards. Nagala provides and promotes programs to help families develop their own resources to enjoy independent and fulfilling family life. 
Another worthy and well-known nominee in the WA Citizen of the Year Awards is Dr Fiona Wood. Dr Wood has been nominated in the professions category of the awards, and many would know of her outstanding achievements as director of the Burns Unit at Royal Perth Hospital and Princess Margaret Hospital for Children. Fiona is internationally recognised for innovative use of tissue engineering technology in clinical burns practice and scar reconstruction. These skills are well tested after the tragic Bali bombings where many burns victims were hospitalised in Perth. Dr Wood is Director of Order. Clinical Cell Culture Limited and the head of his office is located in Technology Order. Park in Belmont, uh, in Victoria, uh, Bentley, in my electorate. Honourable Congratulations to all, uh, all the nominees. They are winners, all winners. Thank you. I'll remove from Macquarie. Thank you, Mr Speaker. One of the key public policy areas of concern to our communities is the issue of health. This is understandable. We all want to know that we have ready access to affordable quality health care, to the services of a local GP, to acute hospital care when needed, to affordable modern pharmaceuticals, to quality in-home or residential care for the frail aged in our community. Mr Speaker, this government has clearly shown its determination to deliver on these priorities. Since coming to office, this government has doubled spending on health care, double spending on health care to $41 billion next year. Time prevents a detailed or even substantial summary of all areas of increased spending. However, Mr Speaker, I would like to highlight a couple of these. First has been the support, the financial support for our state public hospitals under the Australian Health Care Agreements. We have seen two large increases to the five-year agreements, 28 per cent and then 17 per cent in real terms, from $24 billion in Labor's last term to $42 billion for the current five-year agreement. Sadly, Mr Speaker, these increases have not been matched by state governments. In fact, over the past five years, state government's share of public hospital funding has fallen from 47.2 per cent to 43.1 per cent. That is, the federal government has been taking an increasing share of the burden for what is a state government responsibility. In spite of the greatly increased federal government assistance, the New South Wales government sadly has failed abysmally to manage properly the state's health system. And yet they try and blame us. In spite of record uh, revenue under GST this year to reach $9.6 billion, in spite of record total grants from the federal government uh, totalling this year close to $16 billion, uh, day after day we read of stories of gross mismanagement in the New South Wales public hospital system, and tragically, tragically some of those are even costing uh, people's lives. Mr. Deputy, Mr. Speaker. Uh, sorry, the point is this clearly that the New South Wales government must lift its game. It has a core responsibility to the people of the state of New South Wales to add the vitally needed extra funding for our hospitals and to improve its management of the public hospitals in this state. The second area I want to touch on briefly is the stronger Medicare package passed through Parliament earlier this year, representing a $2.85 billion boost to strengthen our Medicare system. It includes a number of very positive features, of course, including incentives to increase bulk billing, measures to attract more doctors to outer metropolitan areas such as the Hawkesbury and Blue Mountains. Mr Speaker, I'm pleased to say that in my electorate that some of these measures already, in conjunction with measures put in place over the last year, are showing very positive signs that they are working. We, we opened uh, with the Prime Minister just a couple of months ago in my electorate uh, with the Hawkesbury Division of General Practice, a practice nurses initiative where two practice nurses will be employed full time to take the pressure off some of our local GPs. Recent figures that have just come through in the last couple of weeks show that over the last year in my electorate, 11 new doctors, uh, 11 new GPs have relocated uh, with, the, with the assistance of the incentive package from the federal government have relocated uh, to to my electorate. Uh, and, uh, and from a different portfolio but of vital relevance to health, we saw in this recent budget the government's commitment of $18 million for the establishment of a medical school in Western Sydney, which in addition to its uh, educational benefits will bring very clear medical benefits to the people in Western Sydney. 
Mr. Mr. Speaker. Also, of course, is the extremely valuable Medicare safety net, which is part of this package, which provides an extra level, an extra level of security and protection over and above the standard Medicare benefit, which greatly reduces the risk of families being crippled by high out-of-pocket expenses. Yet, sadly, Labor is threatening to scrap this safety net, which so many of our people already are coming to see is of great benefit to them. We're seeing yet another very sad example of Labor putting politics ahead of good policy. The other area I wanted to, to touch on briefly, and time is almost gone, is the 30 per cent private health insurance rebate, which is encouraging people to take up private health insurance, encouraging greater use of private hospitals, taking the pressure off our public hospital system and reducing the cost of private health insurance. Yet, sadly, again, Labor will not guarantee to retain the 30 per cent rebate in its current form. There are many other measures I could speak of. The doubling of, of uh, sp uh, spend, uh, spending on medical research, double what it had been under Labor. Record immunisation well, levels, effective measures to improve health services to rural, regional and remote areas. This government is expired. delivering on much needed Order. health services. The Honourable Member for Scullin. Mr Speaker, earlier today um, the Leader of the Opposition, by way of a personal explanation, tried to set the record straight about some matters that he uh, felt aggrieved about. Quite correctly, he was limited in the way he could do it by using that tool and, like other members before him, has come here tonight and used the adjournment debate, which is a wide-ranging debate, to put his side of the case. But it is an example of a phenomena that um, I wish to touch upon that he felt prompted to have to do that because of, the, because of some of the substance of answers that have been given in question time. And, Mr Speaker, I think that uh, in the way in which question time has developed in this place, I've reflected that the standing orders, as they now stand, uh, make the playing field uh, quite uh, distorted. Um, if we look at the present standing orders, uh, there is uh, quite a number of items that refer to the way in which questions should be couched. Um, there is only one item about the answers, and that, of course, is that it should be relevant. I looked at the way in which uh, the procedure committee had grappled with this in the revised standing orders, and um, I'm, I'm not uh, surprised that they have what they have produced here is in reordering the, the rules. They've produced a rule for questions that goes for 25 lines and a simple rules to questions 104 answers. An answer must be relevant to the to the question, and I think that perhaps that is uh, quite quite uh, relevant for the procedure committee to do this because they weren't in the position to have a debate about the nature of question time. My reason for raising these present standing orders that, that we use is because I've become aware of the revised standing orders that the Legislative Assembly of Victoria is now using for question time. It's uh, chapter 8 of uh, their, their standing orders. and I wish to just refer to the last three standing orders, standing order 56, language of questions. The Speaker may require the language of a question to be changed if it seems to him or her that it is unbecoming or is in breach of the standing orders or conventions of the House. I think that that is a very good standing order. 57, contents of questions. A member asking a question must not offer an argument or an opinion on the matter, that's A, or B, and I think that um, you you would be relieved that this is still in their standing orders, give facts or names of persons except those strictly necessary to explain the question. Two, all questions must be direct, succinct and seek factual information. Now, that's the whole of their standing orders to do with questions. More importantly, in their standing order 58, contents of answers, it says, one, all answers to questions must a be direct, factual and succinct, b not introduce matters extraneous to the question, nor debate the matter to which the question relates. So, Most importantly, the difference in those standing orders is that they have an item that says that the answer must not be debated, whereas our standing orders only refer that questions should not be debated. And practice uh, goes forward that in the past uh, people have raised with presiding officers an argument that the provision of the standing order for questions should also relate to the answers. Um, I note in the references in procedure uh, to the relevant uh, uh, debate in 1987, where a former member for North Sydney raised a couple of points of orders with uh, Speaker Child, 
that uh, she reiterated uh, that the standing order uh, applied to, to answers, and that's been consistent with other occupants of the chair and consistent with the way in which you've um, presided over the conduct of question time. So I think in the consistency of the way that uh, question time is conducted, there can be no qualms. But I really believe that as members of this place we should reflect upon whether the nature of question time as we see it at present is the way in which we would really want it. If it is to be truly about uh, eliciting information, uh, getting clarification about points, that that's what it should remain. And it should not become the sort of uh, developed into a debate that's really one-sided. And this is one of the difficulties. I think it leads to a lot of the frustration that's displayed from time to time by people because, in fact, um, quite correctly, in the way in which the standing orders are applied, there is difficulties and restrictions upon one side of the chamber. I was pleased that the Prime Minister used uh, ministerial statements to uh, develop his case about uh, Senate reform. I also note with interest that he indicates that the Minister for Defence will be making a ministerial statement to the Senate. Just a difficulty that this will happen in two weeks' time, and I wonder why the Assistant Minister could not be making a ministerial statement to this chamber. The question is the House to now adjourn. The Honourable Member for Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to rise in the Parliament uh, and speak about a very special event in my electorate that I had the uh, great pleasure of putting together in uh, in April. Mr. Speaker, um, on uh, Saturday, April the 17th, I had the great uh, pleasure of hosting the uh, inaugural Ryan Youth Leadership and Development Forum. This was a very special event uh, that uh, brought together uh, over 150 local students, from secondary students uh, from the Ryan electorate, from schools uh, within Ryan and also schools uh, outside of Ryan that uh, had Ryan students attending them. It also brought together parents and teachers uh, to take part in this uh, very special forum. The venue was the Centenary State High School uh, in uh, the centenary suburbs and incidentally a school where I'd only been, been to uh, a couple of weeks earlier where I had the opportunity of uh, opening a, a, a new learning, uh, a general, new general learning area block uh, worth some, some $1.45 million that was um, funded by the, uh, by the Howard government. But uh, Mr Speaker, at this, at this uh, school we had the opportunity of um, putting on uh, what I would say is a show, it w was the uh, showpiece youth event. Uh, that, I'd, that my office had been working on for, for many months, um, and we had uh, the great privilege indeed of having some special Australians attend to talk about their experiences, to enlighten young people uh, in the Ryan electorate uh, about uh, their personal experiences and uh, to encourage them to pursue their goals and their, and their dreams. And I want to pay tribute to all those who, who uh, played a part in that forum. Um, Mr Speaker, uh, Lieutenant General Peter Lay, uh, AO Chief of the Australian Army, uh, very generously uh, came to open the forum. Uh, we also had uh, participating as guest speakers uh, an Olympic gold medalist in uh, Steve, Stephen Bradbury, uh, Brett Casey from the Queensland Deaf Society, uh, Lael Bruckner the, from the McIntyre Centre, um, uh, Denny Leshman from the University of Queensland. We also had the 2003 Queensland Telstra Young Businesswoman of the Year, Sarah Seckold, and a very special Australian uh, in uh, Gerard Gossens, who's a Paralympian and who has uh, an incredible ambition to uh, climb, um, uh, climb Mount Everest, uh, notwithstanding that he uh, is, um, uh, has, a, has a disability. Uh, the keynote speaker of the event, the, to close the event, was the Australian cricket captain, Ricky Ponting. And I want to thank all those who very generously gave their time to inspire the young people of Ryan. And uh, I want to also pay tribute to Pastor John Robertson from the Kenmore Baptist Church, who uh, tremendously uh, emceed the day. Uh, he was able to uh, make sure that the event uh, moved very smoothly and uh, also gave the opportunity for students to interact and to engage in discussions. And it was a wonderful event. Um, people not only had a chance, or young, young students of Ryan not only had the chance to uh, hold in their hands an Olympic gold medal, but also to uh, meet someone uh, uh, in, in elite sports such as Ricky Ponting and to uh, hold the baggy green cap in their hands. A very uh, special opportunity that I know for the uh, students of Ryan that uh, took, took up this opportunity. I'm sure they will treasure it uh, for many, many uh, years indeed. And I want to uh, read um, uh, the, um, the welcoming uh, words of the Prime Minister who very, uh, very kindly supported the Ryan 
Youth Leadership and Development Forum, and I quote from the Prime Minister in his, um, in his uh, comments in the, in the brochure that my office put together, uh, young Australians are playing a significant part in building this nation's prosperity and stability. As young people increasingly assume leadership positions, their talents, attitudes and creativity will become even more important to our future. As you, as you prepare for the next important step in your life, remember that there is nothing you can't achieve if, you're, if you put your mind to it. Good luck for your future endeavours. Uh, yours sincerely, John Howard. And I also want to thank uh, the um, Federal Minister for Education, um, the Honourable uh, Dr Brendan Nelson, who, who also very kindly gave, uh, gave comments. And this is what he said in his, uh, in his uh, uh, words in my, in my brochure. Good leaders inspire others to rise above themselves, to enthusiastically embrace ideas that implemented will serve the broader interests of all of us. To do so requires intelligence, wit, humility, determination, humour and the imaginative capacity to see the world through the eyes of others. Mr Speaker, I want to again very, very generously uh, thank uh, those who gave their time and also to uh, thank all the volunteers that came and uh, gave up their Saturday because without volunteers, uh, uh, forums such like this, which are put on entirely uh, for the community, um, wouldn't be possible. And I just want to very quickly thank uh, Barry and Pat Middleton from Bell Bowery, Keith and Caroline Hamilton from Mount Omni, uh, Phil and Brenda Williams from Corinda, Ms, uh, Sh Mrs Shirley Tsui from Turinga, and uh, Veronica Jones from Tawong. Uh, wonderful Australians who give their time uh, to uh, community events, uh, not only for me as a local federal member, but Lord to charities uh, and other community events uh, Lord, uh, throughout the length and breadth of our country. So uh, I want to uh, thank very much uh, everyone who was involved in the forum. Has expired. Question is the House to now adjourn. All those that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The House stands adjourned until 9 a.m. tomorrow.